Hi guys, what's up? I hope everybody is doing good. This is a small intro to a five part ES revision series. Uh, the videos are the same from the playlist. I'm attaching all of them as I did for SM and putting all of them at one place and also giving you a little bit of insight on how to plan your revision. So this week intro will help you understand that and you don't have to run behind five videos and all of that is going to be put in this one video itself. So sit back, relax and have a plan of watching this about cumulatively nine hour marathon revision video, which was split into five chapters and five videos earlier. Now they are being grouped into one. So the revision plan goes like this. We have five chapters in years and I would like to suggest you a small change in the order of the chapters that you would, uh, you know, prefer to do it here. We have uh, first chapter one and two as usual. We'll cover chapter one, then followed by chapter two. Then what I suggest you guys is to bring in chapter number four. Now this is a very interesting turn that we have to do in our preparation because this chapter is not just a heavyweight chapter when it comes to exam where it will be ranging anywhere between 12 to 14 marks from all the past analysis. I've already told you that, you know, this ranges anywhere between 12 to 14. This is ranging anywhere between eight to 10, both these. And also I will write it here. Chapter number five is also in the same range. This will be chapter number five. And here we will have chapter number three. Now, why chapter number three has been pushed aside is because of its volume. You know that it's not a very, very difficult chapter that, you know, everything is out of your reach and all. I do understand there's some bit of controls and all that here. So which is why I'm making this little bit of introduction to make your life easy in the preparation. So uh, chapter one and two, there are nothing much to tell you about. Go straight, follow the revision videos. Uh, I think enough of it is covered in the revision video. Everything about BPA is covered in that very clearly. Everything about ERP is covered in the second chapter very clearly. So a lot of questions have been asked in the past. Many students are following one strategy of doing SM very properly and then depending only on these two chapters. Please don't do that. If you're watching me right now in this video, follow through this. It's only nine hours that's going to take to watch through the entire thing. And if you watch through these five revision videos itself, it is going to be of great, great help. If you don't believe me, you can go on to the respective individual videos and see the comments that were sped up, right? There was also a deliberation that whether this is applicable, you know, like May 23, November 23, what about that? So for May 23 and November 23, this marathon revision is very much applicable when it comes to EIS, right? New syllabus is not yet applicable. EIS has not yet been abolished. So as of now, this is very much workable. Then go to chapter number four. Chapter number four has three parts, okay? First, I wanted to cover the e-commerce part, pretty easy. Digital payments, even more easy, small part, but lot of questions are coming from digital payments. And then uh, moving on to all the emerging technologies, you would be focusing first predominantly on virtualization, cloud grid, mobile computings, then rest of all the short topics like BYOD, blockchain, and web version 3, 4, 5, and the concept of IoT with a lot of short answers possible coming there. Then if you know, I again I tell you if you've already done your first round of revision, I want you to do this first, second, third. There should be no change in the order. Now, ideally speaking, if you want to go hit 70s and 80s in the subject, you have to be strong on chapter three. Also, there is no doubt in that. Now, don't wonder as if you know 70, 80s are very unachievable thing and all that. Consistently, over the last five attempts, people have been scoring 70s and 80s in the subject, and they are my own students. So I'm very proud about that fact. And there is no two thoughts about it, but there are also been low scoring uh, totals just because people mess up in their preparation itself. So don't do that. Make sure that you cover chapter three, at least to the revision part. Okay. Just follow revision at least to the extent I have revised. You revise it twice or thrice. Maybe if a question or two comes because most of what exam questions are there that have come, have been covering them in the revision consistently. So if you can do this revision, a video alone. I think uh, if you are lucky enough, you should get questions directly from that only, which most generally happens and you should get through with, uh, you know, a great deal of uh, thing there. Then you can come towards the end because the congregation of all of this BPA, ERP put together 
all of that is applied on banking in the core banking system so this chapter is a easy scoring chapter but again if you're doing these first four chapters well chapter five on its own will become very well uh stages and implementation of core banking the eight different type of servers okay again for those people who uh you know really want to stick to what is this you can go only with revision even if you haven't done the chapter much in detail you can just stick to this that's it guys that's what i have from my side on the revision plan just a little update before you do that long stretch of revision videos so i'm attaching all my uh, five revision videos of the past to this video making it a big marathon in one place do save that video and make sure that you watch it also don't do it alone share it with your friends so that they also aware of this marathon there's also an sm marathon that i've uploaded a couple of days ago the link of which will also be available in the description if you want that you can share that as well with your friends all right keep going i will be with you i will see you soon in my other videos and updates alongside so it's all revision time right now let's get to the very first video the basics chapter number one on eis is all about automated business processes automated business process rather this also is called as bpa a technique which is used for automation in businesses now bpa as it stands for business process automation but one thing that you have to remember here clearly is an organization which is already having business processes will have to manage those processes very well which is an activity called as a bpm okay so bpm stands for what business process management business process management this is what bpm stands for now an organization which is already adopting bpm will also have to use information technology or harness the power of it so that you know it is able to make the most uh, benefit right so basically what we are trying to understand is how an organization with processes in place which is already doing this process management how will it be able to you know take the help of it and make sure that you know it kind of uh, harnesses the power of it and becomes in the process see in all these subjects there is one thing that or at least in it there is one thing that i always keep telling it's more like a buy one get one free offer so what is that we are buying and what is that we are getting for free i'll just let you know that uh, before which we need to understand that this process of bpm plus it will result in the concept of bpa which is all about automation of business process why should we automate we have enough number of reasons to automate it will save time human error will be avoided lot of common points only we will see them as we go on into the benefits of bpa but what did i call as buy one get one free offer what is this buy one get one free now you normally see this with clothes right you buy one you get one free here in the whole story of it you buy it that is you pay for it or you bring in to get certain advantages okay no doubt we will always have advantages but will we enjoy the benefit of all these advantages to the fullest extent that we are not sure because it totally depends on how this bpa is implemented so implementation of bpa implementation of bpa will play a very very critical role if bpa hasn't been implemented properly so if you are implementing bpa properly then it's not a problem but if bpa is not implemented properly if it takes a toll on the organization or they have budget constraints like this lot of problems will come as in when we start doing bpa till the time we are talking all of this is not a problem but when we actually step in and start doing something there is always a great deal of uh, problem that can crop up and what is this get one free now so whenever you buy for advantages you will get risk for free this is a uh, i mean this you can call it as a never ending love story between advantages and risks so when obviously you know we have to take some risks to get certain advantages like if we don't use computers at all that is if we are not using the it at all 
where is the question of hacking where is the question of viruses where is the question of any problem that is directly related to it we won't be able to you know uh, face any of that we need not but you want speed accuracy you want cross border communication you want to go beyond the boundaries of your home country you want geographical or locational advantages now when you buy a technology which is called information technology with so many advantages quality will improve consistency will be there in processing right time is the biggest factor that gets saved and time is saved automatically means money is saved so if you have so many advantages don't you think risk will be there in this process no doubt risks will be there in the process and there is another love story that goes on between risk and controls okay so risk is more of a villain in the story and nobody wants risk to dominate risk will be there you can't eliminate that because if you want to completely eliminate risk you should not uh, you know take up that at all so if somebody asks you sir what should i do uh, not to fall from the vehicle while driving if somebody says wear a helmet you should understand it very carefully wearing a helmet will save you when you fall it won't let your head get hurt that's all but will it stop you from falling no sir i don't want to fall from the bike only don't drive you understand a very simple example if you don't want to fall from the bike don't drive sir then how will i cover the distance uh, so obviously no if you want to use the bike because you want to travel at distance you are at a risk of falling wearing the knee guard arm guard elbow guard helmet all these are only precautions that you take that if in a scenario i fall i shouldn't get hurt badly so there are a uh, there are a sequence of things that we think when we bring a risk into consideration little later in the session we will also discuss risk management techniques four of which are very popular fifth one is about ignoring the risk unless the impact of risk is very small we won't ignore it we will consider and try and do something and that something is generally establishing controls because that's the most easiest story now why did i take so much time to explain you this buy one get one because in all five chapters not just in this in all the five chapters you are going to see this story continue because right now in this chapter we are going to talk about bpa because that's what is a dominant portion of this topic so we will see more of that in the second chapter the dominant part of the chapter discusses about erp so we will be seeing erp story there and uh, so erp benefits of erp risks involved in erp followed by controls that's a story in the second chapter third chapter the entire story itself is about controls so we're going to discuss a wide set of information system components and because of using those components what risks will you face now there we are going to elaborately discuss controls like physical controls logical controls environmental controls so they are also risk and control story will not stop going to the fourth chapter we are going to talk about e-commerce now e-commerce is such a concept which is taking the world to the next level now when a concept like that is in uh, use don't you think risk will be there of course risk is there so risk and controls topic will come in e-commerce chapter also and no doubt when you are using core banking systems which is again an erp for banks there are also a lot of advantages are there and wherever advantages are there risk and control will automatically come so this story is not going to get over and which is why i took a couple of minutes extra to explain you the relation between any story that in it which has advantages will no doubt follow this path first you will see the advantages of the topic which will then be followed by some of the risks involved in that process which is where we will have to go ahead and find some controls to hold on okay so this is the basic intro about how this connect works and little later in this chapter we will also discuss a framework of internal controls as to how to establish and although you might have covered that in audit we will still just see the overview of that now straight away let's get to the major part wherein we are going to talk about the most important concept in this chapter which is called as business process automation business process automation or bpa and i want all of you to be very clear because there are a series of topics in bpa and this is going to consume our major portion of time in discussing so i want all of you to stay through with me in discussing first and foremost is the question that what exactly is bpa we will discuss that 
then the second question will be what are the factors factors that affect factors that affect the success of bpa factors that affect the success of bpa then of course a question that has already come in the exam benefits of this process called bpa and the biggest story on bpa implementation how will you go for implementing the bpa the bpa implementation is an eight step story we will talk about it in greater detail and then comes a couple of very interesting points which are newly added up you can say wherein the first one is saying which are the areas which are very suitable for doing the bpa which are the very suitable areas for doing bpa so there is actually no uh, discussion on this in the uh, you know previous uh, book but now they have added up couple of points where they say like what do you think is the best way to do bpa where are those areas that you can see or how you can uh, put up we will now discuss that also nothing to worry then moving on we have a greater story to deal about risk and the terminology involved so let's keep this one short and move on so what is bpa what is the normal definition of bpa as you see there i have explained it some time back wherein the automation using it that's a very simple definition automation of a process wherein you use it so if i have to give you a clear definition it goes by saying technology enabled it is what technology enabled automation of what all the processes that whatever you have it's a technology enabled automation of all you can say activities in the organization of all activities now there is no rule that all activities so all is a option if you want to select a few activities and only automate them you can do that also technology enabled automation of all activities in an organization this is what is the very simple definition of bpa and i will once again let you know the equation bpa is equal to bpm plus it which is my way of writing that the story of bpa comes in together with what is called as information technology so already a well defined process will be there and all you are trying to do is add it to it now sir now those organizations which are not having bpm what about them ha huh, they are called as departmental they are called as departmental or functional organizations now one thing that you need to understand is this whole story will not apply to functional organizations which don't have processes if you don't have a process what will you automate but sir can an organization be there without process absolutely organizations can comfortably survive without processes by doing things in a functional manner they work in the form of departments and they can still see success but modern day organizations they don't want to do that because they are always you know in the fear that if they continue like that will it create a big problem for them okay and uh, traditionally when did we have processes and what do you mean to say before the evolution of computers internet and other things were organizations not there which survived what about the late 60s 70s 80s okay you can still say 70s and 80s were the evolution of computers not like uh, today no but back then also businesses were there they were also very successful which means you need to draw two very important conclusions despite telling these so many number of times people still have a misconception so please take this very seriously one an organization can definitely survive without processes two an organization definitely can survive even without it okay an organization can comfortably survive even without it and this is something that i want all of you to know very clearly because at some point of time people get this confusion how can an organization be without process they can still be a functional organization you just have to do the job right that's all 
Now moving on to the second part or the second branch which is called as factors that affect the success of BPA. There are four factors C, I, A, T which I would like to call them in those names because it's very simple. Whenever you are going for automation, you should be very bothered about one factor that you should not let unauthorized access. Your data should belong to you. In the name of automation, you create all this and then if unauthorized people are accessing the data, that is not at all going to help anybody. So the first and foremost factor that affects is called as confidentiality. What is it called? Confidentiality. Then keeping the data in its original form. We don't want unauthorized access. Point number one that is called confidentiality. We don't want data to be tampered. Keeping the data in its original form like how the data is supposed to be, how it is generated that is called as data integrity. You will find this word across your book so many places. So that is why I am emphasizing a little bit data integrity. Integrity means keeping the data in its original form. Like how in audit we say integrity is about being honest. Be truthful. Like the data should be original. Here you can't use the word truthful. So you are saying data should be supposed. I mean the way it is supposed to be. That is called integrity. And two points that always go hand in hand are availability. Availability and timeliness. These two factors, they go hand in hand. Confidentiality, keeping outsiders who don't have access away. That is keeping the access only to limited people. Two, integrity, keeping data in its original form. Three, availability, data should be available when needed. Data should be available and also available at the time when I want. So if you give me data, what I want today and you give it to me tomorrow and say, sir, now you take the data. It's available. Okay, it's available, but that's not timely, right? So availability and timeliness go hand in hand. Data should be available and also at the time that I want. So unless these four factors are taken care, BPA will not be successful. So any damage or any danger to CIAT will be a big problem. So you should always kind of you know make sure that we don't dwell much into the ERP and or uh, score banking system or any system for that matter and create problems to these four. If you want a successful BPA, let's be frank, you have to maintain these four. If you are not or if your organization is unable to maintain, then uh, you know that is not going to help. Because if somebody is still able to get unauthorized access, or if somebody is uh, not getting the data when they want, how is it called successful? Okay. So these four factors will affect BPA big time. So you have to draw everything and anything to do it. How will we maintain? What will we do? All those are discussed in the due course of time. Whenever you come across uh, those. I will also highlight but you know keep a point on because in the syllabus so many places we will see how to maintain confidentiality like they will have access control systems integrity also for that matter CIA okay T is included in that A only so you can say the CIA is a very very important part of any automation's success if anything happens to CIA it means that uh, you know entire story is at a big risk. Moving forward to one of those questions that can come in the exam that has already come in the exam which very much has a potential to appear again are the benefits of BPA. Let me make this a very simple story for you. There are seven benefits which uh, right now I remember it as quit not Q-U-I-T but Q-V-I-T and then three R's. I am not really a fan of all this mnemonics or anything because you know, that's an additional pressure. If you forget this, you'll forget the whole of the answer. But wherever possible, like in the later chapter, we have uh, one more mnemonic called STAR. Structure, timely, accurate and relevant. Very few places I, I go by this, but otherwise I would always some uh, want to believe in the concept and the flow. Okay, but benefits, seven of them are there. The first one, Q, stands for quality and consistency. Quality and 
consistency now this is very important because what activity you do manually versus what activity you do on automation definitely there is a quality enhancement and all transactions are treated equally that is the best part sir uh, 10 lakh transaction we have to give more importance 1 lakh transaction okay sir no problem as a 10000 transaction leave it. human beings only will show such kind of bias 10000 transaction no problem 10 lakhs means over panicking and doing a mistake system doesn't matter 1 rupee or 10 rupees or 1 lakh rupees system always follows a design process there is consistency only we as human beings categorize small transaction big transaction system doesn't have all that system says i'll treat everything same consistency and the best part about automated systems is there is a visibility sir visibility of what visibility of the process now those of you who are uh, using android ios phones when you update your software when you normally update your software or install any software 28% 30% 50% are you able to see, uh, see the progress the progress is measurable now if you ask me sir how much did you finish in the syllabus how will i tell or how much of this revision session is over how can we decide so when manual activity is done visibility is not there in computers or in any it that is the best part visibility is there because it is capable of estimating the full time of the task so you are copying one file 25 seconds left how is it showing that means it's estimated the time and it works backward so clearly what is happening in the process that visibility is there you know why we are not able to tell and system is able to tell sometimes we also tell no uh, i may finish my work in 10 minutes like 10 minutes is your estimated time that you think that you know you work backwards for the work left okay 10 minutes may be suitable a system no it knows the process because you did that only you know bpa is nothing but bpm plus it so when you say bpm it's already a design process so it clearly knows how much time for that process is allocated and that is why how much is done how much is pending visibility is there in processing okay quality and consistency visibility you know many people have not understood this point visibility in the past which is why i have explained it in a slighter detail then uh, the next point stands for improvement in operational i'll say improve not improvement let's say improved operational efficiency you know what is operational efficiency right the time taken to do things definitely will be faster so that is what is covered even in the next point which says time saving so these two points go hand in hand when there is savings in time automatically operational efficiency will improve right and there is one more reason when systems take over the effort required from human beings will reduce and when the effort required from human beings reduce the number of people required also will reduce so things will get way more faster so point number 3 and 4 improved operational efficiency and time saving in their name only they are there then uh, the three r's wherein you say reduced turn around time you know what is turn around time right you might have come across in costing and all also the time taken to complete one full process is called turn around and now the whole process time obviously is going to come down for a simple reason that you know the entire process is now being automated so definitely the time taken to finish start to end of a process will shrink when compared to the past so definitely there is a uh, what do you say turn around time reduces when time reduces no doubt cost will also reduce so reduced cost i don't think i have to explain what is reduced cost because it saves cost of uh, manpower it also will be helping you to produce more in lesser time and since automation is done there are additional advantages of producing more in the same time which is what is called efficiency so per se per unit cost will also come down and the best part about bpa is you can trust this process the last point is reliability and governance when you say governance it means you can monitor as to what is happening where things are going who is doing what all these are some of the points that you can clearly focus and understand rather than simply doing something here where you have a clear understanding of what this is 
so those are the first set of three topics that we are targeting on first and foremost thing what is bpa factors which affect the success of a bpa four of those factors and they'll come a long way with you and the seven benefits now let's move on to one of the most important topics in bpa wherein some stages inside this could turn out to be potential question or maybe they might ask you to write the stages involved in bpa's implementation there isn't a chance that they ask you all eight all the time so let us try and focus understanding what the eight steps are and then we will move further bpa's implementation now what you need to again closely understand bpa is a task that is done from the top management's approval and it's a costly activity in an organization where automation is not there you are trying to do automation now that is a big big step which costs a lot so there are a lot of things that you have to do before implementing bpa so under this heading first point will not be implement bpa in fact the seventh point is implementing bpa so before that there is a lot of groundwork that we are supposed to do the first and foremost thing is is it really required to do bpa no sir everything is already going pretty well then continue no first and foremost step understand understand why bpa very very important question that you have to ask understand why bpa sir if we do bpa accuracy will improve it saves time operationally we get these savings cost savings will be there early payment discounts will be there we will not miss our deadlines like that a list of advantages are there but sir now also i am able to match all of that without bpa so i'm trying to say that without bp also life is cool okay then in that case you don't have to struggle more you get what i'm saying but just in case if you think that no bpa should be done and it will be beneficial for the organization then you can go ahead nothing wrong but the moment you decide you have to go for bpa never do anything wrong or illegal so point number 1 is always followed up by point number 2 which says understand the rules and regulation understand what rules and regulations whenever you bring in bpa into the story information technology act companies act if you are a company companies act talks a little bit about internal controls and stuff section 143 subsection 3 clause i it talks about ifc correct and auditor has to give a report on the operating effectiveness of ifc so if you are having an automated process and that is leading you uh, running through a complete accounting process then that also has to be uh, reviewed properly systems auditor now if you have a parent company in the us and they have some compliances in the likes of uh, the sarbanes oxley act called sox so if your parent entity has sox compliances and you are also supposed to do that anyway there are lot of points that one can discuss here so we will keep it very simple in india companies act is applicable corporate governance regulations are applicable bigger time the information technology act 2000 that is applicable wholly and then of course if you are a bank and all prevention of money laundering act the pmla and rbi has some guidelines rbi obviously will have guidelines right and nowadays you are seeing that there are so many online frauds that take place uh, that to specifically with respect to banks and uh, upi so there is a need for regulation and when you are implementing some automation process if you are not aware about the laws and regulations you cannot uh, give excuses you know that right ignorance of law is not an excuse and uh, nobody can say that so before you start doing anything seriously first you understand is it really required for me no sir bpa and all not required we are very happy stop it there only yes sir we are willing to do bpa chalo then understand the rules and regulations that surround the bpa from so long i have been shouting that bpm plus it bpm plus it if this bpm goes wrong then you add it to it you know what will happen wrong results will come much faster if you automate a wrong process what will happen wrong results will come faster automation you are doing for speed only no so if your process is wrong you will speed up the uh, 
uh, activity of getting the wrong answer okay <laughs> anyway i hope you understood what the seriousness of doing that is see if you you can't automate a wrong process but sir how will i know what is the wrong or right process that is why before doing anything in bpa you have to do steps 3 and 4 which are very important step number 3 document the existing process document the existing process put it on paper clearly what is that process what is that you want to do document the existing process follow it up by step number 4 which says define objectives and goals define objectives and goals for the new process what are your objectives and goals that you need define them very clearly if you are unable to define what the objectives and goals are then you obviously will not know what you are doing okay so that becomes a very important uh, factor again so properly define objectives and goals which whereby will help you to you know understand what is it exactly you need in this whole story right so define objectives and goals how uh, there is one answer for that i think in the previous session when we discussed strategic management also we have spoken about it objectives will always have what is called as a smart goal setting theory okay so objectives can go by you know what is called as smart specific we have using the technique of smart specific measurable attainable relevant and timely what is it specific measurable attainable relevant and timely then so now you know what is your existing process you also know what you want if these two are taken care safely then comes another important step of engaging a business process consultant engaging a business process consultant so why should i not do it on my own this is the first time you are implementing bpa are you an expert in implementing bpa you are only doing it for the first time why do you want to complicate the story and unnecessarily you know provoke yourself to do something wrong huh why not give it to somebody see today the world is running on the concept of outsourcing do what you are good at rest of the things outsource it to who are good at it right see back then i'll give you a simple example though outside the box but very simple example back then if there was a wedding in a house all the family members used to gather and you know they used to split the work one fellow used to take care of catering one fellow used to take care of decoration one fellow 100 things are there in a wedding so all of those family members between themselves they'll distribute and then definitely one or two people will mess up something or the other this was the thing back then now nobody is having that headache the moment they decide that there's going to be a wedding in a house you have event planners right wedding planners event planners event management whatever you want to call them call them and tell them the date and say this is the task and they'll be oh, okay we'll take care that's all earlier what used to take major portion of your time to finish now is getting done just like that you understand what i'm saying but that becomes a very important factor here in bpa you haven't done this before you don't have the relevant expertise don't try to do anything on your own appoint a consultant ha uh, but you have a challenge here how to choose the right consultant how to choose the right consultant that you have to do a little market research see whose name is good see who is doing well all those are some of the points that normally you can do but that won't be a big task okay it is easy only but after you figure out all this the top management has to still give you a go ahead top management still has to give you a go ahead on this so which is exactly why we will go with step number 6 to you know this is a continuation here step number 6 and what does it say which is called as calculating the roi calculating roi and now i don't think i have to explain you what roi is because all of you are students of financial management as well so you very clearly know what roi is so calculation of the roi becomes an interesting and important part and once you finish that you will have to give that to our top management top management unless they feel comfortable about this they will not let you go ahead so therefore it's important that you do 
what is called as calculating the ROI. And once a favorable ROI, and in fact, you can even calculate the other things. You can calculate the IRR, the payback period. Sir, this entire BPA is costing us 1 crore. And it's going to take at least 3 months time to fully automate. And I think in strategic management, you will come across a concept called BPR, Business Process Reengineering. And you studied one point there. If reengineering fails, then the organization will be nowhere. So this also is like that only when you do a BPA and it fails, you'll have terrible outcomes. So you should be very careful, cautious, and then only do the BPA. So if all of this is taken care, then you can go with step number seven, which is called as implementing the BPA, implementing BPA. And implementation is always followed up by testing. Nobody can do anything just like that. So testing the BPA will also be a very integral part of this whole story. So that's it. And calculate the ROI, communicate it to the top management, get, the, get them to understand. And once they give a go ahead, you can comfortably go ahead and implement the BPA. Please don't expect overnight results. That's not a right thing to do. You have to have patience. Test the BPA before something goes wrong in the production environment. That is in real time environment. It is always important for you to uh, take this as a key lesson and then test the BPA. Okay. So that is the full length summary of a very big topic actually the BPA. But I think uh, to the extent possible I have discussed all the points in the depth that we can. So this is the first length of uh, story about BPA. Now what we are going to discuss will be a uh, interesting part because this one has been newly added up and somebody sometime back was asking me will you discuss those uh, areas which are newly added up. So definitely I am discussing the newly added up areas. So I want to uh, you know tell you to stay very focused on this one because this may end up being a question in your exam as well okay so let us continue that wherein the topic is called as which processes which processes shall be automated you're going on saying you automate the process automate the process right which one which business process should be automated in other words bpa should be done for which business process which process should be automated that is a big question here so this is a new introduction guys so those of you who haven't come across this question you can again like i said a detailed explanation is there in the amendment video but for now i'm going to give you all the five side headings as to which process should be automated because if you don't know which process should be automated then uh, you end up automating a wrong process and as i just told you you will end up getting a wrong results so the first and best process to automate are those processes which involve which involve high volume of tasks processes which involve high volume process which involve high volume of transactions and redundancy which means repetition correct this is a new point guys so i take couple of minutes extra to explain so all of you stay put so those process which are having high volume and there is a lot of repetition unnecessarily human effort will be a waste of time here so why do you want to do human effort in a process where there is a lot of repetition why not automate that Okay, so the first and foremost process which is very suitable for automation is those process which involve high volume of transactions or redundancy which means repetitive tasks. Then second set of process or those again the same thing processes which involve multiple people processes which involve multiple people to execute the transaction so i think in the heading only it is very clear when you require multiple people to do one task it's obviously going to cost the organization 
and not only that time look at that so that is what is the third point the second and third point go hand in hand multiple people and time sensitive processes what is it time sensitive processes which means where time is a very critical factor you want to do things quickly then don't do it manually automate them okay and uh, the next point which is very important is laws and regulations now you do understand that because of uh, being students of law that when you don't comply with law we have serious penalties and punishments so those processes which require compliance process which require compliance means what compliance here means compliance to laws and regulations see human beings may make mistakes or human beings have that weird habit of forgetting are deadline i forgot sir huh? you will end up unnecessarily paying fines penalties and all that nonsense why put it to a system no system will not tell i forgot oh sorry yesterday was a late night i got tired all the system will not say on the due date just make sure that you have the uh, money in the bank account it will automatically make the payment uh, nowadays you can give electronic uh, payments instruction you can give to the bank bank will automatically make the payment automated systems will do things like that uh, manually we will only give excuses sorry i forgot sorry sir that's an important transaction but i skip my mind when you have such an important process on hand how will you forget and what is that excuse okay then the last point is we will also automate those processes which have significant impact on other processes significant impact on other processes do you know what is one word for this such processes which impact the other process these are called as cross functional i don't know if you have come across or not but these are called cross functional processes okay wherein one process is pretty much connected to the other and because of this one process not happening properly a series of process can get derailed like a train if one uh, bogey goes down the track uh, everything will go so this is like that where one has a significant impact on the other so you have to stay very very focused on these kind of process so that things don't go wrong okay then uh, also another new introduction here is an important point which are the challenges involved so these two topics have been newly added up the next newly added topic here you can call it as challenges involved in bpa sir are there any challenges involved in bpa no doubt there are uh, four challenges that are involved so we will take up that also in our discussion now to give a complete conclusion to this story challenges challenges involved in bpa are there any challenges involved in bpa yes no doubt there are challenges what are those challenges let us go ahead with the first and foremost challenge in implementing bpa is about automating these redundant process sometime back we said that you know if there a process is redundant you and uh, i mean there is a lot of repetition you go for automation but uh, if you try and automate these kind of process wherein there is no much of a worth in automating that process so you have to ask one simple question is it really necessary oh, okay repetition is there uh, it's a redundant process and you ended up automating it but is it really necessary so the first and foremost see guys one thing that you need to understand we are discussing challenges we are not saying that something uh, will not be able to be achieved i am just saying it's a challenge and life is about overcoming those challenges only no so organization will take care what to do now there is one more point which comes here is called staff resistant obviously which staff will welcome with open arms yeah yeah you are changing the process on change from tomorrow i am ready to suffer who will tell employees will tell don't change anything whatever we are doing now that is uh, you know correct we are very happy with that so that fellow has to learn all these and where will he find the time to sit and learn all these again attend trainings and seminars so staff resistance is a normal consequence you studied in strategic management no resistance to change 
we studied in the culture topic whenever you want to bring anything a cultural shift or a cultural change everybody will come up with boards no change uh, and they'll sit in front of the office no we won't work strike unless you continue the old process we will not work we don't want change okay anyway i don't want to get into the debate it will go somewhere but point being there are challenges and challenges are meant to be overcome so first of which is automating a redundant process automating a redundant process so you have to first be very clear on what process you are automating so automating a redundant process will be your first challenge then the second point that i would obviously want to discuss here is here you said redundant process okay but if it's a complex process the second challenge in automation is defining a complex process defining okay the second challenge defining a complex process if it's a simple process you can list them down step 1 2 3 4 and finish it but what if it's a very complex process sometime back i, I told you now if you are automating a wrong process things will go wrong okay if you are automating a wrong process then everything will go wrong but if you are trying to automate a very complex process now that is exactly uh, why we need to take a cue here and understand is it really relevant is this process correctly defined sometimes you know uh, steps sub steps and from there multiple number of breakdowns can create a process to be you know very cumbersome so somebody who is an expert in defining it should be involved that's how you overcome that challenge not like you can't overcome but care should be taken then the third point here is staff resistance nobody uh, appreciates change very easily so staff will resist they'll say we don't want change but you have to talk to them i have meetings make them understand why change is essential and also explain them the benefits of bringing bpa and one more biggest challenge is implementation cost it's not so easy to finish off doing bpa just like that the cost will play a bigger role okay so that brings us to the end of this whole story on bpa and that being your very first concept i thought all of you are clear on i mean i hope all of you are clear on this entire story of bpa so let me run through uh, both the slides once again for you you might want to take a screenshot or uh, for a minute then i will move away so that you can comfortably take a screenshot of both these right there you go now you have uh, that on screen completely available to you you can take a screenshot of this one so that you can make sure that you those of you have already writing it very good if you want to take a screenshot now and list it down later you can do that also and then we will also move on to the next slide so both these slides cover the entire concept of bpa anybody having any doubts can uh, hit me in the comment section of oh, meanwhile lot of comments have popped up oh many people have given answers good 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 very good i'm just seeing your comment now only okay so most of those comments are answers to what we have been discussing that is a very encouraging factor very good okay somebody is asking is it applicable for it no this is an exclusive ai session it revision is already there in my playlist please do visit that and join us for sm old syllabus and new syllabus we are doing sm and audit together this session is exclusively for the new syllabus people and if any of you are looking for it you already have it in my playlist please do visit that now i don't see any more comments coming up in the likes of any doubts or anything so i hope all of you are clear if so you can throw a confirmation as well and let me straight away move on to my topic on risk right now because it's a very very important topic 
risk and then it will be followed up by internal control and the ERM framework which then we will end it by discussing uh, a quick note on the three words. So anyway, yeah fine lot lined up wherein I think I should now straight away move on to this particular topic. Meanwhile, let me reappear here on screen so that we can move. So I'm going to move on to the next topic, risks involved. Risks involved in BPA. So this is a clear story that every concept that we deal in IT will sometime or the other have to face. So nobody escapes from this concept called as uh, risks involved in BPA. They are there. And you can't obviously talk about any of these. Uh, I mean, you can't close a topic without discussing on a risk. So meanwhile, let me talk about what type of business risks are there. So risks here are classified into three. We are not going to dwell deeper into those. So just we will go with what those are. Risks involved will be classified as business risks. Then technology risk. And data related risks. Okay. These are the three types of risk that come across some business risk exclusively because of using technology you end up getting some technology risk and then you have data related risks now how about these business risks they are in the name only we can discuss as to what they are business risks are first one is called strategic risk wherein whatever strategy you choose may go wrong or that may lead you to you know not achieving your objectives that is called strategic risk then the second risk is a risk of losing money which is called finance risk wherein there is a potential loss and the third risk is about not complying with laws and regulations that is called as compliance risk now only i was telling you right every organization has to comply uh, to laws and regulations otherwise they'll be penalized so this one is called regulatory risk or a compliance risk then there is a possibility that whatever work you are doing so there are sometimes machine breakdowns or the entire factory unit is affected and day-to-day -day operations are hit that is called as operational risk then we have specific category of risks that come because of certain natural calamities or any hazard earthquake fire or uh, you know anything that you can go ahead and insure it but they will still uh, come terrorism like how the Taj attacks 26-11 happened something that you don't expect but there is a potential risk in that that is called a hazard risk now yeah these five predominantly are the risks and the last one is a residual category if it now falls in any of this then it is called as residual risk so this is the first set of risks that every business will uh, face that you may not be able to achieve your objectives because of a failure in strategy called strategic risk loss of money is finance risk non-compliance to regulations and laws will be compliance risk failing to improve your operations or failing of operations which brings an organization to stand still is called as the operational risk and then we have hazard risk which is something that indicates that you are in a danger about something and uh, the last one is called the residual risk now moving on to the second side here this is a slightly lengthy list and this is potentially a question in the exam for four to five marks what are the technological risks that are involved technological risk involved and this risk will purely come only because you are using technology don't use technology this risk will not come but sir, how can we be like that without using technology? Uh, which is why I am telling you that these, uh, you know, can possibly affect. Okay. So, yeah, let's go ahead with that technological risk. First one, what is a normal technological risk? Obsolescence. You get outdated. That is the biggest technological risk. No, we are always afraid that things may get outdated. So, obsolete or obsolescence that is your first and foremost technological risk 
because the the pace at which technology changes there is nothing that can stop that then there are too many number of systems and they are always difficult to understand multiple or let's say multiplicity and complexity multiplicity and complexity of systems multiple systems are they easy to understand no they are complex so you like you know you you are hit two ways there are already multiple number of systems and they are also complex to understand so it's not very easy to tackle or deal with it then again we have one big problem is there a standard way to stop all this no different controls for different system different controls for different systems if there is a standard list of controls that we can adopt for everything then things would be way more easy but when we have different controls for different system the adoption itself will be a big deal then you have to strike a balance the fourth technological risk is something which almost all business encounter striking a balance between balance between business objectives balance between business objectives and regulations now as i told you sometime back in the name of achieving your objectives you should not end up doing something illegal or wrong so you have to always strike this balance okay and that's a pretty important point many people they don't understand the laws only so which is why in bpa they told you to understand it very clearly then point number 5 and 6 are very integrated integrated means they are together dependence on vendors dependence on vendors when you outsource something you are dependent on the vendors and if the vendor says i won't do get lost then uh, all that will become a problem which is again the sixth point says vendor concentration you know what is vendor concentration risk that means majority of our work is with one vendor and what if that fellow suddenly says no i won't do that is a big risk same way multiple vendors are doing your work that is also too risky so having too many vendors is risky depending totally on one vendor that is also risky because too many vendors if somebody messes up then the whole process will go wrong excessively dependent only on one vendor that also can impact your business drastically so i mean though bpa looks like a very nice and easy concept it's not that easy to you know practically make the benefits out of this then the next point number 7 is sod or segregation of duties as you know so segregation of duties is easy only no to talk about that concept it is easy but how many duties are there who will get which duty whether all those are properly defined and designed all those will be again a problem then eighth one is cyber crime eighth one is what cyber frauds or cyber crime had you not been there on the internet this possibility itself won't be there but because you came here you are probably you might i'm not saying you will be but you might be attacked by cyber crime or cyber fraud which is again you you can't sometimes avoid it unless you put the best of the controls and uh, like they say our enemies are not somewhere Uh, far away sometimes our enemies are around us only who oh, you know our employees their acts are very very uh, bad sometimes like they write the password on the board and go or sometimes they go and disclose company information with outsiders so our uh, enemies no they are not anywhere outside our employees if they end up doing anything intentional or unintentional intentional or unintentional errors by employees intentional or unintentional errors by our employees that could be a problem then social techniques social techniques to steal credentials they are calling you know on phone sir you have won a lottery or uh, we are calling from aadhar department you want to verify your data lots of nonsense 
uh, are there nowadays they'll call or they'll text and ask you to give some information and you think suddenly it is genuine and you end up giving that information these are called phishing attacks so you have to be very very careful they'll throw a bait and uh, okay nowadays the generation whoever are there they are slightly aware of all this but older people are uh, victims to all this they suddenly panic hey bank is asking my information because they'll send one message if you don't send these details your account be frozen they'll panic not like they don't know that it's a fake sms or then they'll believe in stock alerts a lot of brokers or brokers or somebody outside they keep sending these fake messages buy this stock in 5 days it will double okay that that one side on that side it keeps happening but i'm talking about even in the cyber world this is again a problem then uh, the next problem i think should be business continuity in the event of a big danger in the event of a big danger there should be a business continuity plan in place just like if there is a major exigency or an emergency you can't shut down your business and go home and say i will not do you should have something to work around right and uh, i'm missing one point which is i think management of information security yeah as far as i remember it should be information security wherein managing the security of information becomes a critical challenge once again i'm reminding you that these are all technological risks sir a long list of 12 points are there i don't want any of this sir what should i do don't use technology sir what are you giving stupid reason of course so that's what i'm saying if you don't want technology to uh, you know show you or give you the benefits then don't use it you will not get these risks also but sir if we use technology then what will happen i think these risks will come and risk can always be handled by setting up controls okay so yes you have to take what is the risk into consideration and then design plans for it. it's not like a free ride okay the third category of risks are data related risk which will be discussed in the third chapter so for now we are not discussing that because they are not relevant here but in the third chapter we will discuss all data related risk at length okay so this is a very elaborate discussion again of the risks involved in bpa so the next topic obviously will be controls but you guys know as and when we discuss about risk ha huh. very good a lot of people are responding in the comments very nice so yeah that's exactly what we are talking about uh management of technology backup plans good 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 i haven't been seeing the comment but lot of you are participating very enthusiastically very good so that's a two very very broad concepts bpa and all the major sub topics in bpa then the risks involved in bpa now what i would like to take a little leverage here uh is the set of eight terms that i believe you can read and understand so i'm just going to give you an overview so that we can discuss internal control process in detail because risks are always followed by controls so i will take a little time to discuss controls deeply but i want you to also remember these eight words i will with a simple flow discuss these eight words you can always uh, dwell deeper into that so these are called as risk terminology what is it called risk terminology and it's very important that you understand this terminology clearly because risk terminology will lead you to understand the concept of risk management also so let us quickly wind up these two points also risk terminology and risk management i hope all of you know what risk terminology is those of you can type those words in the comments you do those of you who are focusing you continue to do that you making summaries very good so what the first one risk then it is followed by what is called as threat okay uh no risk we will follow it up by vulnerability wait i will write down in that order that i like so that you can explain also with the same example risk vulnerability then it becomes a threat threat is followed up by a probability okay we talk about probability 
risk vulnerability threat probability attack because when there is a high probability of it becoming successful there will be an attack and which will lead to what is called as exposure so risk vulnerability threat the probability of occurrence or it's also called likelihood then we have attack and we have exposure uh, then what is the last one that is called countermeasure uh, am i covering everything risk vulnerability threat probability or likelihood let me write that and uh, yes attack exposure and then the seventh one is something very clear countermeasure anything that you do to stop okay countermeasure now let me help you with a small story here so that you can remember all these concepts very easily what is risk something that you can call as which will lead you to unwanted negative consequences what are we saying unwanted negative consequences this unwanted negative consequences the name only it is there unwanted we don't want it but it's happening for what reason god knows no, not god knows you also know it you should understand let me give you a quick and simple example to wind up this topic uh let's pick up your favorite subject i'm assuming let's say costing and your favorite topic in costing called standard costing okay you don't know standard costing you don't have any idea and those of you who know it don't take it offended it's an example listen carefully so let's say okay i don't know standard costing okay and i'm expecting it not to come in the exam what will we do normally when we don't study a topic we'll look up to the sky and we'll pray god please take care that this topic does not come in the exam now what you should understand is every student will have one topic like that which he will pray so that topic should not come what will god do cancel the exam or what so i don't know standard costing somebody else doesn't know marginal costing some fellow doesn't know material labor over it so basically god should not conduct that exam only and anyway exam will happen and there is a possibility that a question can come from standard costing i don't know standard costing is my inherent weakness correct inherent weakness or simply you want to say its weakness in system safeguards in this language it's called weakness in system safeguards had this weakness not been there that means you're not giving a chance to anybody to exploit but now that this weakness is there somebody may attack you sir standard costing may not come in exam also no sir yeah that may or may not probability is a threat your heart is beating faster till the time you see the question paper and you get a confidence that that question is not there you will never feel happy is that right okay you understand what i'm saying so it's pretty important for you to uh, understand the connection between vulnerability and threat vulnerability is on your end you don't know that chapter it may come in the exam no it may not come but there is always a threat that it could come now what is a threat here threat is a action event threat is a action event or a condition threat is an action event or a condition which may inflict harm into the organization inflict means put in which may inflict harm into the organization or simply i'll say harm which may inflict that action will it happen i don't know sir will that event happen sir will question from standard costing come i don't know okay but i don't know standard costing is my weakness an action event or condition that that question may come uh, until i see the question paper i don't know this but to make myself happy what will i do i will go to past exam question papers immediate previous attempt standard costing came acha okay came so there is a chance that it can come you went one more attempt back sir question is not there super you went one more attempt back sir only one small question came fine 
So these are all what you are doing is to comfort yourself. Saying that this didn't come, didn't come, it came. So doing this analysis and that will help you determine what is the probability or likelihood. Sir, once in three attempt that question is coming, sir. Take it easy, no problem. Now, meanwhile, one of your friend walked in and say, what is your problem? Standard question. Are listen, even if it comes in exam, chalo, let's say eight marks question came and you don't know anything about it. What is the maximum you are losing? Eight only, no? Leave it. Right balance 92 properly. Friend, motivator, huh? suddenly somebody when they tell that statement, you will be all excited. What this fellow is telling is correct only, no? Why am I dying for eight marks? And just in case if God listens to whatever I am saying, that eight also will not come. Or meanwhile, another friend who is listening to this conversation, he said, are a mad fellow. Anyway, you will have one question for choice. No. Just in case, even if standard costing comes, make sure that you leave that in choice. What if I don't know something? Now that is your headache. But at least this can be... And immediately when you heard that fellow, your confidence started boosting. So now you are considering factors, probability. I let it come, sir. We will see. From where you are afraid with the vulnerability that it may come to that because you don't know to now deciding the probability or likelihood which is nothing but the chance. Like how we say chance of rainfall. It's more a, a probabilistic aspect. May come, may not come. The last three attempts, so it came once. So in your attempt, it may come, it may not come. Now, now is the story which is going to happen at the exam hall. You're going there, sitting, waiting for the paper, shaking your legs, hands, whatever is possible to shake your... And then your uh, head is not giving you that space to take your friend's words very seriously. Back in the study time, when they told it was all motivating. But now when you actually came to exam hall, you are getting tension. Suddenly, if they give 16 marks from standard costing only, will ruin my attempt. What will happen? And then that thought process will lead you somewhere else. You know why I am giving this example? Because this is what happens with many people. Standard costing may not be the topic, something else in every subject. And pre-exam discussions will increase this nonsense. Somebody will, outside the exam hall, they are revising standard costing. And when you saw that book in their hand, your heartbeat from 72 went to 120. Possible or not? Quite possible. And meanwhile, you heard two people discussing. Are you last three attempts, only once they gave standard costing to that means pakka this time they are going to give. This is what you heard. And uh, now 120 or 125, it's like running on, uh, you know, on the treadmill at a 15 speed. That is how your heart is racing. You went to the exam hall, you are not. The moment they gave you question paper, you are not seeing anything else. You are checking every question. Not reading, just checking whether it is a standard costing question or not. First page, second page, third page, fourth page. No standard costing. You threw that paper in the air and you called the invigilator and... Okay, all the drama is not there. But all I am saying is, you will feel very happy because you haven't been attacked by ICA. Correct? Just imagine the opposite scenario. They gave you the question paper. First compulsory question, be there? No. They gave you... Calculate the variances based on standard costing. That's all. What will you do? You, you thought like, you know, tearing the paper, tears are rolling on, not physically, but internally. Mind is damaged already. You're like gone. Attempt is gone. 16 marks are gone. I'm failing in this whole paper. Only one question. Thing happened. But, you know, you're so forward your life, you will take it. In the next 30 seconds, you'll think about if I'm not doing CA, then what is the next best course that I have to do? How will I get a job? From one small topic of 16 marks, I mean, I think whoever is listening to this, all of this has happened to all of us at least once. Okay, all of us, including us, I mean, including me, because, you know, these are situational. Nothing of this is, you know, one time, one time, these are all situational. Everybody will experience it and I'm pretty sure everybody should experience it. Then only that flavor of, uh, you know, doing something will work. Okay. Uh, you know, this always happens at every stage, you, foundation, inter, final, everybody at any point of time, you are very sure that you will pass that exam. Still, that racing of a heartbeat will be there. Are you facing that event of an attack or not? 
that is a big question okay only the topics might change from standard costing to whatever uh, in every subject we will have something or the other okay that will trouble us so whether there is an attack and this attack is an event the moment you saw that first question 16 marks you lost 16 marks no sir somewhere in one corner they gave compute variances for 4 marks so that means what if they give you for 4 marks, you lose 4. For 8, you lose 8. 16, you lose 16. Which means what? Exposure is the extent of loss or damage. Extent of loss or damage that is suffered. Extent of loss or damage that is suffered is called as exposure. For you... The exposure for not knowing standard costing or the exposure because of this vulnerability is the 16 marks that you lost. Extent of loss or damage that is suffered by the organization is called as exposure. And this follows a sequence. Risk, vulnerability, threat. There is a probability of that becoming a reality and then there is an attack or no attack. If there is an attack, you will end up paying a consequence that is a price for it, which is called as the exposure. And everything that you do to avoid this or to make sure that you set up something like we spoke about confidentiality. So putting up strong passwords, not allowing uh, unknown people to get onto your network. All those are something which are called as countermeasures. Anything that you do, okay, it's a device procedure technique, whatever you call it. It's a procedure or a technique for what? To stop something from going wrong. Okay. So procedure or technique which will in fact you can say it, procedure or technique to reduce vulnerability. This whole story became serious only because you had vulnerability. No. Had I known standard costing my entire example is totally redundant. The only reason this entire thing worked well is because you believed that you don't know the topic. Understood? If you know the topic, the story is not there. No. So anything that you do to reduce the vulnerability, the procedure or technique that you follow, that is called as a countermeasure. And once you know all this, it comes down to one last topic here in risk called as risk management technique and five risk management terminology or techniques are there the first one is called as risk avoidance which means completely to avoid the risk and how do you avoid a risk by not doing something so that is the most stupidest thing that you can do you cannot uh, you know just leave it like that so risk avoidance the next one is called accepting the risk okay i will not avoid I will accept the risk. Let's say that is there. Yes, sir. Risk will be there. We can't do anything. We will call it as accept or tolerate. Okay. How will you avoid or eliminate? You can also say eliminate. Eliminate the risk by not doing it. As simple as that. Accept the risk. Eliminate the risk. Or you can do one thing. You can take an insurance or something like that. Share the risk with somebody huh? sharing the risk or risk sharing is a very uh, great risk management terminology like how we do life insurance or vehicle insurance or whatever so that you know you're sharing the risk with somebody and the next one is the most important one which leads us to the next concept called as risk mitigation what is risk mitigation trying to bring down the risk by establishment of what is called as controls and the fifth risk management technique is called as turn back, which is called as ignoring the risk. And nobody would want to ignore the risk unless the impact of that is very, very small. So these five are called as the risk management terminology or risk management techniques. So five techniques. I hope all of you are clear. Oh, I'm seeing a lot of comments flowing in. Very appreciable. Those of you who are very interested and giving the answers, I really appreciate that as well. Good. So that brings us to the end of the whole story of BPA, the all uh, subconcepts involved in BPA and all the risk terminology. This is very important. Anything of this can pop up and uh, 
केस बेस्ड एम सी क्यूज और द रेगुलर एम सी क्यूज और इवन इन क्वेश्चन and then of course this could probably be an exam question it has been in the past that explaining the risk management techniques and if you simply write this five you are going to get all the marks so that leaves us with one last topic so you guys want to take a screenshot of this you can do that as well so these are all pretty important and interesting topics and to now sum up the story i'm going to give you the internal control framework because the next topic always that follows risk is controls and in controls we know that controls is a story of three p's okay what are the control story of three p's what are those policies procedures and practices so we know what are controls we've already discussed in audit we've discussed in many places about controls uh so that should not be a tension for us okay yeah meanwhile you all of you have typed in somebody is asking sir do something for ca final uh i'll do something okay chalo suddenly a comment uh from something that's out of the box but yeah of course good all of you who've typed in all the five risk management strategies all of you good chalo now the three p's what are we talking about here in the three p's that policies procedures and practices now you have read this definition in audit you have read this definition in standard number 315 ha uh, what is it policies procedures and practices designed by obviously the management who designs internal controls is the management so policies procedures and practices designed by management to provide what a reasonable assurance to provide a reasonable assurance that what a reasonable assurance that undesired events something that you don't want to happen undesired events to provide a reasonable assurance that undesired events are prevented that is either you stop them even before they happen undesired events are prevented or either detected and corrected detection and correction go hand in hand so this is the definition of controls not something new that all of you very clearly know from audit and this is a definition that is also picked up in standard number 315 so very simple policies procedures and practices adopted by a management to provide a reasonable assurance that undesired events are either prevented or detected and corrected so detection and correction go hand in hand and then also you would want to know what are the types of controls there are three types of controls right which again we have discussed even in audit what are the three types of control controls which are completely manual manual controls okay a uh, manual controls here then automated controls and then we have what is called as semi automated we have all three manual controls automated controls and semi automated controls so these three are even the classification and types of controls okay so is it so far so good yeah very good i can still see some people putting those things in the comments appreciable very very good so a quick question guys a quick feedback because we are in the fag end of the story here wherein we got to talk about uh, the internal control framework which is very similar to the ERM framework ERM is about enterprise risk management right i'll give you a brief about that but meanwhile if you guys would let me know that whether everything is going good for you i believe so because there is a lot of active participation from so many and i think in such short time 
a decent amount of coverage is also taken place now moving on is to one important concept called as the internal control framework now i want you to listen to this concept very carefully because you don't have to do the erm framework if you know the internal control framework clearly let us understand how internal control framework is uh, discussed now if you see how internal control framework is discussed you have a clear understanding as to what are internal controls but before we do that we should definitely have an understanding of what what are the aspects that surround us now like say for example that is only called as control environment do you guys recollect anything about the three a's attitude awareness and actions do you guys recollect these three words attitude awareness and actions attitude is to know uh, i mean attitude is to have a thought that you have to set up controls let me write this down for you i think because uh so the first and foremost thing in internal control framework is understanding what is called as control environment and in understanding the control environment we have three a's attitude awareness attitude awareness and actions this is actually a very life changing uh top i mean topic 3 is first you should have the attitude to do something so if the management does not have the attitude to set up the controls itself then the story doesn't begin let's just say that they have the attitude to set up controls then the next question that pops up is okay if they have the relevant attitude where do you think they should set up you should be aware of where to set up also no so you are having the attitude to set up controls and you are also aware where to set up then the only thing is you should actually go ahead and set up that is taking the action okay now attitude awareness and action fine we have an understanding of the control environment but if you don't know where risks are where will you set up the controls so which is why step number 2 becomes risk assessment risk assessment now unless you assess the risks very carefully you will not be able to set up control so you have to prepare a risk list i hope you study in audit standard number 315 which will help you understand the entity the environment general risk entity specific risks all those will be identified and accordingly a risk list will be prepared and now once you finish preparing the risk list that is risk assessment is done step number 3 is establishment of controls called as control activities control activities which means you will establish the control for this risk this is the control and is the control limited or is the control fully available or what is that control that entire description will be given in control activities followed by step number 4 two words information and communication what is that control about you have to prepare a description of the control and communicate it to the right people communicate it to the right people information and communication this is pretty important because if you don't know i think you know the definition of staffing putting the right person in the right place putting the right person in the right place so if you give the information about what is the control that fellow will first get awareness as to what that control is then if you talk about communication that means putting it uh, across to people simply you can't say do it or don't do it you should have a you know a, a real way in getting this done so that is where communication plays a role communicate it to the right set of people then environment is absolutely dynamic things do keep changing very often so which is one of the reasons why you should have a careful watch monitoring and time to time when things change you should also adopt accordingly to that change okay so this five steps understanding the control environment 
okay understanding the control environment which is about attitude awareness and actions then preparing a list of all the risk the risk list becomes a very important thing control activities is about setting up all the controls information and communication and then monitoring what is going where this becomes a very important scenario okay now a very parallel topic to this one is again the erm framework let's keep this here we'll also talk about erm which is nothing but enterprise enterprise risk management now one thing that you have to understand about erm is simply if you adopt an erm framework you will not eliminate the risk but you can only curtail it to an extent you we brought in erm no so from now no more risk uh, not like that you you cannot eliminate that what you actually have to do is you bring in the erm framework it will reduce the probability of things going wrong sir just now you told that topic no exactly so the erm framework is no different from the internal control framework and let me just prove that to you by listing down what are there in the erm framework instead of control environment it says understand the internal environment internal environment which is again understanding the same as to what is that environment where are we who are we what are we doing all those things only so there is basically a small what do you say wording change that's all uh, but there is no big uh, meaning change internal environment then now second and third step are an extra elaboration of what we normally do before risk assessment okay step number 2 is called objective setting since you are already well aware that every organization when they set objectives there are some threats to that objective what is our internal environment that is what are we trying to understand what objectives are we willing to achieve in the process of achieving this objectives wc gws have you heard of that what can go wrong every event that will trigger that there is a risk of you not able to achieve your objective take a white paper make a list of all that called as event identification guys later sit and read this in detail now if you concentrate on the q that is in a first understand the internal environment which means the three a's attitude awareness and actions nothing more than that then comes objective setting wherein what is that you are willing to achieve you have to set up those objectives then event identification identify all those potential events which may affect you from achieving these objectives then step number 4 will be risk assessment which is very parallel to what you see here now after risk assessment normally what will we do we will figure out one of those five risk responses now in the previous slide only we wrote now what are those risk responses so you will go ahead by doing one of these five techniques avoid accept share mitigate or turn back you will go ahead and do any of these in this step so understanding the internal environment objective setting identifying the events risk assessment and risk responses rest of the steps remain the same 6 7 and 8 are exactly these three steps only which are nothing but setting up of controls after risk response that is what you are doing no setting up of control activities information and communication monitoring sir erm is it any new framework no erm is a well developed internal control framework that's all so where is the key factor coming in instead of simply saying risk assessment you are also giving weight to what are your objectives and in the process of achieving these objectives what events could hinder you what events can stop you basically we are doing a risk assessment in a little more detailed manner and then choosing one of the five risk responses and then the next three steps remain the same totally okay so i think again a very good lot of comments popping up who are always taking a little time to type in there very good 
yeah so that is the parallel drawn between erm framework and internal control now i would want you to do a, a little effort here towards the end because there is one topic which discuss about the benefits of erm which if you give a, a reading you will be able to understand you won't need much of my help there but i'm just alerting you to read the topic benefits of erm eight benefits are there okay so you might just want to run through that because that could potentially turn out to be a exam question now to bring down the story to an end we do have process oriented risks in each process what risks will be there at what levels so you can individually read that topic because they are all same risks and control objectives but i would like to tell you the three stages at which risks will be there so there is configuration risk okay configuration master configuration master and transaction okay configuration master and transaction this becomes a very very important uh setup for us to understand this three terminology is very important to understand so that then you can go and see at which level what can go wrong what do you mean by configuration way a software is set up now generally whenever we friends are discussing about laptops or desktops and we we'll ask no are what's your system's configuration configuration means what the way how that system is set up what is it made of way a software system is set up is called as configuration in other words it is the built of the system what is it built with that is what we are trying to understand through the word configuration refers to the way how a software system is set up you know in fact uh in this context of users like from the users perspective uh if you are doing user activation or deactivation okay access privileges which i will discuss in my second chapter later but let me give you some examples of what configuration is examples of configuration would be uh first one user privileges that is who will get what powers then one more example for configuration is user activation when we newly when an employee newly joins an organization we will onboard him that onboarding is a process which talks about you know user activation and when he leaves the organization user deactivation so user act uh, activation and deactivation the way a software is set up all this come under the definition of configuration now there are two things that you really need to understand from the perspective which is broadly there in the second revision session i will straight away start with erp because uh, i mean or technical concepts i won't discuss again master data and transaction data so please concentrate here itself what is master and what is transaction because in the beginning of the second chapter we start with master and non master data or master and transaction data so please concentrate on what are masters okay master is something that is semi permanent in nature okay what is it masters are okay first of all we will uh, not just talk about the data perspective here even when we say customer master or uh, we say vendor master whatever it is we are referring to something how the parameters are set up okay let me just write down the definition then i'll give you examples masters are nothing but how various parameters are set up for all the modules okay how parameters are set up for all the modules that is what master means and one of the key factors about master is it does not change very often does not change very often 
मतलब इट चेंजेस बट नॉट वेरी ऑफन एंड वेन एवर समबडी इज गिवेन अ पावर टू क्रिएट अ मास्टर डेटा और क्रिएट अ मास्टर इट हैज टू बी दी ऑथराइज पर्सन एनी बडी एंड एवरी बडी इन दर्गनेशन शुड नॉट हैव एक्सेस सो मास्टर्स आर जनरली सेटअप द फर्स्ट टाइम ड्यूरिंग इंस्टॉलेशन दे सब्जेक्ट टू चेंज ओके वॉट वील से दे आर सेटअप at the first time of installation will it not change after that no i am not saying that it may change but not very often let me write that also may okay i think i did write it does not change very often means it may change but not very often okay some of the examples i can give you list of all the customers that is called customer master customer master vendor master from whom you procure or your uh, supplier master file like that lot of master files are there and then employee master file where all the hr data is put up so basically master is about that particular tran uh, i mean uh, parameters which are set up initially when the system is set up okay and then they don't change very often so configuration master and transaction transaction is what actually takes place what actually takes place regularly and obviously it's the opposite here changes very often changes very often that means every transaction there is some kind of a change right and there is nothing much to discuss on transaction sales purchase whatever you do they are all called as uh, transactions so basically they refer to the actual activity so i'll say they also refer to the actual activity that takes place in the organization actual activity that takes place in the organization which is what is called as transaction okay so examples sales purchases you can always write down so many transactions are there sale transaction purchase transaction etc i'm saying a lot of those okay so these are the three critical words that you need to understand because they make a great deal of uh, sense to understand and so many areas in so many areas we have uh, Uh, these configuration master and transaction risks and against them controls that to be set up but for you for all these processes what are transaction master and configuration risks are only discussed configuration is also discussed in one or two places but what are the master risks and what are the transaction risk are discussed for a few process and when you see the table on one side they gave the risks like what are the master risks in purchases will be the same in sales will also be the same in hr will also be same in fixed asset so majority of that is a repetitive content and i request all of you to go through that risk table on the other side they didn't give controls they gave control objective what will normally be a controls objective to overcome the risk right so whatever they gave on the risk side the opposite of that is only the control objective so that doesn't make a lot of sense just read the risks and try to understand what those risks are at all three levels and i think they gave it to you for six process okay they gave this for six process sales purchases inventory hr fixed assets and general ledger so those six processes you would uh, you know mind covering that by reading the table that's it that is the major part of this chapter and the last part of this chapter talks about cyber laws that are important because every organization has to follow the laws and regulations without following the laws and regulations or regulatory and legal compliances so computer related offenses what can happen what are some of the computer related offenses first and foremost thing though i will not list down all of that because it's a very easy topic hacking fake profile creation harassment online sale of illegal articles the long list of 
computer related risks only because of using computer what risk can come i think you can read that list 10 or 12 points will be there first of which is hacking harassment using fake profile and uh, online sale of illegal articles uh, identity theft uh, cyber pornography there are a lot of points that one can understand email accounts getting hacked phishing attacks credit card scams so a long list of points are there which you can go through i think around 10 points are there which are called as uh, computer related offenses only because you using computers they are coming uh, if you are not using computers they will not come and then there is a difference between traditional crime which is nothing but a theft jumping the wall and going and stealing goods that is called traditional crime and when you don't jump any walls but you jump firewalls okay that is called a cyber crime that means the one who is committing the crime will not move physically anywhere he using his system will hop across or hop around and get to a place where he wants to gather data so that is exactly what is the difference between a, a cyber crime and a traditional crime in a traditional crime physical activity is there like jumping the wall breaking the lock all that is there but in cyber crime all that drama is not there from wherever he is sitting he'll breach a firewall or he'll breach all the access controls and from there they will get unauthorized access to a root system from where they will steal information then a uh, one more topic here which has a lot of weight nowadays is called as privacy it's the right for every organization sorry every individual to maintain its privacy and it becomes the duty of every organization to protect the privacy and in the process of protecting privacy there comes what is the classification of spdi i would like to end this session by discussing what spdi is so meanwhile this topic no ma please run through it because i think there is a there is just a law there is nothing for me to explain it's a law so just read and understand uh, you will also have here section 43 section 43 has uh, 10 points which talks about what are computer related crimes and for everybody who does anything mentioned in section 43 he has to pay penalty and compensation for the loss that he has created and then he will again be punished under section 65 okay so 66 uh, i mean so section 65 66 what punishments are there these are just sections wherein there is nothing for you to uh, read or understand conceptually section 65 and 66 along with 43 so this piece i guess you can read just to understand what are there this 10 risks you read computer related offenses or computer related risk and then this i anyway explain two lines only traditional crime versus cyber crime now let's end this discussion by understanding what constitutes to spdi sensitive personal data or information sensitive personal data or information listen carefully anything that is capable of identifying a person what you are saying anything that is capable of identifying a person that means by using six points that i'm going to tell you now you'll be able to identify a person so anything that helps in identifying a person that becomes sensitive personal data or information and according to the information technology act six items are termed as sensitive personal data or information and what are these six spdi first and foremost thing is uh, i mean one more thing that you should understand here sir if we know the definition of spdi how is it really useful and what is the real meaning of knowing this spdi see first let us understand what those six are and then i will tell you why to close the session so one passwords all our passwords are spdi two financial information passwords 
financial information physical psychological and mental health conditions physical psychological and mental health situation okay and then sexual orientation sexual orientation of a person is his choice okay passwords financial information physical psychological mental health condition sexual orientation then uh, i'll write here five medical records or medical information and six all your biometric information what are all these six called as the six information about a person they are called as spdi now why does spdi become very important because there are lot of body corporates there are lot of body corporates like educational institutions our mobile service providers okay and hospitals so you, you, banks so you know that there are a lot of organizations to whom you have given all these six did you not give all the six information to so many people like in hospital they have medical records uh, like in uh, insurance companies they have our medical records or they have our health information and uh, banks have our financial information how much money i have and there are l a lot of body corporates where we have passwords so all i am trying to tell you is that this six are very very critical sir then what about the body corporate section 43a of the information technology act says it is the duty of body corporate it is the duty of the body corporate to protect spdi it is the duty of the body corporate to protect the spdi because if the body corporate fails body corporate fails to protect spdi then they are liable they are liable to pay compensation they are liable to pay what compensation for the loss that the person has suffered so spdi is capable of identifying you and to whomever the body corporate you gave the spdi it is your duty to make sure that they are protected sir my duty yes of course when you are giving that information and what is the duty of the body corporate the body corporate should make sure that they protect their spdi if they fail to protect their spdi under section 43 of this act under section 43a of the information technology act it is a punishable offense sir how will i know body corporate is collecting there is one more duty of the body corporate actually two things here they should take your consent to collect this information and many people know without reading all the terms and condition they'll type i agree one of the terms in that i agree is that you are giving your consent to collect the info who gave the body corporate the permission to collect all that you only gave sir the body corporate is disclosing this information to somebody unless they are legally obligated they won't but who gave the consent again consent to disclose so the consent to collect and consent to disclose these two are to be given by the individual these two are to be given by the individual to the body corporate and body corporate should clearly have it in writing now when you purchase a sim card are you signing a form now many places you will not even read all the terms and conditions you will say i agree and nowadays you are authenticating using your fingerprint which means you are just saying that i agree to all the terms and conditions and you are going on so many shopping websites like amazon flipkart and you are saying i authorize otherwise they won't let you do the shopping there so you are authorizing so many things wherein you uh, you know you don't really know what exactly you are authorizing so be very careful you are disclosing so much of spdi no doubt it is a duty of the body corporate to protect your spdi otherwise it will be a punishable offense for them okay so that's it for today guys i think you know we have tried to cover the maximum from the very first chapter the eis i think i've covered all the topics but for some of the small topics which obviously a chapter that takes roughly 
12 to 14 hours to understand regularly can be revised in this short time only that too we have done a greater detail so this session will definitely be available after this live session or live stream ends so you guys can obviously take screenshots of whatever uh, you want and please do revisit all the topics if at all you are not able to make the summary notes along with it which i always uh, request you to do but if you haven't done it don't worry get back to the video and make it and please do make sure that you revise it properly and uh, there is one part of this chapter which also talks about all the diagrammatic representations called the flow charts flow charts and data flow diagrams yeah you can obviously go uh, to my uh, channel and check of you can type in the search bar flowchart by Arish Krishnan you will find a couple of videos where I have fully explained flowcharts so those of you who are expecting flowcharts you can always uh, check there okay and I guess that brings us to the end of the very first live session of EIS I didn't expect again 100 people uh, today because since it's only EIS I thought the flow will be less but then again very good I'm really happy doing this and Tomorrow is going to be a big day wherein we are going to catch up back audit. We did a two couple of continuous sessions on audit first one and second one. So tomorrow's session is going to grab a lot of attention on standards 505 and 580 and then a whole lot of three series uh, stories there. So I hope to catch up tomorrow and now let me quickly check the comments. Sir will you complete all the ASM audit before July exam? Aisha, I think you should go and uh, see the schedule that I gave that ends on 26th of June itself. So, I potentially hope to complete all, right? So, if you don't know the schedule or if you have come today only, you can go to the community tab of my channel. You will find the whole schedule of revision. And if anybody has missed audit, you can go and review the two parts. SM first part is also there. So any of you have joined just now, uh, the live stream will be available after this session is done. So you guys can watch and make the most of it. Done. I'll catch up with you guys in tomorrow's session. Hi guys, very good evening. I hope you guys are doing good. It's a slight change in the timing. Yeah, I did. Uh, I mean, of course, got stuck with something. So I had to change it in the last minute. So I hope. Yes, good evening, good evening. I will give a minute for people to join in. Today we will be discussing about the second chapter which is about financial and accounting systems. So we will take a minute to discuss. Uh, meanwhile, I will just let you know what we are actually discussing today. So the major story for the day will be about ERP. So chapter number 2. Chapter 2. That is about financial and accounting systems. Financial and accounting systems. So today's session predominantly will discuss about what is master data and non-master data. Though we have already had a discussion master data and non-master data. Then we talk about front end and back end part of a system. Front end and back end. Then I'll give you a quick insight about what are installed applications versus cloud based applications. Then we will move on to the two types of systems wherein we have non integrated systems non-integrated systems and integrated systems so these are the two categorizations which will further spread integrated systems are discussed in deep in the likes of ERP what is an ERP how it will help people understand what exactly it is uh, and how ERP is helpful for an organization but in the pathway when ERP is giving you or offering you so many benefits there is always a possibility that uh, you know you will end up facing a lot of risks. So, of course, it is not 
something that we can't handle we just have to set up some controls so we will talk about that erp story in full length okay so i hope you are meanwhile people are joining in yes that's the coverage okay yes good evening good evening to all of you who have been wishing there now okay what we will yeah we will discuss modules of erp nothing to worry on that uh somebody is asking is this for ipcc no uh this is not for ipcc so this is strictly for the new syllabus i mean uh there is a i mean uh, there are contents that you can understand but i don't think you will follow the flow and all so if anybody is there who is from the old syllabus the video is in my playlist for it you can go and watch the revision there so hello on that note let's move on we can move on we have no issues right so those of you who have already done first chapter very good now we will straight away start with what is master data and non master data now uh, yeah yeah don't worry i am just telling you that this is the overview after this we have a deep breakdown of what the erp is i'll tell you all that also huh? don't worry what is erp what are the modules involved in erp then what are the five benefits of the crm module we'll discuss that because it's potential in exam question and then we will also talk about uh quickly we will talk about the data analytics and what happens inside the data analytics there are eight steps that happen inside data analytics we'll catch up that and then uh, there are there is another question that can come in the exam is what sort of data is used in an mis report we will discuss that and then i will wind up with a quick note on what is xbrl so that's the coverage don't worry i know what is there in the chapter so just stay put focus and try to understand everything let's keep it uh, clear on what this is first up we are talking about master data and non master data so i hope you know what exactly is uh, non master data which is also called as transaction data now this is something that we have to figure out as a clear understanding master data is data that does not usually change let me make that point here data can be broken down into two types master data so data that often does not change or data which is semi permanent in nature data which is semi permanent in nature that is also called as master data so we have examples like employee master there is some portion of data that does not change very often now it does change but not very often okay so that is why it's called master data and uh, you have employee master data vendor master data all of that then non master data means which is often subject to change non master data is often subject to change and in fact it is also having another name called as transaction data which keeps changing okay now if you really want to know from the employee master's point of view what again can be uh, the distinction between master and non master date of birth date of birth is master data okay but the same thing is computed in the form of age no age is something that keeps changing every minute right every minute you get older so age is transaction data it keeps changing now let's talk about the same story with an example of sales now in a sales transaction normally what happens is we sell a product which has a price there is one buyer now price can be picked up from price catalog buyer orders quantity now if you see this carefully there is a very important point here list of products the list of all the products can be maintained as master data now see 
product pricing i'm talking exclusively about product pricing if it's something else then it's a different story but exclusively product pricing we don't change the price of the product daily there might be a time where you will actually change there might be a time where you will actually change the price once in a while so price can be both now there are some commodities uh exclusively something like crude oil i mean the reason why petrol and diesel keep changing the prices so that is a transaction data yesterday i filled petrol i'll pay different rate than what i paid today so that is purely transaction data so price can't be exactly categorized as master or transaction you can simply say if the price changes occur once in a while then that will be a master price data but if price change is very common then pricing will turn out to be a transaction data quantity no doubt is a transaction data because nobody can predict what exactly will be the quantity in every transaction so that keeps often changing yeah and then things like <clears throat> this one buyer buyer you can make an approved buyer list so lot of people who are your regular buyers can all be part of that list also so buyer no doubt can turn out to be a uh, master data again so buyer master list product master you can pick up price like i said it depends you know if it's a catalog pricing then the catalog pricing will change once in a while not regularly and talk about quantity it can vary from transaction to transaction but this is only the explanation as to what these are why the big story as to why you need master data and non master data i can give you some solid reasons as to why you need master data because see this is something that you need not enter every time there is no reason why you should keep on entering the same data again and again it doesn't make any kind of sense and if there is any data that one has to enter he can enter it from a drop down now when you talk about master data master data can be entered from a drop down because it's already preloaded you can nicely enter from the drop down okay just a second give me okay so that shouldn't be a problem or issue here when it comes to oh, the okay yeah yeah i get it uh okay give me one second we will have to check that back okay we are back sorry <clears throat> so yeah the big question is pending as to why we need master data so just master data can be selected from a predetermined list wherein what you do is the entire list is filled see multiple times what happen people when they do something no they type wrong numbers wrong names wrong account heads and that's unnecessarily a problem say for example when you're talking about datars some people will use the word drs some people use the word sundry datars okay now some people simply use the word datars why do you want to park in different accounts so once you selected this account once you selected this once you selected this and just imagine vendor names now i have seen people write my name in the most horrific way possible okay so and i think that happens with almost all of us at some point of the time or the other i know if you are not careful 
people spell our names also wrong and when names are spelled wrong i'll tell you a very simple example the same transaction being done with the same person might be recorded as two different people and then your system will create when you can nicely select from drop down why not and transaction data which keeps changing there is a need for you to update every transaction and which is why we need a clear distinction on what is uh, master data and what is transaction data okay so this is the first part of our story then because you know there's a there is one more thing yeah that i would want to mention sometimes not always but transaction data can also be entered from drop downs not always sometimes transaction data sometimes can be chosen from can be chosen from where drop down so how can you choose transaction data now i can definitely give you an example for this one okay let's say there are purchase orders purchase orders some open purchase orders are there open purchase order means for which you have not received goods yet so let's say 450034 45035 this is a serial of purchase orders for which goods are yet to be received now the purchase order against with the quantity we have raised 200 here 500 150 then 750 something like that we ordered the quantities pos are raised now let's say when purchase order 34 quantity was received we obviously will park a grn remember goods receipt note so we can when parking this grn this this is one ledger this separate this grn okay now grn number 0048 now this grn number 0048 is against which po system will ask or not so because only these four are open pos you can also give a drop down here for only open pos so when people click they will get only these four now this one is against 34 right so 45034 quantity 200 and that po gets closed same way we got another grn grn 0049 and this time we good uh, we received goods pertaining to 45036 po fair enough and how much did you receive only 50 that means still 100 against this po is pending or not now a few days later after so many days because some stock shortage was there or something like that we are parking another grn Double zero this time eight five something after a few days. Now you got goods. It belongs to which invoice again? Can you click here in the drop down and see four five zero three six will still be pending. Three four will get closed because quantity matched and you know everything is done. But three six you ordered one fifty you got only fifty. So when you hit the drop down here you can select four five zero three six and balance hundred you can pass an entry here. the first time when you knock off this this will still remain with a quantity of 100 open and when this 85 grn is passed this also will get cancelled did you guys understand this example this is something to do with uh, cases where sometimes even the master data i mean even the transaction data can be entered from drop downs that is just an extra example for you to understand how that concept works okay so i think that is the end of our first story on uh this one master data and non master data and why should we have separate master data and non master data okay then the story number 2 that is coming up is of uh, every software system working of a software system it has two parts front end and back end what is the story about front end and back end let's get to that now working of a software this is a thing that everybody has to know that there is a user at one end there is a user user will obviously communicate to what is called as front end user will communicate to what is called as front end now there is one part of the software that is not visible which will do all the job is called the back end where all the major processing and everything happens 
and then that again is sent back to front end sent back to front end and front end communicates back to the user so this story is pretty normal wherein in terms of understanding what a software does front end will collect the information from the user send it to the back end back end will do all the processing and give back the results to front end front end will carry it back to the user the front end the best part is you know it's in visual or you know graphic output okay so that people can understand the back end is technical that we don't need to know as to how it works so as long as you understand that there is a back end it talks about that's more than enough okay so this is exactly how we deal with front end and back end now why should we have a front end and back end that's a big question not what is a front end and back end that's okay that everybody understood here front end is a platform for the user to communicate back end is where the actual data is and actual processing happens but the big question here is why why do you have to have front end and back end what is the story very simple i can give you a shortcut to remember that now here there is a, a good example that's been given in the material wherein they have compared this with a example of a restaurant why should we have a waiter and why should we have a chef why can't it be done by the same person okay i'll give you a shortcut here to remember it's called pulse okay what do you mean by pulse first up we want presentation now you have to understand let's pick up the parallel example that we've discussing here that is the restaurant example waiter can present himself much better and he can also present the food better not that the chef can't do it but chef is working in a kitchen what do you expect him to do immediately after he finishes cooking changes attire into a waiter and come there and serve and go not making any sense right so waiter let him do his job chef let him do his job and the best part about this is if each one of them are doing their own jobs their expertise will also increase their expertise will also increase right so presentation becomes an important and not only that if the same person starts to take your order then go then start cooking and then come out and then serve user is irritated nobody wants that you know uh, lackluster user experience everybody wants the experience to be smooth so second one is user experience then language do you know if the chef will be able to talk in the language that the customer understands the waiter does so whenever they select a waiter they'll select somebody who can speak two or three languages at least the uh, you know the regional and local languages so that whoever comes to the restaurant he can converse with them properly and uh, understand now chef if he is a great chef he need not even talk because his food will talk right so he don't have to do anything same way front end is that part of the software which is easy to interpret and understand while back end is that part of the software where it's technical so you don't get into the roots of what is called as a back end software back end will do its own processing and give you so splitting this will be a good thing to do then of course the next point i don't think i have to explain line it's called speed if one person is only doing all the work it will definitely uh, become slow and then the last point talks about expertise which is nothing but if you are good in one area and you continue to stick to that area definitely you will be able to uh, what do you say gather experience in that area and when you gather so much experience in that area it automatically will help you to become better and better so subject area matter expertise or domain expertise it's also called domain expertise or domain knowledge so all this will accrue and that is exactly one of the reasons why you can't club both front end and back end and you should have separate front end and back end okay so are you guys comfortable with this concept as well this is again a very simple topic so if you guys can quickly confirm as to what it is you can always Uh, we can proceed further to the next discussion on systems i hope everybody is clear
so we move on very good yes okay yeah good good all right guys yeah i can see your yes and clear very good now we move on to the next one okay cool cool uh sir should we write the restaurant example not required unless they ask you uh, really but i don't think you know uh, you will be asked something like that but if you are asked you, you have to explain these five points that's clear if you want to use a restaurant example you can always do so okay yeah uh difference between user experience expertise is what each one of them has no user experience oh here they are talking about the feel that the user gets user experience means not uh i mean not the experience that you gathered user experience like movie experience we tell no that one the feel that you get that is what they are talking about not the expertise yeah okay uh i think i was able to clear that let's move on now to the system story systems are broadly categorized into two systems what are these two systems categorized into one is called as non integrated systems non integrated systems the other one is called as integrated systems non integrated systems and integrated systems now non integrated systems have something which is decentralized they are absolutely decentralized each one of them are in their own way they are not connected at all okay so if there is no connection that is decentralized every department has its own then that is what is called as non integrated systems the predominant factor being decentralization but there are two drawbacks in a non integrated system though they are decentralized and everybody maintains their own thing and all is fine but there are two drawbacks you know what are the two drawbacks one when you take data from one department and put it across to the other or when you mix or combine there is a possibility that there can be mismatch data mismatched data and there is also another point which says there is communication gaps there is communication gaps so because of these two reasons because of these two reasons there is a lot of issues that can crop up now when i say what issues can crop up when data can't be matched up data can't be matched up then obviously things are going to go wrong so which is why from one department to the other you have to extract the data transfer because if the end results of that department becomes the input here that is again unnecessarily a complicated story same thing you talk about communication gap one fellow will say i forgot to communicate one fellow will say this is not there or that is not there all this can turn out to be a huge problem again so to overcome these two we have integrated systems wherein the entire system is unified so that means not 10 systems are not there only one system is there only one system is there which is now going to have different modules and integrated systems the best in example of an integrated system is the erp which is called as enterprise resource planning enterprise resource planning so the erp or enterprise resource planning is such a software where uh you have one big advantage that now whatever was a drawback there earlier that will be eliminated and here it will follow a centralized approach what will it follow it will follow a centralized approach and now that we are talking about centralization that is all data is located in the central server okay but how far it is good that also we will see nothing to worry so integrated systems work as a unified whole which is generally the erp or enterprise resource planning software which is absolutely centralized and now 
one of the most important things about erp is it will bring together finance marketing hr production inventory management r and d whatever departments are there in the organization it will bring in all of them together under one roof and it will follow what is called as a modular approach what will it follow a modular approach so this erp is a one stop solution for all your problems in business so whatever are the i mean you don't you don't call it as problem but yeah that something can turn out into a problem which is what is the integration because all the data is located in the same place all the data is located in the same place there is always a threat that somebody can do something to the data though centralization was your advantage but single data center now that is where slight danger also is coming into the story okay till then it was all okay but the single data center could turn out to be a serious problem yes but of course those two problems that we discussed they are avoided which one the mismatch data part there is no more mismatch data everything else will be clear at the same time since everything is offered well communication gaps also won't be there so this is the first uh, site of understanding on what we call as integrated systems can you just take a quick look at both those now then we will go on to deeply discuss what integrated systems are in the likes of erp so before i break down the whole story of erp i want you guys to take a quick look at this those of you want to take screenshots can do so those of you want to note it down or you are noting it down that also is still fine okay and as we go to discuss the next topic i want to quickly discuss a small topic with you and then we will move on to what is called as erp in detail so before i do that i just want you to understand a couple of terms which is called as installed applications i hope all of you know this but still installed applications versus so you have installed applications then versus you have uh, cloud based which are also called as web applications okay now obviously as the name goes by it's installed into the user system it's installed into the user system and the entire data is with you there is entire data which is with you because you are the sole owner of it and you own that particular application you have installed it but cloud based and web applications are provided over the cloud provided over clouds now here there is a slighter danger whatever the cloud service provider says you got to follow that but this is not mobile and definitely cloud based is mobile but then since it is working not on the basis of internet and because it's there in your system processing is much faster on this side processing is faster here so like that there are some interesting aspects that one has to you know take into consideration while you decide simply you can't say use install application they are only better there is no load on your system there is uh, if you use cloud based application somebody else is providing just you use a system as a tool that's all so installed application or web application which one is better so if you are sparking up a debate like that actually there is no debate but uh, see i mean depending on what you want so if you are talking about something like accessibility no doubt it's mobile it's highly accessible and all that and one more drawback here is in install application the entire installation and maintenance installation and maintenance are to be handled by us because we installed it but here if you see it's all the cloud service provider that is their headache but you do know that data safety why do you want to maintain on cloud because it's uh, easy to handle 
but if you are maintaining on cloud are you not exposing your data to the third party no doubt you are so will it become a problem of course yes data storage and data security will definitely be a problem and one more big problem on this side so data safety data security and one more thing that you can tell about the advantage of installed application is the processing no uh, same thing here performance we call it so no doubt the performance of an installed application is better because you are not depending on anybody it's already loaded into your system but when it comes to cloud based applications when it comes to cloud based application that's not in your control at all correct it's totally based on a cloud vendor and if cloud vendor is not providing you the requisite service then that's all it's all gone for a toss okay so this is a big big uh, important point that one you have to uh, consider i think that's it we have a very simple 3 by 3 equation wherein you have three favorable points for the cloud which says yeah it's accessible anywhere it's mobile that is 24 by 7 it's available and installation and maintenance are not on your head but when it comes to data security data safety that is data ownership my data is with me only i can access it from anywhere and everywhere and the best part i don't have to wait for a third party to prove the performance it's working with my system so i can comfortably work with it that's it guys with this particular topic so that brings us to the end of three topics master data versus non master data front end versus back end installed applications versus web applications and then of course the clear insight what we discussed about integrated and non integrated systems so can i take this forward is also something that i would like to know yeah a lot of people are participating and i'm not reading all your comments you guys are typing it right yeah some people have typed as communication gaps okay i see that now no mismatch of data loss of data yes updations are costly good feasibility uh, security right good 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 i appreciate that participation very good even if i don't read uh, or when i come back and read here it is very good so you be in the flow that's what we want right so let's now move on here we will go on to one very interesting and important topic yes i am also seeing that we can go right we can go ahead right yes very good so cool then we will move on to what is erp that's a bright story coming up here erp or enterprise resource planning what do you mean by erp now if i given a chance i would want to define it as a one stop solution what do i call it as a one stop solution for all the problems in business a one stop solution for i mean it's an enterprise wide information system which is used to coordinate all the resources information and activities that is what normally we call an erp as let's break this down what is erp it's an enterprise wide erp is a enterprise wide software you can say or a communication system or information system whatever you want to call it you can do so erp is a enterprise wide information system so with that heading only they are covering it's not going to be restricted to one department or one particular place it goes much beyond that correct so every organization whoever is using erp should be a multi departmental organization if there is only one department and you don't need any integration you can use a normal software no but where multiple departments are there and where there is integration required now for example you have hr department whatever happens in the hr department their salaries are computed and all and then it's transferred to finance department because they make the payment and uh, what happens in production department what they produced what was the cost of that again finance is linked same way marketing production uh production planning then we have inventory departments who maintain our stock like that if one to the other if communication is not there so the very reason why we came here is because to avoid that communication gap 
and when you know that we are trying to avoid that communication gap you have to do something pretty serious so erp is covering enterprise wide not a single department or something like that and it is dis designed in it's an information system designed in such a way designed in a way to coordinate designed in a way to coordinate coordinate what from various departments that are involved in the organization you can say coordinate all the activities we'll simply say coordinate all the activities or all departments i'll say activities so this is a fundamental definition of erp it's a small definition but you can see there is so much of depth into it what exactly is uh, the benefit of using erp why should i tell you only one i'll give you roughly around 10 benefits of using the erp but irrespective of whatever you see the biggest advantage of erp will always be read as integration okay it will always be read as integration see the fundamental pillar on which this entire concept stands is the integration part only if that is not integrated then we don't really need to worry about it the fact that it has to be integrated is what discusses all this okay then let's move on to the interesting part about erp which is called as the benefits of erp now to start off with the first point always is the point that i told you or wrote here let's put the heading as benefits of erp first one is information integration first one is what information integration there is always a need for you to bring all the information together at one place then the next advantage is on time deliveries on time delivery or on time shipment you can say on time delivery so remember the supply chain management principle delivering the right product to the right person at the right time is a very very important aspect now if you are able to do an on time delivery it will only add value okay because if you are not doing on time delivery customer will lose confidence in you and which also means that when you are getting the goods i think all of you are students of costing so you know what lead time means lead time the time taken to procure the goods after the order is placed uh, obviously no it's not like hello please send me they are not going to send you there's going to be some time gap so that time gap will be called a lead time should we not plan for our lead time and in manual systems if you see or individual departments once it is over then they will come and communicate but in erp it's not like that since it's all integrated we can see the stock going down now all of you studied things like reorder level eoq and all so why don't we program our systems to react at those levels so you have approved vendors from whom you have to buy so they will find out what exactly is the situation and then from there uh, you know automatically an order will be placed and then it goes on okay so the third point where i can tell you it will reduce lead time reduction of lead time or reduce the lead time i hope everybody caught that lead time point because it's again generally very important for people to understand it's not going to be uh, you know always seen like that now when lead time reduces automatically one more reduce will follow up reduce cycle time what is cycle time the time taken to complete one full process while lead time is a time gap for when you procure the raw material after your order cycle time is also called turnaround time i think we already discussed about turnaround time the time taken to complete one full process is called as a turnaround time so two points that you will reduce and then there are two points that you will improve easy to remember okay first one information integration timely delivery or on time delivery then two hours then i have two improved improved what improved customer satisfaction improved customer satisfaction because now you are doing it much better than what you actually thought earlier 
so you you will definitely give better customer satisfaction or improved customer satisfaction and improved utilization of resources you can simply say improved resource utilization now this part is the regular use of erp small erp big erp anything you use these benefits will definitely accrue but when you start using even bigger erps like in manufacturing concerns we'll now talk about a few one more improved is there actually wait wait uh, improved customer satisfaction resource utilization and supplier we talk about customer we talk about us and we talk about supplier also so please add one more point there improved supplier performance because in the story that i told you supplier is only sending you goods no so yes no doubt sorry i missed it the third one improved supplier performance okay so if you make this one timely delivery timely delivery or on time delivery if you write see wordings need not exactly be the same you can suit it to your requirement the point has to be emphasized but drastically changing the side heading also will sometimes be a problem so that's why i'm not saying instead of on time delivery i'm saying timely delivery so first two points shortcut is it that is information integration and t for timely delivery then a couple of actually uh three hours will come okay again uh okay now the numbering will go for it all but let me fit in here reduced cost because i mean like this is 5 this is 6 this will be 7 and this is 8 that's why i remember it three hours and then three improved okay so that itself gives me almost around eight points which generally if somebody asks you a question in the exam which has 10 11 points if you write eight points solid at least you will you know not lose any marks okay so three things to improve are in getting improved what is that resource utilization customer satisfaction and supplier performance reduced quality costs reduce cycle time and of course reducing the uh the best part wherein you reduce the lead time because it's automatically now integrated in the supplier and things will become way more faster and because you have this advantage now i have one more point for you here or three more points that classify 9 10 and 11 9 10 and 11 they called bit bit okay what does this bit stand for here is better analysis and planning better analysis and planning because that's that's what we always look for and we get better analysis and planning then decision making information accuracy and decision making capability improves you can add to improve but i would always want to keep it in bit improved decision making improved decision making and t stands for technology just you have to just slightly be alert here so to get this word bit i used technology first but what will you do with technology just remember that you will have to use the technology which is the latest one erp brings you the latest technology okay so i think i covered all the points i miss one point uh, is there some where uh, yeah okay 1 2 3 4 should come okay yeah sorry too many things to remember for me also and that too without having an exam improved customer satisfaction resource utilization supplier performance okay add one more point here improved flexibility see what all i am doing i'm not even a student from so many years but still i have to find out all these ways to remember fair enough i can do that much for you guys okay so we when anyway, we making the answer easy that's my idea here okay so it starting off with the two points then 3 hours will reduce something then four improved actually if you want you can bring the fifth improved also here but 
since i want to get the word bit i just pulled it off there and kept it like that only okay so one last time for all of you guys information integration and timely delivery first two point and three things to reduce lead time cycle time and cost four improved aspects customer satisfaction will improve resource utilization will improve supplier performance will improve and what i forgot sometime back flexibility will improve that means you can alter you can connect one department to the other if you don't want some department you can remove that so where you want to do what the flexibility is with you and because all the data is available in one place it will definitely facilitate you to do better planning and analysis of what happened you can analyze properly and that will lead you to good planning and good planning always leads to improved decision making as well so the top line managers in the organization can make better decisions and of course erp will be the use of latest technology so if you're making this nine this will be 10 11 and 12 which covers all my points so i hope you guys are noting it down as uh you know kind of a shortcut so that things are made easy okay yeah okay so this is what the story is with respect to the benefits of erp okay so that sums up our discussion there those of you are willing to make that note you can I hope you guys are clear with all the advantages. Now we shall move on to the next topic which talks about how you can use the concept of ERP in terms of the modules. I'll discuss the modules first. We'll get back to risk and controls. Okay. Nothing to worry, we are not skipping risk and controls. I'll first do the modules so that you know that's a better way of understanding. So you can also say the third branch here is modules involved in ERP. Okay, if I vanish for some time, I think I can write the modules here only. So you guys can have a full length catch up. Yeah, that's where you will now be finding all the modules. So concentrate. And those of you who have typed the answers in the comment section, yes, very good. Let me just take a quick peek at that only. Supplier performance, cycle time, technology updation. Oh, very good. So those of you who have been typing the answers and being part of it, very good. Now I would like to know from you some modules. So if you guys are typing in modules, that will also be amazing. But I think I'll not miss it out here. Yeah, I'm pretty clear. The first one is called the finance module. Finance is considered as a lifeblood of any business, right? Finance is what? The lifeblood of any business. Without that, there is nothing happening. Finance module. Then there is an interesting module called the controlling module. Which is always connected along with the finance module. Because this controlling module talks about two things. That it is a cost, revenue. So what are the cost centers and what are the profit centers? It talks about both and the controlling module is almost linked to every other module because everything in the organization will either fall under the category of cost or it will fall under the category of some revenue. Okay, so finance and controlling modules. Then we have what is called as sales and distribution module. Sales and distribution module. material management module material management module production planning module Then HR module, we also have what is called as a quality 
assurance module okay so we'll go move on further then for bigger organizations yeah very good then we have bigger organizations which talk about uh, using a plant maintenance module a plant maintenance module now it's very difficult to remember when was the last time you serviced a machine it's very difficult to figure out so many things like uh, what was the component that was replaced when was it replaced or who did the servicing last time when is the next service due all these are certain things that become a problematic issue if you are not able to find out now how many things will you remember in your mind huh? how many things will you remember in your mind if it was easy to remember like that we will remember it without all these modules but the slightest possibility that you may forget is a threat because see people are going to work on these machines okay and if they are not overhauled or serviced properly and uh, it can be life threatening also not to that person so why should you take all that risk plant maintenance modules so it will keep a track of when was the plant maintained maintain here means service saying and other things when was the component replaced uh, if two year or three year warranty is there for that product is it over or is it still there all that is maintained in the plant maintenance module then mostly it companies and other service oriented companies know what they do they don't take up the entire organization will not take up one task okay just look at somebody like microsoft let's go somebody like tcs okay infosys these people are associated on projects okay so that is why the you know they keep using this word indian project overseas project and all project means a specific task only a group of people in the organization will be working on it so you now your hr module anyway maintains the data of all the employees but who is working on which project and according to that what is going on in that project is also maintained in a separate project systems module project system module then supply chain module supply chain module and then we have what is called as crm module what is called crm module got it guys so these are the 11 modules that are involved in what is called as an enterprise resource planning software now you should also understand that these modules are not simply used just for the heck of every module has a purpose and every module deals with certain aspects it's not like you know uh, because we want to enhance the erp with so many features we are throwing in so many modules no each module has its own uh, reason for existence okay and now one question that has often come in the exam from here is okay we have a customer relationship module wherein we don't have much of outflow customer relationship module gets information from the selling and distribution module whenever a sales is made and a customer is developed you park them in the customer relationship module so that on their birthdays or any key days you can give them offers or you know you can do something this module will help you stay in connect with the customer so that will be giving them some kind of advantages or benefits of having a crm module benefits of having a crm module the first benefit is called as improved customer relations now there is there are no two thoughts in that if you are not having a crm module versus if you are having a crm module your customer will be way more happy in uh, you know the way you treat them so that is definitely value addition to the business which is called as improved customer relation then because now you have an improved customer relation you can always target the customer and you can sell more to them so this is also the reason why you have improved customer revenue so the now revenue that you make from them will definitely will be more 
Now the third point that I am going to tell you is an interesting one because that is something that sometimes even we are forced to do. Right? This is called as maximizing upselling and cross-selling. Maximize two, two things. Upselling and cross-selling. Okay, maximizing, upselling and cross-selling. Okay. Understood. What is upselling? Selling a better version of the same product. Now you have iPhone 10. Okay. Then to the same customer you are selling iPhone 12 or iPhone 12 Max, whatever. So this definitely is an upgradation in the same way. Now selling somebody, you have iPhone, you are selling them AirPods, okay, a connected product, not the same product, but a product that is very much connected, that's called cross-selling, you are selling what is called as a screen guard, okay, and uh, for an iPhone, you are also selling something like the accessories, well, I watch to the same customer and tell him iPhone and I was the best pair, come on, use it, so this is called cross-selling. Upselling is giving them a better version of the same product or a higher upgraded version of the same product while cross-selling is a feature which talks about selling a complementary product. Selling a complementary product. Then along with this you have two more benefits. The communication will improve between departments. Okay. You won't uh, end up being confused and all. Better coordination. Okay. So, you will have better coordination between departments, better internal coordination and this is the best way to optimize the marketing, optimize marketing. That means you are finding the right person and hitting the cord. Okay. So, if any of you have any issues with 11 modules, okay, or if you have anything to deal with in the five benefits you may now want to ask me if at all you want to ask something quickly then we will move on to are you clear with all the modules each module is used for a specific purpose so i want you to understand what that purpose in the module is good very good So that leaves us with only one topic in the ERP risk and controls. Before I discuss that, any points that you would like to ask about ERP or the modules? Huh, meanwhile, yeah, I have one task for you. What is that? You have to now tell me some key integration points. You have to tell me some key integration points. That means which module can be connected to which other module? Tell me which module can be connected to which other. So key integration points what can be connected to what else just tell me that come on I'll give you to start off one example finance and controlling module are connected finance and HR are connected tell me come on what else can be connected with what or what else is integrated to what okay quick I want to see two names of modules that can be integrated you guys have to be fast here. Come on. Sales and finance. Okay, point taken. We'll write that. Sales and finance. Yes, Priyanka. Very good. HR and finance. I already wrote. HR finance. I wrote. Ma. Already. Material management with finance. Yes. Kiran Vijay. Taken. That point is taken. Good. Don't stick to the common points only come on tell me material management to sales very good material management to production material management and quality assurance yes Ahmad very good material management and production planning module yes Sindhu very good material and production Vamshi good material and quality assurance do I find something new finance to controlling and to material yes very good 
Okay, Bindu, that's very good. Sales to CRM. Now only I told you. Otherwise, who will give input data to CRM? Very good answer, Bindu. And then moving on, uh, material management with quality. Very good. Material to sales. And what else is not being connected? Come on, check this out. You are isolating a few. Material management to supply chain. Okay, that is also connected. Because that's how you deliver the right product to the right person. Yes or no? Yes, very good. Material production planning with plant maintenance. Did somebody tell that? No. Nobody has told this. Are I am telling you when you have to plan your production schedule. When you have to plan your production schedule. Don't you think all your machines should be fit and working condition? Huh? So production planning with plant maintenance. Okay. Chalo, very good. Now it's all common answers. Very good. If I didn't read some of your answers, don't worry. Yeah, yeah, I take in point taken. Okay. Sales to supply chain management, sales to CRM. Okay. Good. I mean, I just want you to fundamentally understand the concept of integration. So there are many, many integration points. Okay. That you can always understand. Fine. Yes, yes, yes. Sales to supply chain. I told no. Why is the same comment being sent 10 times? Now moving on. We got to talk about risk and controls. So let me stretch our discussion to risk and controls. Risk and controls in ERP. Now we have categorizations of risk. We are not simply talking about any risk randomly. We are going to categorically discuss what risks are. Because they are also discussed categorically. So we will also discuss risk and controls in a categorical manner. Five types of issues are there. The first of which in risk and controls is called people issues. Okay. Sir, what will people do? Uh, I will tell you. Don't worry. First one, people issues. Obviously, you know, whenever you are bringing a new ERP, everybody will not uh, welcome it with open hands and say, yeah, yeah, very good. It's a very nice thing and all that. Second one, you are using ERP, which is very much a part of automation, BPA, right? And therein, if you bring in ERP and the process is wrong, then you can entirely go for a task. Life before ERP would have been much comfortable than simply commenting on ERP. So there are some process risk. So you have to make sure that processes are intact. Then we have the third area, which is talking more about the technological risk. Any time you bring in any new concept, there's always a problem there. Technological risk. Okay, people issues, process risks, technological risks. Then implementation risk. While implementation, many things can go wrong. So implementation risk. And then of course, uh, the last one here, which is obviously talking about post implementation. Sometimes, you know, we need a lifelong commitment. ERP is nothing short of a marriage. Okay. Wherein you got to bring in so many aspects. Uh, to be uh, discussed here, a lifelong commitment is expected from you. So post implementation also, we will have some kind of risks that we got to yeah, post implementation. Okay. Now these are the five broad heads under which the risks involved in ERP are discussed. Now, for the basic understanding, we again have to stretch into a little more detail. But again, I won't go so deep into each point. But basically, I'll tell you what exactly could turn out to be the dangers. The first of which in people issues, right? People don't like change. If I tell that, you know, we are doing this for your good only. People will be like, oh, that much good is not required for us. Don't change. Because the old systems, whatever are there, they are very comfortable with them. And they also, you know, kind of have, uh, they are very happy with the existing system. And because everything is very happy going in the existing system, we don't want some complications to occur. Okay. 
so that is something that uh, we have to take in to consideration so first of people issues the first one will be change management change management that is not very easy managing change you will always face problems from people sometimes people may leave and go so in order not let all that happen you have to give them proper training but many times people are not very ex uh, enthusiastic while training organization also while imparting training they won't be that uh, you know enthusiastic again so training people may leave the organization and go staff turnover what is the point staff turnover and i think when you discuss about the bpa topic i told you that top management support is very important so sometimes it's so here it can happen that you may not have the top management support top management support so change management training staff turnover top management support and uh, think there is one problem even with consultants those of them who you are appointing they may not do the job properly and because they are not doing the job properly that may come on to your head so these are the five areas where from people you can face problems and the next one as i just told you if the process goes wrong then anything and everything can completely go wrong that is why we talk about bpr see when we are implementing erp it is not just a common exercise it's a bpr exercise that is you are re engineering the entire business process and if something goes wrong there then that could be a disastrous thing program management program management now this is again another important aspect that one has to consider because if you automate the wrong program that's all take it for granted that you know if your erp is not in line with the requirements of the organization the erp is not in line with the organization like some links are missing after procurement it has to go to the stores department from there it has to go to, so there is a flow of events that we designed for the organization that is not there something drastically went wrong with that okay so that turns out definitely to be a great problem now third one is something very easy out of this whole lot because the technological risk that we have already seen in multiple places the first one you can always write the technology risk is what technology can always get outdated so technology can become obsolete that is a risk software functionality software functionality if it's doing more than what you require that is also waste if it is not doing what it is supposed to do then that also is a problem then technological obsolescence is an inherent risk you can't do anything about this one okay and then one more big risk is uh, the entire technological environment is absolutely dynamic so what about changes and upgrades changes and upgrades if you are not doing the changes and upgrade at the right time then that itself can turn out to be a problem and then like how we managed various business in strategic management like that when you have multiple applications will all of them be the latest will your erp cater to everybody so all those are some critical questions which are answered called as application portfolio management means will you be able to manage all the applications inside the portfolio that means you require more than one will you be able to manage all those which are more than one that turns out to be a big question i mean i am not saying that you know you will always be able to not do it or you will always be able to do it but one thing is for sure if you don't manage the applications at the right time then uh, they can always create a absolute problem okay then implementation risk see these things are uh, i mean every organization will face them no organization is perfect in doing all this so every organization will have some uh, risk first and foremost thing i believe 
is always the money aspect what is that money aspect insufficient funding insufficient funding then sometimes it ends up taking long implementation time long implementation time <clears throat> then we have couple of important points with respect to implementation where are you going to store all the data in a centralized database and if you what was the advantage that we discussed in our back centralized database we are storing everything in one place that becomes our biggest advantage uh, we spoke about all this right but now the same thing becomes a big threat because all the data is in one place so data safety then speed of erp in the beginning when you launch the erp it will function amazingly well but if at all many number of people join in or if the workload increases then definitely the speed will also deteriorate and then there is a danger if earlier if one department any system fails only that department will be affected but now if there is a system failure if there is a system failure then the entire organization may come to a standstill which could prove to be pretty difficult or you know uh, you don't even know what to do and most importantly the biggest crisis for all these organizations is access to data or simply you can say data access who has the access to data who can make the changes to data what should you do with data all those are there and as i said post implementation the biggest thing is lifelong maintenance or you can as your book says it's lifelong commitment so implementing erp is not like first time we implemented and that's it it's not like getting a house painted uh, once painted that's all next to three or five years we don't have to look at it it's not like that once an erp is implemented did any bugs come if bugs are coming how will you fix bugs now you guys are all using apps how many times you are getting app updates huh if only the app was fantastic and perfect why will you uh, get any updates correct so here there are some very very uh, okay i think i have to yeah now you can comfortably take a screenshot also if you want so there are five types of broader risk but one thing that you should understand is for each of this risk that you see on screen there is a uh, something that you can easily uh, set up as a control okay understood so that is always there and i hope you are clear with all sorts of risks here okay done guys so that's the story that is there in risk and controls now i would uh, yes of course point is right we need even experts to implement staff turnover yes all of those points are right okay so by the end of the story of erp let me just take you back one slide to just uh, figure it out we started this discussion with what is erp and we discussed what exactly the definition of erp the whole one then this benefits any of them could potentially turn out to be a 
exam question and then we also discuss about the modules there are almost 11 modules that are involved in ERP and then this question which is very important which can turn out to be an exam question as well which is the CRM modules advantages and then we also have discussed about the last story which talked about a key integration point that also we've discussed and then the risk and control chart of the ERP. Then moving on, I have something for you which are miscellaneous topics. Actually, I don't generally revise but now that, uh, okay, yeah, I don't think it will take longer. Uh, I just actually I will normally give a break at this point of time to the revision itself because what are left over are topics like MIS and uh, we also have some uh, short discussion on data analytics and XBRL. I don't generally revise them because you don't need my help in that. Uh, you can give it a reading but I will tell you a point or two about what you need to concentrate so that you can you can implement that and uh, we can close out this. So the first thing uh, before I go somebody is saying thank you so much for revision you are grateful. Okay like I said uh, okay I don't want to answer that now it will be deviating but anyway you are welcome if this has helped you very good that is what even I was looking for as an agenda before. Now, let's talk about this MIS, which is a management information system report. Now, without reports, organizations can't function. So, the story in and around, I mean, MIS, you read it. But what I want to tell you is that there is a question that has appeared in the exam in the past, which can always come back, which is, what sort of information is used? What sort of information is used? in MIS I give you a technique to remember that S T A R ok what is that structured which means it has a pattern to follow and if you don't give the right person at the right time so it has to be timely if MIS data is not timely given when will you make decision and if MIS data is not structured and neatly organized how will decision makers make the decision accurate of course, I don't think I have to explain what accuracy means here because you are giving this data for the top management to make decisions and they expect you to be having some level of accuracy, structured, timely, accurate and relevant for their decision making. It ultimately has to be relevant. If it is not relevant, then you know it will again not help you make a decision. So, they have defined as what is management information system. Normally, why do you need reports? Small discussion about all that. But that has never been asked. But what can be an exam question is, what sort of information is being used in MIS? That you have to know. And then another important question that I would like to discuss would be, what goes into making, what goes into making of the data analytics Okay, now in the story of data analytics, you all know what we are supposed to do. The fundamental thing is about all the data. Now, where is all the data stored? Data warehouse. So, data warehouse is a place. Data warehouse is a place where all the data is stored. It's called the central repository. Now, even in the concept of ERP, we use what is called as a data warehouse. The patterns of data or rather you can say the patterns that are involved in this data warehouse or understanding, understanding the patterns and trends and extracting the data. then it is called as data mining okay like how you mine out coal and gold data mining also becomes a very important factor because it's not something that you can normally or easily do you have to understand what sort of data to be used and whenever we talk about data analytics there are two types of data analytics how many two types what are the two types can anybody tell me i'll write it for you but still i want you guys to tell it's called EDA and CDA. Anybody giving me the full forms? 
the two types of data analytics that go by EDA and CDA. Quick, I would want to see that. Kiran, you're right. Quantitative, qualitative data analytics are there, but yeah, that's about if you're dealing with numbers. Okay, Kiran, that's a good point. I can write that for you here, wherein we even call it as quantitative, wherein you deal with numbers. Obviously, number analysis, like what cricket scores and other things, and you know, all of that. Mostly quantitative in numbers. Which area is better? Uh, which geographical location is better, comparison of one place to the other, if you do such things, or comparison of people, which is an absurd idea, but sometimes, you know, like, uh, when they do this political campaigns, or for businesses to businesses, where they do, they'll compare even those qualitative aspects, those two are there, quantitative and qualitative, but I was not asking that, come on, I don't even see one answer, yeah, Rajeshwari, very good, very good, Shruti, very good, so those points here, EDA stands for Exploratory Data Analytics and CDA stands for Confirmatory Data Analytics. Okay. Exploratory Data Analytics and Confirmatory Data Analytics in the name only they are there. EDA is more about delving into data which is more about doing data mining because you have to go there and explore about what it is and how it is. Okay. But when it comes to confirmatory data analytics, already a theory is well established. Already a theory is well established. You are using this data to prove that. So when you are willing to prove something, so if you want to prove something right or wrong, okay, if you want to prove something right or wrong, then that will be called as a CDA. But normally, when you want to find some data, there is lot of data, from that you want to find something that is useful to you that is called as exploratory data analytics okay so this is all the fundamental about data analytics the whole story data analytics means what what is a data warehouse what are the two types of data analytics and also i would want to tell you one more concept called as etl and why does etl become important is because of the eight steps that we generally do in data analytics okay we will see that Oh, yeah, very good. A lot of people have told the answers. Good, good, good. Uh, yeah. Ramya, that's right. Sindhu, Jyoti. Good, good, good. What is MIS? Are, what is MIS? Management Information System, which is a reporting mechanism. What is MIS? How are you asking that now? It's a revision session, not a class. Uh, come on. Yeah, very good. All of you said... Vamshi, what, what is discretionary? Why did you get to that? I mean like, did you have a reason behind typing that or? I don't know. Because I asked you what is EDA and CDA, right? So why did you type discretionary? I'm not sure, but I hope you got the point. Yes, Rajeshwari, that's right. Kiran, right. Very good. Vamshi, that's right. Extract, transform and load. Uh, okay, somebody is also given the right answer here. EDA is more of a detective work. Detective work, no? Yeah, very good. You can say it's exploring. So you can go find whatever you want. You have all the time and patience. In confirmatory data analytics, already the story is clear that somebody has established something. You want to prove that right or wrong, then you can go for that. But to prove that or do that EDA or CDA, you need something called as ETL, which stands for extract, extract, transform, extract transform and load very simple concept what do you do is gather information from multiple places you extract you extract information from multiple places gather it that's called extract now when you extract or gather information from multiple places they won't be uniform correct some will have some will be in different format some will be in some other format one fellow will use date in one more format another fellow will use in something so that's uh, you know a pretty critical aspect but when you don't want things to be like that you will uniformly transform them and then load it back into the data warehouse extract it from multiple places okay 
extracted from multiple places cleansing cleansing means a cleaning exercise a little bit of transformation and then load it back into the uh, data system so that you know it's totally cool that you can start doing the work etl stands for what extract transform and load very important concept sir why did you discuss etl because i also want to discuss one very very important topic in data analytics it is called as inside data analytics how data analytics works or what does data analytics have to do so this is an eight step process now if you uh, look back your book no it will have a full length of paragraph so let's split these into eight points and uh, it will be very easy for you to understand what the eight points are whenever you want to do these points you can always comfortably do that so eda cda etl all these are clear now let's talk about what happens inside the data analytics so let's start with the very first point uh, the very first point in data analytics is data collection this entire process of data analytics starts with data collection now as i just told you whenever we talk about data collection we don't collect it from one place we collect it from multiple places okay so we'll say data collection integration so data collection and integration will happen and uh, then you will prepare the data so the first step is from whatever analysis for whatever analysis you want to do gather all the data in whichever source it's available is it good or bad or is it something to do with it all that we will see later first to gather off okay now once you gather all this data it may not be in the right format so step number 2 there is no doubt as you data collection and integration done second step bringing into common format bring into common format right this is a very important exercise so collect the data bring them into a common uh, what do you say format so that you know all those uh, additional activities that you want to do can be done smoothly otherwise if multiple data are in different ways then uh, you will only sit and cry later are hey, sir this is not useful that is not useful and all that and now step number 3 which is again very simple you brought them into common format and then you started comparing everything sometimes you know some irrelevant data will be there some repetitive data will be there remove all that that is called as fix data quality problems what is it called fix data quality problems collect the data and integrate them turn it into a common format fix all the data quality problems so that you are ready to use the data now before you do anything that is you have to cross check whether this data is workable or not you have to fix the data quality problem by doing something called as data cleansing i told you know like how we clean the vegetables when we uh, bring in and before cooking same way before you start working on the data we just uh, you know make sure that it's all proper data is consistent all errors and all that are eliminated because once you do this and it's all ready then you can apply whatever you want to apply okay so fix data quality problems and errors and duplications are eliminated errors and duplications are eliminated now uh, this is where the data is ready for data analytics but one thing that you need to understand is immediately you will not apply an analytical model like who are those people who are aged about 25 and who are earning more than 1 lakh you want to find out this from a data so immediately you will not apply that criteria on the entire data so what you will do is you will develop an analytical model okay because scientists data scientists are there those people will use what is called as a predictive modeling tool and they will develop an analytical model so once errors and duplications are eliminated develop an analytical model develop an analytical model 
because what analysis you want to do depending on that only you have to develop this develop an analytical model apply the analytical model on partial data not on full data on partial data and then cross check the results whether it's okay for you and you know this part of applying it on partial data this is called as training not a full length application is just called training so that you can apply it on then what will you do you will see the results what exactly are the results and how it is whether it is workable or not if you are happy with it then apply it on the full data apply on complete data apply on complete data and then last step will be provide results provide the results of data analytics to whom to decision makers to decision makers so this is exactly what happens in data analytics very easy to talk than to you know do it because it's a very uh, long exercise it's not going to get over just like that in no time so it's going to take some time you have to gather the data from various places okay you have to put them to uh, you know use also in such a way that it's helpful for everybody and it's not just cheaply written off so get the data put them in a common format fix all the data quality problems cleanse them and then uh, make sure that you know you fix all the duplicate entries and all that now data is ready so if one side once data is ready then develop an analytical model which you want to apply so many analytical models can be developed and apply this once you apply the model on to uh, this you will get some results and if the entire results go wrong you have to cry so which is why you don't apply it on full data first take partial data apply the model check the results and once you are happy you can comfortably go ahead with uh, applying it on the full area and then you can check the results okay so that is the last but one topic of this chapter and the last topic of this chapter is talking about something called as xbrl which i think you guys should be able to do it so i will give you just a quick insight here that's all just a couple of minutes xbrl stands for what extensible business reporting language extensible business reporting language meanwhile if you have any exclusive doubts on xbrl you can already start typing them in the comments so that i will answer those otherwise i'm just going to give you a brief insight of xbrl okay it's a extensible business reporting language and what xbrl will help you do is convert whatever we have regularly into a xbrl format now xbrl is about digitizing documents it's in digital form okay so when you are having the documents which are maintained in digital form they can be exchanged across the world now xbrl is a group it's a consortium and almost already 60 plus countries have adopted it more than a few thousand organizations are following xbrl and xbrl brings uniformity so if the financial statements let's say in india we have financial statements prepared in the indian gap okay we have prepared the financial statements in indian gap now somebody from outside wants to review this and they are not able to or understand well versed with indian gap so you convert the indian gap financial statements into xbrl using what is called as taxonomy now taxonomy is nothing but a dictionary of all terms like whatever terms are used in indian gap equivalently what are they called in xbrl a list of all those words that is what is called taxonomy so for the right word or right item in the indian gap the xbrl content is tagged so this process of using taxonomy and doing this is called as xbrl tagging what is it called xbrl tagging which is a process of linking the regular content into the xbrl content and from xbrl content if they want to convert into local gap they can also do that whoever is using xbrl the best part about xbrl right from regulators like rbi sebi 
okay income tax department lot of people they trust investors so regulators investors the management themselves okay research analyst like this there are a lot of people who are the audience for xbrl document so basically in today's digitized world millions of documents are created and exchanged and we want authenticity in those documents to maintain that only we are using an xbrl which is a business reporting language and business reporting as i told you some time back is always useful for making business decisions okay uh that's it that is what we have in this particular chapter and if you seriously have to look at this chapter in terms of what were the changes you don't have uh, anything much there is a little bit of insight on data warehouse yeah that's all so but for that there are no amendments or additions in this chapter now in the description of this video in the description of this video uh, you will find a link to the amendments video please go on to the amendments video once and in the description of the amendments video you will find the material so if you just want to scroll through what are all the amendments all that is compiled and put in one place so those of you who are uh, new to the story and who haven't seen the amendments you can do that i think it's very much part of your uh, you know uh, description section so even part 1 that is chapter 1 whoever missed it i have given that also in the description preparation strategy of what you are supposed to do or in that presentation also how to catch up in the exam i have given all that so you might want to even kind of try and do that so before i go here yeah i will want to do that as usual so what we have started with discussing in this particular chapter is the story of master and non master data right we spoke about this okay we spoke lot so i'm going there yeah master and non master data then we spoke about front end and back end systems installed application versus web applications a cloud based and then systems being categorized into non integrated and integrated systems integrated systems paved way for discussion on erp and uh, when we spoke about erp we spoke about it in full length we also discussed about why front end back end and these two systems and this is where installed and now erp is full story what is it the benefits the 11 modules and the crm module and its advantages we also orally had a discussion though i didn't write it here we orally had a clear discussion on the key integration points and then the whole story on risk and controls is what we have revised completely for each of this which turns out to be an issue there is always an aspect that will help you to bring down that risk so we can parallelly read the control when you are revising it once again and then coming in the miscellaneous topics the first one is an mis or a management information system report which is used to uh, provide information to the management and how frequently will you provide this information to management what will you do with this all of that is the choice of the organization but what information will you put inside that will be termed as structured timely accurate and relevant if the information is not making sense like that then is useless then data analytics what is data analytics the definition and the data mining definition data warehouse definition as to where and what it is and uh, two types of data analytics quantitative and qualitative no doubt but we have the two breakdown eda and cda also the concept of etl then the elaborate discussion on what happens inside the data analytics and a quick overview of what we called as the xbrl so that is what we have discussed today a full length discussion on what we could do uh, for taking this forward now the third chapter is a slightly lengthier one we have a lot to cover there in the third chapter of course yeah there is one more important question in this chapter that i don't know how i missed thanks for pointing out durga prasad uh, role based access controls yeah please do make sure that you go through that role based access controls that will be right after uh, erp and there's a slight uh, uh, you know insight about how you will give powers yeah or oh, whoever asked me what is the amendment in this chapter uh, yeah there is a small addition in the paragraph of rbac 
that is role based access controls two types of role based access controls are given oh yeah thanks for pointing out good 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 very good so the two types of role based access control that you see are mac that is mandatory access controls let me write that for you mandatory that means you have to give those access controls to somebody to fill their job role and then the next one is called dac which is pretty discretionary which means based on your job role we will decide whether you want to give it or not so yeah role based access control everybody in the organization has to be given powers exclusively based on their role and not more than that i hope you know that concept based on the name itself role based access control and uh, whenever you talk about the word access what are the types of access that are given to people create alter view and print these are the four types of access that are given to people in the organization based on their roles and now there is an extra discussion under that heading of role based what is a mandatory access control if it is not given then i will not be able to do my work so compulsorily have to give me mandatory access control and discretionary is something that i get based on choice you know like if if i want to get it i will get it otherwise i may not get it okay yeah thanks for pointing out i don't know how i missed this one but yeah that's a very interesting thing yes create alter view and print very good so that's it from my side for today guys i think again it's close to 2 hours a long session uh, 1 hour 45 minutes i hope they were insightful and uh, what i suggest is see being part of a revision session you will gain an understanding of what all are there in the chapter and a full length revision at your convenience and ease has to be done otherwise again it will prove to be a problem for you okay so please make sure that you put in those efforts and i will see you very soon in our next live session thank you good night Good evening guys It's there it's there it will come wait a second i told you no like the previous session it just happens in the beginning so let us give a minute or two to sink in i hope everybody is doing good and let us give a minute for people to catch up with this quickly and then we'll proceed off with one of the most elaborate chapters in your eas syllabus chapter 3 so there is a slighter task for you to do tonight let us try and understand all parts of uh, chapter 3 actually it's easy just that you need to you know kind of make sure that you have the right pattern to understand it yes it is audible now because i unmuted it so happens you know okay let's go ahead with uh, the broad idea in chapter 3 i think we should start off so the ones who join can catch up there's nothing much that is going to be discussed in the uh, opening slot so we will quickly have an idea as to what is there in chapter 3 and once again to all of those who wished good evening little later yeah good evening to all of you i was telling when it was on mute so so let's move on here very simple chapter 
let's start with what are the contents so if you broadly look at this topic as information system information system concepts right so when we say that we have three branches to cover we have how many three branches to cover information system components information system components then information system controls the relevant controls and what is that you are supposed to do there we have, have to have an understanding on that and then information system audit so the concepts which talk about audit trial what exactly is a log then some techniques that we use to do the continuous audit that could possibly be an exam question which one the five techniques that are used for doing some continuous audit so all those are something that very important so now we have to start with what is called as information system components and i would expect you to be with me in this story if there are any aspects that are extra that you don't know you would probably get to know but i think all of you know the very basic structure of an information system component before which we will quickly have an insight to these two words what is information so an organized form of data data basically has no context when somebody gives a context to data and arranges it that's when data becomes information so normally when we talk about information it is something useful to the recipient based on which he will be able to make decisions that is our idea about the information when it comes to system so if you are trying a definition for information it's an organized form of data organized form of data i mean using which you can make decisions so that is what is the story useful for decision making useful for decision making now apart from this we have the word system now this is not something new to us because we have already seen the word system so many times but once again here when multiple components come together where many components come together so we will say set of interrelated set of interrelated components working together okay set of interrelated components working together for what to achieve a common purpose or a goal so that is what is called as a system now when you bring into of these things like you have data which is in the raw form which has no context to give it a context we are using systems and together is what we call as information system or is and in short it is nothing but the use of computers okay so you know this is a very important point that one has to understand that information system has a much broader definition than what you just call it as you know simply sometimes when we need relevance we will just pick it up and say is or it so information technology is a subject area or a domain where information systems are those set of components that are used to work together and make some data into information make it useful for decision making so all of that information story and our subject name also goes with enterprise information systems so we are more interested in those information systems that are being used to provide that are being used to provide 
some kind of processing activity for an entity. Now use of information systems, the concept of BPA from their evolution and using softwares like ERP, we have seen it all. So let's make it, uh, you know, an easy right. So the first part is information system components. I'd like to make a chart across which will cover almost everything in the information system components. So those of you who are sitting there without a pen and paper, I request you to pull out a pen and paper and make this chart along with me. And I, I hope many of you are doing this throughout the revision sessions, having a summary notes and all that. But if you think you've already made one chart, okay, good for you. You can sit back with it and cross check. But if you haven't done anything, then I believe you should be with me and uh, make those, not just see what's going on the screen, make those and be part of it so that, you know, we can make some best use of the session. Otherwise, simply looking at what I'm saying will be of not much of a use to you later. Today, you will be like, yeah, okay, I'm able to understand this, but not much of a use later. Okay. So then let's go on. Information system components, information system components, how many information system components are there, right? We have like six information system components starting with people. Okay, then we have hardware, then we have software which is further broken down into system software and application software. So that makes it two of those. Okay, it's system software. And then we have application software. Then the whole lot of discussion on data because you have hardware then it's of no use without people. So you have people and hardware what will they do sit and stare at each other. So you need software to add life to the hardware which software system software. So if there is an operating system or a system software along with hardware it makes it an extended machine makes it work. But what will it work? Nothing, it only provides the basic functions. If you want to do specific tasks, then you need application softwares. So you have people with hardware, system software, and then even application software. Then what will they work on? The most important thing that they have to work on will be data. So what is the concept of data, database, database management systems and the models in which data is arranged is also something that we have to look at. And till here, these five components are enough if you want to be a standalone or a stationary system. But the moment you want to connect to others and who doesn't want to connect to the internet, I think in one of these sessions, I did tell you uh, in the previous one, I guess, wherein if you give a system to a small kid also today without internet, they'll throw that on your face. So everybody wants to connect to the internet and use the application that are available. So another essential component of this whole story is network and communication okay network and communication so this is the broad breakup of what exactly it looks like in terms of all the information system components now definitely we will have to get deeper into this story now when i say get deeper into the story it's about understanding what all go into making all these that is also something that we have to understand okay so let us see that as to what this entire thing is useful for starting with people who are these people now there are four set of people for which you need to know what functions they are going to do let's start with the first set of functions here People generally will go with four functions called as run, program, run, program, manage, 
maintain run program manage and maintain are the four aspects that are covered by people now who will do what yeah though they are not part of your uh, you know book they have not given it so i'm just giving you this additional info note it down when you want to run a program or when somebody is running that program such people they are called as end users who are those end users now the ones who are programming it they are called programmers or technically called coders the ones who manage and maintain they are called as admin or administrators so that is the end of the story for people people are the most important resource so if you don't have the people who are working on these task then there is nothing that you can actually do so four functions run program manage and maintain the ones who run it end users the ones who program it called coders the ones who manage and maintain it they called as administrators the story goes much deeper when we start discussing actually you call a hardware as which is the most widely visible component in the information system story so hardware is what the tangible portion hardware is the tangible portion that you can touch see if you are irritated you can even break it okay so jokes apart tangible portion means what something that you can touch and see what is hardware keyboard is a hardware mouse is a hardware your monitor is a hardware inside the system we have so many processing aspects on the motherboard the processor is a hardware the memory that we have okay we have primary memory in the likes of ram some information stored by the manufacturer in the likes of rom then we have additional memory added up in the likes of hard disk so there is a whole lot of story that goes on with hardware let's look at the detailed break up of the story in hardware what are the constituents of a hardware input devices i don't think i have to explain you what goes into input devices and waste our time here i think all of you should be aware about what the input devices are keyboard mouse so starting with input devices keyboard mouse stylus webcam mic that i'm using all of these are what some sort of input devices keyboard will give you textual input mic will give you audio input uh, then you have uh, scanners which take image as the input okay so like the different forms of devices are there which take all the input story so this is one part of the hardware that we have on the other side we also have another part of the hardware called as output devices and that will be the last one we will get to that eventually for now all i am concerned is about processing devices because that's what is taking number 2 processing devices i think right from your schooling whenever you started learning about computers we started learning about processing being done by central processing unit or the cpu which consists of a control unit an arithmetical logical unit which does all the functions of addition subtraction multiplication division comparison and all that and then another important part of this processing is the memory unit and we are going to elaborately discuss about what that memory unit actually deals with okay so processing devices are those which are uh, you know the cpu which is considered to be the brain of the computer what is cpu considered as the brain of the computer so input devices processing devices which have all these wherein control unit talks about what can come in and what can go out into through and out of the computer what it does will be the control unit alu as it stands for the name arithmetic logic unit is a functional unit which takes care of all those mathematical functions that i told you and then comes the memory unit which have small processors which are in the name of registers anyway we are going to discuss about memory in detail and before which i also want to write here three which is output devices okay so output devices and then comes for memory 
do i want to stretch this memory into different parts of course yes because there are four branches in this story first of the memory is called as internal memory what is it called internal memory then we have primary memory or is also called as main memory then we have secondary memory and we have virtual memory what do we have we have virtual memory okay so going with the detailed breakup of this internal memory is further classified into registers now you must have heard of those small computing devices wherein which very small and very fast processing devices which are called as registers which are in 32 bit and 64 bit okay so those are registers which are used to store information and process them very small very fast okay then we have a memory which generally stores a copy of the frequently used main memory locations what is it it stores a copy of the frequently used main memory that is called as cache memory c a c h e but then it's pronounced as c a s h just like how you pronounce cache c a s h that's what it is pronounced don't use funny names like cache cache and all that okay cache memory so two of these are there and cache memory is an internal memory which stores a copy of the frequently used main memory location so if you want to uh, you know access something that you generally access then it need not go to the main memory to bring you that information a copy of that will be reflected very quickly because there are speed differences speed differences between registers and primary memory registers are very fast primary memory the ram will take some time to get the info from the main memory and process it i mean all of that is still in seconds but still to speed up we will store a trace of that in the cache memory then primary memory we have a couple of break up again here which is called as ram random access memory which is a volatile memory when you switch off the power whatever is running on ram will also close down so ram does not store any information it has a processing ability so all those aspects that are running on the system will be running on the ram which is exactly why when you bundle up ram with so many applications when you overburden it uh you're listening to songs on one side the background instagram is on whatsapp is on i hope all of you guys have experienced this with your phones you overtax your ram saying that you now i want to open this also that all 10 12 applications are open uh meanwhile you are doing multitasking you are going from here there hopping in at one point of time your smart device irrespective of how smart it is it will be like get lost what is the device way of saying get lost it will not do anything it will just stop just stop means in colloquial language if i have to tell you it's called hang what do you generally people use no my phone hang from where <laughs> hang is a very colloquial word to use there but basically what happened is your ram stands non responsive ram is like enough you are using me so much i am not going to respond to you anymore so it will stay still just like that that's only called hang in your language but but all of you are very intelligent enough to you know uh, tackle the situation of a hang what will you do you will immediately like a very intelligent person restart the phone correct and when you do that restart the phone everything that will be there uh, on the ram is all vanish that's it because ram is a volatile memory and phone will start afresh now you know some people do this in front of their uh, parents okay like some people boast you know so many people don't know what to do when these kind of situations occur so we like these people will go generally you know mother father or anybody elder who doesn't know how this works will panic hey nothing's working in my phone and this particular person goes there and takes the device and like an engineer who knows everything about the device he'll do a great thing he'll hold that power button for 10 seconds 
restart the entire device give it back to them and they'll start thinking that you know my son or daughter is next level they are all you did was to clear up whatever is there on that volatile memory and then they'll be like yeah see that day my phone was not working but my you know son or daughter solved it as if you opened the entire all you did was to wipe away everything that was there on ram this is sometimes you know some people go one step further they'll remove the battery and replace it and then close the device and switch it on everything will back to normal and then again they'll feel happy that they have repaired something okay point is very simple why is it happening like that because every time the processing happens only on the ram and ram is a volatile memory but in order to not let these situations happen very often because okay though it's funny for us to laugh on this it's not a cool situation right every now and then if your phone or the device keeps hanging then what will be the use of it see i want to use the phone no? so i want to kind of do something and then it getting stuck every now and then or i'm restarting this is not your regular business so what happens is when ram is over taxed or that means when ram is over pressurized then that is where the virtual memory kicks in i'll tell you that in a minute okay i hope everybody caught up what is ram random access memory is a volatile memory on which all the programs run so the higher the ability of the ram to process programs the more the number of programs can be run and the faster you will feel your devices and say no sir this phone is a new one this is much faster than that they are not in any running competition it's just that this device has a 2 gb ram the other one has an 8 gb ram obviously the other device can accommodate more work and when the ram space is higher now i see those people who are working in uh, animation or those of them who are doing all the vfx and all they even have systems with 32 gb ram they need that processing in fact that itself will sound very slow for them okay so those guys are using 32 and 64 gb rams like because their amount of processing is very high you know they develop these animations and all you know they go like a thousand frames or 1500 frames and then they do that motion picture which requires high processing ability we in our house we use like you know what 4 gb or 8 gb that itself is more than enough and what will we maximum do on a laptop or a desktop four or five aspects we open but now it is people are over taxing their phones a smartphone they don't use it like a phone they open multiple things or they open high end graphic oriented games now if you want to play a high end graphic oriented game your device also should capable of uh, supporting that if you put a 4 gb ram phone to you know over tax like that the life of that phone will come down why because every now and then you are doing this. sir hardware will become like that obviously you know so wear and tear what do you call it as the same device one year before when you purchased it was operating amazingly well after one year you are complaining device became slow no device won't become slow you started using it that way so the ram is over taxed and then there is lot of cash which generally many people don't clear so if you want anything to do with your device it's all there here and now there is some part of manufacturers information that is stored in these devices for mobiles and all it's the imei and the serial number for laptops the serial number and uh, all that content something that comes from the manufacturers end in fact uh, we end up using some high level languages like c c++ java python cobol fortran and all that computer understand 0 and 1 so we need something called as translators okay there are two types of translators called compilers and interpreters these are all preloaded by the manufacturer where in a memory area called rom which is only a read only memory so you turn on and turn off the device and all contents on the ram will not go anywhere but ram is not like that it's a volatile memory okay i know if you can see i will write it but otherwise you hear me clearly and make a note of it ram is volatile rom is non volatile okay then we have secondary storage devices pen drive flash drive cd dvd blu ray and then the external hard disks in much bigger sizes when compared to the ram because the storage in ram is not enough and ram can't store anything okay secondary storage is a storage area 
so you add all of these devices i think you know that part very well but now what i would want to also tell you here is uh, two points so listen to this example that i'm talking about carefully two points will get covered this is your secondary memory this is your secondary memory now a portion of this secondary memory is carved out okay a portion of this secondary memory is carved out sir carved out by whom carved out by our operating system just to tell you like if you are using a 500 gb hard disk okay let's say it's a 500 db hard disk do you think all 500 gb is available no you see only 468 gb available so even in the same 8 gb pen drive also 7.72 only will be available some part is not so what's happening with this the operating system carves out a portion of that and keeps it as a reserve now look at on the other side let's say this is the ram that you have and let's say this is a 4 gb ram okay now you open application number 1 you open application number 2 and you are working on it like you are playing songs in the background and two you are chatting on whatsapp or something like that suddenly somebody sent you a forward on instagram so you open that also okay then meanwhile you got some mail so you hop down to see that mail also okay and then again in this chat somebody sent you a youtube video a funny video or something like that so you wanted to see that immediately so keeping whatsapp in the background you open that also all i'm saying is five applications are parallelly already running and already because of the content that you are using i think a 4gb ram will still support many applications stick to the example don't start an argument now no sir i opened eight applications please stick to the point that i'm trying to make now let's say all of the 4 gb ram it's fully occupied but now what happened is the top priority application is this youtube video because you are watching that in the foreground i hope you guys know what is foreground and background what's happening on screen what you can see is the foreground in background some processing is always going on that's why when you want to close all the devices it will ask some programs are running in the background do you want to close them also did you see that guys did you guys have you see that ha uh, so what i'm saying is if you open the sixth application now ram is obviously going to tell you get lost and if forget about what is there on the left side just leave it just if this is the only ram and you now open the sixth application ram is going to be very irritated because it does not have place and you are fitting or accommodating one more which requires much more than the ram's ability so ram will automatically stop and say i can't process any more that is its way of saying hang get lost but that's not a good sight no so you know what the operating system does it will carve out a portion from the secondary memory and keep it for reserve purposes which is called as virtual memory what is it called it's called the virtual memory now the most important part of the whole story to conclude whenever ram whenever this ram runs low on space when ram runs low on space that is exactly when are you using whatsapp now no you are watching the video on youtube no this is the top priority okay Sixth one is again obviously now this will become top priority because you are opening that means what that is a top priority because you want to see that so the songs that are running in because song is parallelly going on that's in the background it's but when you open this YouTube video this would have been stopped WhatsApp is not immediately required now so two of these applications are of low priority while this now became the top priority now the operating system because it is intelligent. and operating system has a feature called as memory management whenever ram runs low on space such least priority applications which ones such least priority applications 
are immediately moved to this virtual memory to a place called as paging file. Okay, what is it called? The paging file. Now, the moment this task is executed and then immediately you type the multi window icon and then clicked on WhatsApp, immediately from the paging file, things will be back to RAM. So, when RAM runs low on space, push it from RAM to paging file. When RAM is empty and you need that becoming the priority app, bring it back. So, moving data to and from the paging file will free up the RAM and your devices will never hang. Okay. So, this ability is called virtual memory. Sir, it is stored in our system. Virtual means something that you can't see. So, this is an imaginary memory. Okay. So, I hope that's a complete clarity on this topic. Actually, I shouldn't have gone to this step, but I thought this is one point that everybody has to know because other topics I'm just taking you through. But this one, I want all of you to know. And meanwhile, you guys can throw up a confirmation about did you understand this whole story because it's worth it in trying to understand all this. Are you clear? So that brings us to the end of this side of the story with virtual memory also. So I hope you are clear with all this. So two parts to our story starting with people. Then we go with hardware. Now I'll take you through quickly with software that is system software and application software. Come on quick. But only after I see some confirmation on your so from in from your side. Okay. All right, very good. Good, good, good. Okay, so right then I am taking it forward by discussing system software and application software now. Now check this out on system software. How about a system software? System software is something that gives life to the entire hardware. So system software is also called as the operating system. What is it called? The operating system, which is in the likes of Windows, Linux, Unix, Mac, all those from the point of view of a laptop or a desktop, Android, iOS, okay, Windows on our smartphone devices. Back then, Blackberry was there where they used research and motion. Then you have some other operating systems like Tizen, Firefox and all that. But Android, iOS, very popular, right? So operating system basically does two activities. What is it? perform hardware functions so if the hardware has to work like the hardware so the operating system has to give that perform hardware functions and also provide a platform for application software so if an application software has to work then also it requires an operating system so what does any system software do so if somebody asks you that what does any system software do system software does a couple of things first one is that it performs or helps perform the operating system and then it also helps you provide a platform for application programs we'll say that as interface it acts as an interface for application programs okay and system software performs around eight functions you can go ahead and discuss what those eight functions are separately but all i'm saying is it does perform a set of eight functions performing hardware functions providing a user interface then hardware independence memory management, file management, task management and then it provides you with uh, logical security that operating system helps you put a security and then network okay so eight points are there or eight functions of an operating system I will 
discuss that in the next page here what are the eight functions of operating system this alone could be a question in the exam so please make sure that you know about this the eight functions one perform hardware functions so if the keyboard has to work like a keyboard okay or a mouse has to work like a mouse or a stylus is used to write whatever you do that's all facilitated by the operating system then user interface nowadays what user interface that we use is called as gui which stands for graphic user interface which stands for what graphic user interface back then in the past people used dos disk operating system 95 97 i think it was even before you were born that story where people used to type commands for everything open exit close everything will be command based so now it's not like that now it's graphic based touch or double click that story so that is the user interface which the operating system provides then for every system manufactured in the world one one operating system need not be written correct you have windows you can install windows on a dell laptop on a hp laptop or any other local device and you can as well do it even on any assembled machine also so basically if the one who is writing that software has to write it for each individual system so they are gone how will you write so for my laptop one operating system for your laptop one operating it's not like that so the best part of the operating system is it gives you hardware independence which means it will perform all the functions irrespective of it means it will perform all the functions irrespective of what sort of a hardware is being used then 4 5 6 3 points are about management it will manage certain things now only i taught you one thing that is called as memory management which is there here this entire task of what you see right now on screen this full thing it's called as memory management so our operating system only does that memory management then which task to execute first which task to execute next which task will take how long suddenly which task should be shut down to accommodate another task all this our operating system only will do with a feature called as task management so memory management task management and file management and you see some operating system like windows nicely you are able to store in folders inside that in folders neatly arranged and ordered who is helping you do that the operating system with a feature called as file management then logical security which means an operating system will help you put up user id and password for your system and operating system will also give you networking ability only then you can connect to the internet and thanks to the operating system you will be able to catch up with this so these are the eight functions of the operating system okay let us just put it up in slighter detail so that functions of the operating system so i hope you are clear with this part in detail so going back to our preliminaries what is this called as this is called as memory management wherein this entire story spoke about the concept of virtual memory so if somebody asks you about virtual memory now i think you will be better able to describe than what it was described before okay so these are all the points that you have to take into consideration while doing this yeah very good and i do see a lot of people answer all those in the comments that's appreciable very good okay yeah so that sums up the story of the third branch as well now moving on to the fourth branch which is called as application software which deals with which deals with specific user tasks what does it deal with application software deals with specific it fulfills specific user needs in the second chapter also we have a definition about application software an application software is something that fulfills specific user needs you use a media player to play songs and videos 
you use a photo editor to edit photos you use a video editor to edit videos so like that we use a lot of softwares to fulfill specific user tasks and specific user needs how many types of application softwares are there they're classified into a few starting with what is called as an application suit now normally this word suit means a bundle of applications brought together what is it a bundle of applications brought together that is only called as application suit ms office is the best example word excel powerpoint all of that brought together that's what is called a suit okay then the second one is called as an enterprise software what is it called enterprise software the best example for this is the erp i think we have already discussed a full lot in the previous session wherein we spoke about something like sap oracle an enterprise wide software which covers all of the activities in the organization with various modules that is what will be called as a enterprise software then the third one that we have under this is called as enterprise infrastructure software enterprise infrastructure something like an email system security software the cctv cameras and then the uh, antivirus softwares and something that lets you inside the door or a uh, pass through the door inside the <laughs> pass through the door i mean so all those softwares which take care of the infrastructure now you see some uh, huge buildings that are lit up with lights what do you think somebody will go and uh, put the switches on off and all like 100 floor building on and off somebody will be keep doing so they are all controlled from a central location it's all through a software so which is exactly what are called as infrastructure softwares then we have information worker software in information worker software which deals with uh, you know something like spreadsheets excel who are information workers people like us only uh, chartered accountants accountants so some people use spreadsheets some auditors use cat computer aided audit techniques they all come under information worker software then we have uh, media players they are called as content access softwares what are they called content access software that means if somebody wants to access any content they will use this called content access softwares and then then we have uh, another kind of a software which you guys are not used to called as educational softwares which are like examination test cds and other things or like in the likes of exams of cad gmat practice exams and all will be there through using a software wherein you can choose from multiple choice options and all that so educational software basically and then seventh one is all this movie editing those what movie editors use music directors in a movie use no creating an audio song uh, so development of media that is called a media development software there is a difference between fifth one and this one in fifth one we are just accessing the content which may be media but here this is media development so that will be called as a media development software so all of these are the various application softwares that are in use which will specifically satisfy all our user needs so this is something which is critical for you to understand from the perspective of the information system components okay so for the time being i'll just move off to the other side and then we will go ahead with data wherein in data there are lots of things to discuss in data but we'll keep our discussion short because you know we have too many things to discuss so i will take you through with all this okay i hope people are getting through this are you clear with all the four components that we have discussed till now keep your feedback going on yeah because that's something that tells me that you are there right are we clear with all these four components then we look at the last two data and uh, network and communication both are easy 
data has got a story to talk about there are so many aspects in data but i guess i take you through all of what is there like you said in the beginning wherein you agreed with me data has no context so that is what is called data but when all this data is piled up in one place all this data is piled up in one place it is called as database now database is that place where all of the data is pulled up and this database is called as repository so repository of all the information at one place okay yeah that's good guys thanks for confirming if it's clear i am happy okay then moving up next into the story is data database now we have a bigger version of this database which is called as the data warehouse what is it called as the data warehouse how about the data warehouse it's a much broader topic a series of databases together okay a series of databases together will form data marts i think i should explain you that again of this so a data warehouse is nothing but a repository of all information repository of all information okay wherein if you see this how did it get constructed uh, there is an important discussion with respect to data warehouse so for a minute i would want all of you to concentrate because that is also a part of this discussion okay wherein it talks about creating a data warehouse using two approaches one is called a bottom up approach a bottom up approach and the other one is called as a top down approach bottom up approach and top down approach so what are you doing in a bottom up approach is starting with database when you bring in multiple databases together then you form what is called as data mart and bunch of data marts together will create the data warehouse this is the story this is a top down, bottom up approach start and construct brick by brick in top down approach what you do is first you create the entire data warehouse from there you pick up bits and pieces and create data marts data mart number 1 data mart number 2 data mart number 3 i mean some sort of this and then you further break them down into the databases that we have so anything in either of these cases what we do and deal is what is kind of interesting to work down top down and bottom up approach okay so i wanted you to understand this top down and bottom up approach and i guess you are clear with respect to that for now okay data warehouse following these two approaches now when you have a data warehouse like this to access the data warehouse to access the data warehouse we again need something which is called as a dbms what do you need you need what is called as a dbms so let's go back to understand what do we need here there in this further breaks down the concept to dbms dbms is a software okay dbms is a software that helps you to access the content that is there inside the database it's a database management system because accordingly where the data is stored what is the data how to get that all these are taken care by the dbms okay so that is exactly what we deal with in dbms and using such a software we can go and you know pull the data and figure out what exactly it is and how we can use this data so this is the story behind uh, the use of dbms in data but the bigger question right now that comes down here is 
if this is all there inside the database for faster retrieval because the biggest question right now is the retrieval part so if you want retrievals to be right like if you don't want a lot of time to be wasted in retrieving the data i think i can tell you a simple example say for uh, thing here if you organize your bookshelf properly whenever you want a book you will not be roaming around here and there without finding it no generally what happens many times when we want that book at that time only we will not get you understand what i'm saying uh, only at that point of time we will not get it and we will simply waste all the time in searching had you properly organized no not only with books same thing happens with clothes also and that particular day you decided that you will wear something of that sort and on that day only you are not finding it happens and very quite often it's because of your habit of a lack of proper organization now i'm not saying that you know you should organize it all the time sometimes some people when they keep it disorganized still they will be able to find it point is how organized or disorganized you are uh, you should be able to retrieve when you want it now if this organized data also doesn't help you in retrieval then what is the point same way if you are very disorganized then you won't get timely data so both are ridiculous basically we need to organize the data in a particular form for which we have to go ahead and discuss what is called as so now database is further talking about something called as database models we will discuss that separately database leads us to a discussion of database models okay on what are those database models what is a database hierarchy so all that will be discussed further so let's move further to discuss that into a new space wherein we can discuss all this clearly with a little more detail it's actually very easy so whenever we are talking about the database story let's say database models database models first you need to know the breakup of the data hierarchy what is that each individual unit is called as a character that is a group of bits make a character group of characters make fields group of fields make records group of records together make files and group of files together make group of files together make a database you can even write this from top to bottom that is database will have files files have records records have uh, fields fields have characters right a combination of bits okay so this is something that is called as the data hierarchy you need to know that and database models are now stretched into four parts basically four models are there first of which is called as a hierarchical model what is it a hierarchical model wherein everything is maintained in a inverted tree pattern how is it maintained inverted tree pattern then the next model is called as a network model where interconnections are too much okay in network model we have a lot of connectivity in hierarchical it gives you one to one and one to many but in network model along with these two it also gives you many to one and many to many possibilities of relating and connecting the data but hierarchical is an inverted tree pattern you have a root record from there everything breaks up parent record child record i hope you guys are able to recollect all that now i think in a revision session i can only touch base the names we can't take an example and do it in detail then this chapter will never end that way okay so we have a root record 
parent records and child records and then everything is organized in a hierarchical form like an inverted tree pattern normally you have roots stem and then the branches same way here inverted roots on the top stem then break down into several branches but this entire story will look good this entire hierarchy story will look good till the time data is limited hey how many branches you will break down so when limited content is there this is good same way when you have multiple number of interconnections between data multiple number of interconnections between data which is like the network model there also have limited data is there okay if the quantum of data increases if the quantum of data increases then the possibility of the problem in that will be way too much okay it does not provide you a comfort it in fact does not give you a edge only it says no 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 so many things are interconnected and this will become mess instead of helping you search it easily this will even more complicate so which is exactly why you need to take a clear understanding of what these models should be used so when data is less you can try these model no problem okay wherein instead of a parent and child relation because you know parent will have children children related back to the parents in uh, network model you have owner records and member records so that members can be member of more than one owner records interconnections are many that is the idea and only thing is it just complicates the story with lot of interconnection so if you want to ease out that is you want to keep it simple with less data then you can go for a uh, network model but when you talk about something where you have huge data and that needs to be organized in a detailed manner then you should use what is called as a rdbms or a relational relational database model which is called as rdbms now in rdbms the key factor is everything is organized in the form of tables okay here the entire data is organized in the form of tables and a simple example can help you understand this wherein if content is organized in tables from one table to the other there is something called the relation okay so named columns are called as attributes and the set of values that content can take is called as domain so three names become important when we discuss about rdbms one is called the relation which is nothing but organization of rows and columns called the table then we have one more word which is important called as attributes every column will have a name right so such named columns are called as attributes and then we have domain which is nothing but the set of values which is the set of values that can be taken so relations attributes and domain are three names and then every table is identified what is this table belong to it is identified by a unique identifier okay it's identified by unique identifier called as primary key so every table will be identified by something called as a primary key and this primary key becomes an important factor for relations to be established okay so this is the story behind uh, the database models and one more database model which is also a relational database model but it is for complex data that is called as object oriented okay object oriented database model this is called as oodbms where in terms of object oriented database model you are one object i am one object the entire items in the world are all modeled as objects and then it is used for complex data what is it used for 
it is used for complex data like image audio and video all those are used here so for complex data like image audio and video all this data is used so these are the database model story of course it is a big story to discuss i don't think we can catch up on each point right now but i think i can uh, for all of you who are doing this as a revision i guess the point is sorted because i reminded you of all of those hierarchical and network models are used when the quantum of data is less because they are feasible at that point of time when data is more or when higher amount of data are there i think you should go with using what is called as uh, a relational database model where everything is organized in the form of uh, tables and then those tables are identified using a primary key now also what they have introduced is if you are using a primary key of another table to connect to something in your table okay there is something which is called as a foreign key foreign key is nothing but the primary key of some other table which is connected or used in your table that is what will be called as a foreign key so please give importance to that definition and if any of you want to learn this clearly you can go to the amendments video i have made a clear point on this so you can go there and check and the link is very much available in the description okay check that out and in fact those of you who are watching this for the first time if at all any of you are and missed revision sessions 1 and 2 of eis links are also there in the description of this video so you can again catch up with respect to that okay so i think we are too far outside the lines of the time that we have so we got to move to the last branch let me go back there where are we in the last branch so that is about network and communication can we fill something about network and communication of course what do you mean by network now if network is not there it's a collection of computers and other hardware what is this collection of computers collection of computers and other hardware that will enable you to communicate you don't need to be at one place okay i mean you can be at anywhere any point in the world and do it so there are some important classifications of the network two types of network what are those two types of networks connection oriented networks are connection oriented and the second type is called connection less networks connection less networks so if there is a predetermined route that is the way it has to travel already that's called a connection oriented that means it already has a path and you can go with it clearly but when you have that path being determined at every step that path is being determined at every step of the communication then it is called as Communi uh, connection less networks and at every time where it reaches a destination it will find itself there so this is the story of the entire information system chart you can basically try uh, you know memorizing this with a greater perspective of your understanding so that you can make things easy for you so we have some names or words that you have to remember when it comes to the network topic wherein you have some topics like routing bandwidth resilience contention some words or some basic issues on networks and then a small topic is there on what are the benefits of network a four point or five point answer just go through that what is that it will uh, help you share the resources time saving it will increase the computing abilities and communication of the users can be done so four five points are there like that you can cross check on that okay so please make sure that you run down all those aspects in greater detail right now those of you want to take screenshots of all of those topics that we discussed we can do so okay first up is information system controls this entire chart then the second one that we have is the story of the virtual memory 
okay this is the story of virtual memory then all the functions of the operating system along with the concept of the data warehouse with both the approaches bottom up and top down approaches that we have discussed then the database hierarchy data hierarchy which is characters then into fields then into records files and then the entire database meanwhile the database models are four that is hierarchical network relational database and of course object oriented database so this and then we will now move on to the quick breakup of the controls all right so that's close to 1 or 10 minutes into the session that's our very first part of this very elaborate chapter called the information systems let me get back on screen and i would be happy to see your confirmations on where we stand here that will be good if i can get a positive frame of confirmation from you guys okay all right then there we go let me also see clear that's good yeah that's about one hour in that topic it takes so much time to just revise so imagine if that is the first time that you are learning takes a lot of time it's a very very elaborate chapter and that's very good kiran ramya shruti shreya jay kumar oh yeah i think you yes. all of you perfect that just makes uh, you know our life more easy in terms of making it a quicker summary now let's move on to the control story i think i can take you through this as a branch out of all those stories controls again are a very interesting and easy one so if you want to dwell down or break up information system controls information system controls now in this topic of information system controls we have three controls controls based on their objective controls based on their objective controls based on the nature of information system resources nature of is resources and control based on audit so this is how we have a break up of information system controls i think the first part is easy for all of you because you guys have discussed this so many number of times controls classifying based on their objective when you want a control to stop something even before it happens it's called a preventive control it's called a preventive control then at least immediately find out what happened that is called as a detective control detective and do what without doing anything why will you detect something so detective is always going hand in hand with corrective controls preventive detective corrective and if none of this is there at least some control should be there to take care of any of these compensatory controls like residual control that we set up preventive trying to stop something even before happening is called a preventive control detective control is where you want the control to find out what went wrong immediately or at the earliest of when it went wrong corrective controls are those controls where you would like to take some action there and compensatory controls are those where if any of these above controls are missing you got to set up an alternate mechanism to try and bring down the impact and that is what is called as a compensatory control moving up from here is based on the nature of information system resources we have a break up in three which are called as physical controls we have environmental controls physical environmental controls 
एंड देन वी हैव लॉजिकल एक्सेस कंट्रोल्स फिजिकल एक्सेस कंट्रोल्स एनवायरमेंटल कंट्रोल्स एंड लॉजिकल कंट्रोल्स अंडर फिजिकल कंट्रोल्स वी हैव लॉक्स ऑन डोर्स वेर इन द मेनी टाइप्स ऑफ लॉक्स और डिस्कस्ड थ्री टाइप्स ऑफ लॉक्स इलेक्ट्रॉनिक डोर लॉक द बोल्टिंग डोर लॉक बायोमेट्रिक डोर लॉक्स एंड ऑल दैट लॉक्स ऑन डोर्स देन द नेक्स्ट वन इज कॉल्ड फिजिकल आइडेंटिफिकेशन मीडियम विच आर अबाउट यूजिंग पिन पासवर्ड्स आई डी कार्ड एंड स्टफ लाइक दैट फिजिकल आइडेंटिफिकेशन मीडियम then logging logging means maintaining a chronological record what is logging logging is about a i mean logging is maintaining chronological record of various aspects you can do manual logging you can as well do electronic logging and then the last one is others wherein you have all the other ones security guards guard dogs cctv cameras dead man doors perimeter fencing and the likes of all of that physical controls to save unauthorized people i mean to save guard from unauthorized people entering your premises that is the story with respect to physical controls now environmental controls for which you have to know four environmental dangers are there first one is fire and against fire we have controls of fire safety i am not listing down all of them having fireproof material fire extinguishers water sprinklers using gases like halon in place where you can't use water because if it's a record room and it's under fire and then you start spraying water the records will not get damaged by fire but eventually they'll get damaged by water what is the point so we use gases to compress such fires called halon gas which will eat up the oxygen in the air and immediately uh, you know suppress the fire so fire is the first environmental danger then we have water floods tornadoes torrential rains all these are again you know something that can disrupt your entire data system so water proper drain systems and uh, proper sealing fire uh, sorry what is that waterproof walls from leakage all the rest to be make sure to mention then the next one is called as surge protectors oh sorry the the thing is called power spikes i'm sorry surge protectors are used to stop power spikes now power spikes is the third environmental danger suddenly too much power coming in or suddenly low voltage both of these can induce a damage okay so fire water then we have power spikes and then we have others which are in the likes of pollution okay and then we also have eating smoking or drinking eating smoking or drinking this is again so all this what i wrote down here are not environmental controls these are environmental dangers please be clear about that these are environmental dangers and for respective dangers we have controls for fire we have fire extinguishers and all that i told you water all those power spikes we can use something like surge protectors that means when power goes high or low the surge protectors will control that we can use stabilizers we can also use alternate power switching systems and we can use our ups devices uninterrupted power supply then coming to the most important category logical access security now logical access security will have a greater break up so i will come down to logical access security in a minute and the third one that we have in the set of controls or controls based on audit where you have managerial controls and application controls managerial controls and application controls so right now we can go ahead discussing what constitutes to logical controls now when we talk about logical controls first we got to talk about the dangers and then we got to talk about who are the ones who can create this and then the control so logical story goes with three branches okay how many 
three branches first of which is called as exposures what are the logical exposures if you see that we have two exposures what are those i hope you remember all these worms trojans they are called as technical exposures so basically technical exposures i am not listing them down but i am saying seven of them are there okay data diddling worms trojans okay rounding down salami technique all of those are called technical exposures the other set of aspects are called as asynchronous attacks what are they called as asynchronous attacks and four of them are there okay so these are the two exposures technical exposures and asynchronous attacks now there is a high possibility that any of this can also be asked as a question in the exam so yeah technical exposure in asynchronous attacks you have to take care and uh, in asynchronous attacks you have data leakage wire tapping piggy backing all of those are there in that so to make sure that you know you are not a victim of all these ah huh? what are those data diddling bombs trojan horse worms rounding down salami techniques and then trap doors all of these are some sort of malicious programs data leakage wire tapping piggy backing subversive attacks all those four are part of asynchronous attacks now please don't expect me to write everything on screen i hope you are clear with that and uh, you should be clear with respect to that because uh, that's what we can do then the second branch that is important here is who can do this okay those people they are called as perpetrators okay perpetrators now if you know who are these perpetrators we should then go ahead and set up controls no controls be discussed next who are the perpetrators hackers okay organized criminals people who want to do this those people can also do hackers organized criminals then we have competitors our own employees all these people are called perpetrators perpetrators are those people who can indulge in this wrong doing and then i'll say etc because any of them who have a malicious intention can go ahead and do this so this gives you the story of what is called as logical access exposures and perpetrators got it and of course the break up of controls are there now logical access controls are broken down into seven aspects i think i can take you through the headings of all those seven so that you are clear with respect to that let me just take you through all of those points and what is it all about it's a very simple logical access violators you are clear because these guys only indulge in all this nonsense okay so now we discuss what is called as logical access controls sir if i want to control what should i do yeah logical access first of which is called as user access management user access management and then second one user registration these two are very important who is the user what is he doing what should he do in fact what all are the aspects that user will concentrate when they do this all of uh, these points are taken care then we have network access because perpetrators can come from outside right so and we don't want them to come and do some damage so network access control in fact we have to secure all our gates whichever are open okay first danger is our user 
Some people are so intelligent that they will write their user ID and password and paste it on their desk. Huh. Such intelligent people you will find. So whoever is a user, is he using a proper user ID and password? Are they hidden from others? Are they being changed from time to time? All these points are taken care. Then network access controls. Who can connect to our network? That becomes a very important point. Then what are the, if somebody breaches the network gate also, where will they come in? They will come into what is called as operating system. So you now set up operating system controls because if they take care of your operating system, then uh, they will again disrupt your entire operations. The fifth set of controls, if they break the operating system also, then application system controls. Because of the application software, their application system controls. Understood? So first you have to safeguard your user. Because he is the one who is a big danger there. Then after that, take care of the network, take care of the operating system, take care of the application system. And if you are through with this, then the sixth one here will be mobile computing. A small aspect for logical controls. Mobile computing, that's because if there is anything that goes wrong from a wireless handheld device, that also should be taken care of. So that is why we are talking about mobile computing. So this brings us to the end of all the three controls based on what? The nature of IS resources. So let me go one step back to give you a full view when I say discuss next. I think actually we can fit in those six here, but I don't want to do that and, you know, make the screen look clumsy. So now, I guess for a minute I can vanish so that you guys can take a screenshot if you want to do so. The information system controls and their detail breakup. Now, managerial controls have seven and application controls have again a few. So that also I will tell discussed next so which is what we are going to take up here again so now we discuss logical access so I'm going to put a heading for managerial controls now these managerial controls no they are established by the top management and their involvement is required this is only more of a categorization aspect okay so managerial controls can be preventive controls, managerial controls can be detective controls, managerial controls can be uh, corrective controls, anything. And managerial controls can be physical, logical or environmental also. So managerial controls are set up in such a way that they are from the whole organization's point of view. Okay, what all will come under managerial controls, the first of which will be Top management controls. Top management controls are nothing but four aspects which you know planning, organizing, staffing and controlling. Okay. So those are called as top management controls. And why do we need top management controls? Because they, they are the ones who really take the organization forward. So if required you can write them also. Planning organizing planning organizing leading or directing as we call it and when you go wrong taking corrective action is called control the second set of controls here the second and third point no they are totally technical controls which are related to an aspect called as system development life cycle now, those of you who have never heard of this concept called system development life cycle is going to be a little difficult for you to understand those controls. So, what I suggest you is to keep it very simple. Understand how a software development life cycle works. There are actually seven stages. Okay, in the detail we have around seven stages. So, what are those seven stages in system development and how it works are all some points that we have to take into consideration. So, second one is system development management controls system development management controls and one of the stage in system development only is called 
प्रोग्रामिंग मैनेजमेंट प्रोग्रामिंग इज ऑल अबाउट कोडिंग सो वाइल कोडिंग वॉट आर दैट वन हेज टू टेक केयर बिकॉज वाइल कोडिंग इफ समिंग गोज रॉन्ग the entire functioning of the system will go wrong so system development has stages like preliminary investigation then system requirement analysis system design system development system testing system maintenance so that's a totally technical concept and the point that you are supposed to bother is in that entire technical concept there is an internal auditor who will participate so the system development management controls are further broken down for each stage somebody is set up and in programming if you don't want any mistakes to happen for that also controls have been set up the fourth one as far as remember is data management controls now data management controls are required because you don't want to lose data and this sort of controls will talk about backup uh, data management controls are talking about all the backup and if something goes wrong what are we supposed to do and in case there is no proper backup how will you need to uh, you know make sure that data loss does not happen cia the confidentiality integrity and availability aspects they are also supposed to be maintained okay then uh, control number 5 is quality management controls quality management controls here this is about establishing a quality standard versus what you achieved a comparison of that and then the sixth one is called as security management controls which talk about all the physical environmental and logical controls here again security management controls and then operations management which is about day to day operations management or operationally management controls so under each of these again sub controls are there you might want to give a reading and a friendly suggestion at this point of time is if you haven't done these two topics of managerial and application controls and if you believe that it's too much for you to handle right now then don't touch them a maximum exposure of 4 to 6 marks okay if at all a question comes but if it, a question doesn't come from managerial application control then you are anyway lucky enough because this chapter is so wide so be very well prepared with all the components because most likely questions can come from there plus all the controls except for these two preventive detective corrective compensatory physical environmental logical to the extent possible be clear till there managerial controls also not very difficult if you give a reading you might understand and if at all you don't know this will be the piece which can trouble you so selectively you can read there and if you don't want to complicate your brain and take a little bit of ease i generally not ask people to leave anything if you can understand and read it because you should have done all that well before but overnight trying to understand these sort of concepts are difficult and application controls no doubt will be a challenge for you to understand just like that in one reading but anyway for those who already know it i have to sum up so application control start with not allowing any unauthorized users to use this application so we need to establish what is called as a boundary controls followed by input controls then followed by communication controls for secure your boundary then make sure input is given by the authorized person then make sure whatever network activity happens that is safe communication controls boundary input communication then processing controls processing controls of course after processing we have two aspects that is uh, output and data for a second let me vanish so that we can fill that with ease yeah right there so boundary input communicating processing and then we have uh, database controls wherein you talk about storage of content and then we have output controls then we have output controls so that's the frame that you should be looking for managerial controls and application controls clear 
So please throw up a confirmation because that brings us to the end of the second branch of this entire discussion for information system controls. Now I would like to just give you an intro and take you through to the five information system audit tools because that is another important question that can pop up and with that we will kind of uh, end the story so let me get back on screen i hope you guys have uh, noted this down or taken a cue of it now we will move on to the next part so there are some information system information system audit and when you want to do an information system audit you are supported by some continuous audit tools meanwhile let me take a quick look at your comment section and what is going on oh yeah many of you have ran away uh, that's also there because you know when you don't know some concepts what's the point in being there to revise okay that happens no problem yes oh but some of you have also been typing along with me good 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 yes sindhu that's right hackers end users employees so that must be all the perpetrators that you were typing then we speak about batch controls and all that yeah they're part of all that input controls and all that okay those of you who know it please make sure that you revise it and any of you who want to uh, have a breakup of that you can scroll again go to the instagram feed of my page and scroll it there i have summarized those also in detail okay you can do that oh good a few of you have also are saying clear which means you are there with me in the revision that's nice and uh, yeah one and a half hours into revision i think we have covered substantial part of this chapter you know when i started i was not really confident whether we could do so much but i think constantly 50 plus people were there throughout it's always i mean not the number of people but it's about the interest that people show in uh, staying along and being there so let's also wind it up on a high note then with one question that can come from information system audit is the concurrent audit tools wherein we have five tools the first one called as snapshot now snapshots are embedded audit tools i don't want to write the entire content and waste time because it's already there in your book what is a snapshot so listen to me carefully this is an oral discussion that we are going to have and let's talk about what it is snapshots okay meanwhile i see somebody commenting old syllabus and earlier also somebody asked me in the beginning of the session for old syllabus kiran old syllabus videos are there ma already from so many days they are available on this channel in the playlist so please go and check two parts of full it revision all five chapters are there please do check them and then we will do one live session on discussing all the doubts involved and answering cases and other things for it i told all the old syllabus students to join in there okay and now moving on snapshots what are snapshots so let's have a last few minutes of interactive session come on and i want people to participate snapshots they also have another name called as extended records snapshots are called extended records wherein these are embedded audit tools snapshots are embedded audit tools come on come on i want to see that okay Oh, why do I not see some answers or snapshots? Do you remember snapshots are those tools which are embedded into the system that is the application system, wherein they are placed at strategic locations. They capture the flow of entire transaction, right? What do snapshots do? They capture the flow. They capture the entire flow of the transaction. now what will the auditor do 
he will go and review the snapshot file wherein all these snapshots are stored they will review that okay so that is what is called as snapshot then the second audit tool is called as itf integrated test facility now what you will do in integrated test facility you know is about the integrated test facility you will test some content you will prepare some test content and you will already have predetermined answers now you will try this on the system either you will do it directly in the system or you will use as a dummy entity a dummy entity is created and tested dummy entity is created and tested there you can either do that or you can post this itf entries in the main system but you should make sure that the effect of these itfs are to be removed otherwise main system data will again go wrong so this is a technique whereby see just like i want to see whether an accounting system is working properly or not so i will post some entries and see whether everything is getting posted in the right place or not and whether everything is finally coming to the balance sheet pnl properly or not once i am confident of the flow then i have to go and delete all the entries no or you do one thing don't disturb the main system do it in a dummy entity that is a create another version of the same test it there if the results match with your predetermined results then it just means that the entire system is working properly if not then you have to make those changes then the third audit tool is called as system control audit review file or scarf okay now scarf is nothing but snapshot that means it will capture the entire flow of the transaction plus other data collection also it will do so if something does the picture of the entire flow of data and other data collection then that is called a system control audit review file which is a very interesting software wherein which is the uh, costliest one also and very informative one also it will take the entire flow of the transaction and see what all should be captured who did it when they did it what time they did it whether the posting was right any alterations have happened with so what will auditor do come and review this scarf file and see what all are the aspects that took place okay then let's move on to the fourth continuous audit tool which is called as continuous and intermittent simulation cis now how our cis works is in two ways there is a transaction that has to be posted in the main system and then the same transaction gets processed same transactions get processed in the continuous and intermittent simulation system cis that means parallel but again you have to give a criteria for all these which uh, which uh, transaction snapshot will capture which transaction scarf will capture which transaction cis will process for all of this there is something that is very important called as criteria what do you mean by criteria right something like every transaction greater than 10000 so this is connected to all these okay so it's important that you learn that you use this criteria when you do this so what happens is the transactions get processed in the main system transaction also gets processed in the cis then the results are compared results are compared if they are giving you same results which means the transaction is fine if results differ so this versus this if results differ then they are sent to a place called as exception log file what is that place called an exception log file where these exceptions are then audited by our auditor and to sum up this we have a fifth audit tool called as audit hooks what is it called audit hooks the main function of this audit hook software is it will do tagging of suspicious transactions tagging of what suspicious transactions that's what 
what constitute to a suspicious transaction will again be a matter of the software's criterial choice based on what you set up okay then that will determine what exactly the uh, you know criteria is and that will help you determine what is the transaction which is suspicious so somebody changed the name of the beneficiary and they claimed all the money immediately after name change if somebody is claiming the money that's a suspicious transaction so immediately our audit hook software will tag that okay so these are the five concurrent audit tools that are being used right now to make sure that all these systems are audited and make sure that they operate properly okay so this is again an another important point that you got to keep in mind so if you want to take a screenshot you can do so for this so let me quickly take you back to the original story here where we started and that is with the breakup of the information system concepts chapter okay so this is the first and foremost thing with three parts to the story and then the story moved on to what is called as an information system components a great deal of thing that you can see followed by the concept of virtual memory discussed in detail then the eight functions of operating system the concept of data warehouse and of course what is the bottom up and top down approach and this link of database data mart and data warehouse the entire detail of database models information system controls and their breakup in detail so logical access managerial and application controls then followed up by information system audit and the discussion about the five concurrent audit tools okay so this is the story that one has to take home from this leg of revision and uh, you know you guys have to ensure that you put all your efforts in trying to do or redo something because if you know it it is very good but if you don't then it should not be a problem okay yeah flagging or tagging of suspicious transactions is what is called as uh you know the function of audit hooks yes i see that good so if any of you okay what you are asking for audit trails audit trail is a chronological record of all the transactions that take place from start to end i can tell you that much about audit trails and then audit trails are designed in such a way that it has to capture that detail which will be useful for for the review now generally people who are reviewing audit trails are the ones who will contribute to the story so you have to see what exactly is uh, the concept of audit trail in your organization you should not capture everything in audit trail because that will be useless somebody has to constantly keep reviewing the audit trail because if they are not then what is the purpose so post review you will be able to find if something went wrong so mostly audit trails are considered as detective controls and so that you can take corrective actions but the fact that audit trails will record what i will do it may also stop me from doing something wrong so the very same control can sometimes even act as a what do you say preventive control also small insight if you want you can just read that paragraph three points are there as to what goes into making up that audit trail and uh, i don't think that will be of any difficulty for you to catch up that yeah so it will help you the point that i told you who did it and when they did it all that will you know make them personally accountable for it personal accountability detecting unauthorized access that's only after somebody entered you will be able to find out and then if you lost some data by seeing the audit trail what all happened you can reconstruct the data so three advantages of audit trail one is detecting unauthorized access reconstruction of the events and personal accountability that is the uh, part of uh, you know audit trail so that also can be said that we have covered you give a revision now there is one last topic called audit of all the controls so whatever controls you read in the previous topic keep them in mind and rerun the audit 
now somebody wants to skip the topic again i don't want to say it by on record but if you want to take any leverage in this chapter it is managerial and application controls along with their audits those two topics you can keep them in the last preference that's all i can tell for now okay so yes i think another very fruitful session if uh, some of you have run away in between or if any of you have gone and come back or you know lost interest in between for some time because we discussed something that you don't know and all please make sure that you come back this video is going to be there and uh, for those of your friends who are finding it difficult throw this link to them and in the description of this video i already have parts 1 and 2 so those of you who want to watch it uh, you can go and do so chapters 1 and 2 all right then thanks for your participation and i will see you in the next live session we will come back and catch up certain interesting things in audit and then i will again see you guys in chapters 4 and 5 okay so very wide chapter guys so i did my best and i hope uh, you know all this will be of some use to you i will embed the screenshots of the content and put it on my instagram handle if you want to you know just keep a copy of that you can or you can always take the screenshots right and uh, thank you good night i will see you in my next live session Hi guys very good evening i hope everybody is doing good and uh, let's move on to our fourth chapter in eis which is again a very scoring chapter now one thing that i would like to mention before we proceed further and go in greater detail is that uh, oh yeah good evening good evening to all of you can see your comments now yeah okay we will also allow people uh, to join in because it takes a minute for the notification to go and you know the daily process right yes 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 hello good evening to all of you and uh, there are certain interesting developments that have taken place in this chapter but uh, if some of you have not gone through all those in detail okay those of you who ever have joined i will obviously tell once again in the middle of the live session when a few more join in but for now all i am trying to tell you is if you are not sure as to what have been the changes in chapter number 4 and where the amendments are because there are substantial number of uh, additions to this particular chapter in the likes of uh, the same topics but only thing is you know they have become slightly more elaborate if you haven't watched any of that then exactly in the description of this video you will find the amendments video i have been telling this in every live session of yes those of you who want to go there and watch it can always do that because that should not be a a real problem okay so yeah we have to take certain things under consideration first of which will be the part of e-commerce let's drill this down into three parts okay this particular uh, chapter is broken down into three parts so let me put that up for you as to what are those three parts so chapter 4 with three branches first one is called e-commerce then we will discuss about digital payments and then of course we will discuss about some of the emerging technologies okay some very very interesting aspects are there in all these 
let's try and get to the story and of course so it's going to be a session worthy of your time so what i want you to do is to make sure that you are well connected with me in doing whatever we are doing here so let us get to that story with e-commerce now i don't think we have to emphasize much on the concept of e-commerce because uh, this one right here is a very basic topic doing business electronically is what e-commerce is all about yeah do we say that doing business electronically that's what can be called as e-commerce right then moving to the first part of e-commerce what is the difference between traditional commerce and e-commerce that's where the story starts i hope everybody is aware of the background here yeah we will also discuss the components of e-commerce in detail because that could potentially turn out to be a question here in the exam so yes that's the big story coming up oh. <clears throat> so before we go there let me give you an insight of what all are there in e-commerce traditional commerce versus e-commerce i don't think that will be a challenge because it's a first topic very easy topic in traditional commerce versus e-commerce traditional commerce is where you do business in the brick and mortar style that means you will have a fixed location to do the business you are on the supply side that means you showcase the whole world what you have so it's not like people come to you because they want you showcase everything through a shop and say i am selling all this if people want then they'll come and buy all that and then traditional commerce shops can't be open 24 7 shops have a very limited time frame even in the shops and establishment act there is a restriction on it now there are even more restrictions and all that okay uh, sometimes now uh, the government takes decisions as to when to keep it open and all owing to the situation around us otherwise also e-commerce always have an edge of working 24 7 electronic payments can be made okay that can be made both places and uh, traditional commerce the idea is you can go see touch and buy which is what lacks in e-commerce you just have to see what is there on screen and buy so that's kind of a uh, a discouraging point the interface is only screen to face not face to face okay so like that that's a very basic start which i believe all of you can easily tackle with that table traditional commerce versus e-commerce then moving up there we have the next topic coming in benefits of e-commerce benefits of e-commerce what are the benefits of e-commerce the three people who get benefited by e-commerce there is no one party to the story definitely the buyer gets benefited that is yes convenience easy to shop best part about e-commerce you get coupons and deals right there are a lot of stuff like that you know you end up getting some coupons and deals and uh, savings in time you don't have to run here and there i mean nowadays at least i i don't want to you know generalize this at least i am irritated in going to a shopping mall parking the vehicle finding the parking first of all forget about directly parking you roam around in that space for so long to find one spot for your car then go up then finish the shopping shopping will take half an hour standing in the bill counter will take 45 minutes i'm telling all this out of experience i'm pretty sure you guys on the other side might have also experienced it and uh, just i don't really you know prefer going in the traffic all the way then waiting so long so for some things that can be finished now unless you really want to get out that's i think a past story now <laughs> nobody wants to go in the traffic anytime access pick up phone flipkart is there amazon is there mintra is there what do you want and hell a lot of other sites are there you have access to international websites huh? so anytime access is there and the best part about e-commerce for the buyers is you also find star ratings and reviews so if a product is rated one star or one and a half star we don't even go to that like why did people rate that also i don't want to know one and a half star let's ignore okay maybe the product is really bad that's why it garnered so many ratings so few benefits to the buyers or customers first of all convenience then saves time easy access you get coupons and deals and then as i told you very easy to find reviews 
and whole lot of options. Then think from the point of view of seller. A seller is the one who is talking about the e-commerce story. Now, yeah, of course, the third branch is about the government because now when these encourage digital payments, there is all payments and transactions happening in white. So this becomes a great tool to fight corruption. And because, you know, in so many places, the middlemen are eating away a lot of money. So, yeah, through e-commerce, there's a definite way that government can also tackle corruption. There is a proof of every transaction happening. So, a lot of black money, what was in circulation, will be under control. Now, the most benefited party out of this entire story is the seller going beyond the boundaries of the geographical limitations that I have. You can create new markets. If I am having a physical shop, maybe people in my area will buy. Okay, maybe people in the adjacent areas here and there may come and buy. And if I am very famous in the city, people from different areas may come. Right? From the city only. Right? Have you heard anybody saying that, you know, to buy clothes, I have to go to another country? Huh? Unless when people go to other country, they may end up buying. But for buying, I mean, like, that's not a common sight. Exceptions are there notably. But like I said, increase in the geographical coverage that you do. When coverage increases, customer base will increase. And the cost, reduction in cost is biggest advantage of the e-commerce. What cost will reduce? Advertising cost will reduce. Huh? From the point of view of buyers, we already told. It uh, definitely is, you know, cost saving for the buyers. Seller's point of view also. It doesn't have to put up a shop, rent, all the drama is not there. So you can directly strike a deal with the manufacturer. And get the goods in bulk. And which is exactly why you find uh, products online cheaper. Then there is no person coming there, visiting, checking, going. All the drama is not there. If sale happens, instant transaction. Money is immediately into the account of the seller. No waiting period, nothing. Then what else can be brought in? Uh, reduction in cycle time. That is the total time taken to finish. One entire transaction definitely comes down because things are way more faster. The only physical thing that takes place is the logistics. That's delivery of goods. And if you have a proper delivery system, I think that's also taken care of. And one more thing, which is the uh, real point of suppliers is they have to have the best quality. If they don't, somebody else will overtake them. So that fear itself will help you maintain the best out of it. Okay. So I think I've broadly covered what are the benefits to all three parties, which again is not a head breaking concept. So I think you can go ahead and discuss that. Now, what is newly added up in this story is also one more factor because they discussed benefits. They also discussed what is called as disadvantages. Okay. So this is a new addition to the story, but the points are very simple. You can check out what the disadvantages are. As you see, from the point of view of disadvantages, first up, if internet connection is not there, then don't talk about any of this. See, the entire story here works well only when you're talking with an internet connection. In fact, right now, this is a YouTube live. This also will not be possible if there is no internet. So majority of aspects that are dealt in e-businesses, they fundamentally need an internet connection. And these kind of businesses, it's not like you decided that you will start an e-commerce and uh, sir, back then I knew one of my friends who did engineering and that was an IT engineer. I think he knows how to construct websites, construct in how to build a website. So I will approach him and he will build me a website and then from next Monday we'll start up e-commerce. What do you think? It's a smooth road like that. So you got to have the entire infrastructure. You got to set up those servers. You got to get the best site. And it's not like creating some random website. An e-commerce website wherein you have to have, uh, you know, buying and selling going on. Then it means they have to match several compliances. They have to be linked to something called as payment gateways. The moment you bring in money, then RBI comes in. Because you can't do some illicit or illegal transactions out there. So you have to go by the norm specified by RBI. Payment gateways integration is not a joke again. See, all this can be done easily. The uh, ones who are developing, no, web designers and developers, they do it easily. They'll take time. And then you have to pay them. It's not like you can put up a free website and start selling. You can. See, all these are 
there are always cheaper alternatives for anything okay when the whole world was trying to do something we sent a satellite to mars with a cost of 400 crores and the per kilometer cost was much lesser than what we uh, you know travel in auto here lot of memes were made around that did you see that so that's what i'm saying there are ways okay so if somebody asks how they finished the mars mission in 400 crores that was the budget that was given so they were able to do so if budget is less you can try and do but if you want to compete in the likes of the top e-commerce then you need high startup cost that's a big disadvantage because you got to establish all the hardware that set up and then the servers sir why are we doing all this why can't we hire a cloud for them also you have to pay no it's not going to come for free so you have to ensure connections hardware software their maintenance no sir i don't want to take all this headache i will outsource uh, for outsource also for the cloud service providers you have to pay okay bottom line you have to definitely put some amount of money into this which is why if your idea is bright nowadays there are many people to fund okay so lot of e-commerce startups have received great fundings but only because they saw potential in them and you know lot of e-commerce companies are there which burnt all that money and are nowhere okay now even in the likes of paytm cred and all these people are also still burning cash then none of them are profitable as yet there are hopes that they will turn profitable okay swiggy has got a 3.2 billion dollar valuation actually so if you really see what swiggy uh, and zomato is uh, very soon going to go for an ipo sir are these companies really worth so much are their valuations justified altogether different topic but that's exactly what e-commerce is all about it will make you you know it will take you to the sky or it will push you to the ground then the next disadvantage they're talking about is a legal issues let me write this down for you so that those of you who are checking out this for the first time you guys will know it so disadvantages first one as we said internet connection if there is no internet connection then the story is not there high startup high startup cost okay when i say startup cost it includes all of those okay and now that you go for these there may be some legal issues that may crop up there may be some legal issues which can crop up then sometimes you know people don't feel like doing this why sir e-commerce and all put money pay on a website and if they don't deliver a product we should take that headache happy going to the shop and buying elders mostly right talk to people who are 45 plus i'm not saying everybody a lot of people are comfortable doing that nowadays but still many people are afraid so that's more a cultural barrier in your book you will find a word cultural impediment impediment something that stops you i'll call it a cultural barrier to make your life more easy okay there are some cultural barriers with you know like there is a resistance to change if you ask my mom you know why don't we do an e-commerce transactional buy it so if there are any advertisements and she, she shows me something i'll be like uh, you know take it easy we'll go get this online she'll be like no 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 let's go to the nearest shop and buy it and i'll argue with her who's going to you know the stores nowadays you know everybody everybody's doing all she'll be like let everything come to the normal see because unless i see how the cloth is and all i don't know i said let it come here if you don't like it we can return she says all that is a pain i'm not saying she's disagreeing with the fact that you know she wants to, she's used to do that and sometimes even i am very uh, specific about like not only me lot of customers clothing footwear unless you wear and see that you don't feel like irrespective of uh, range of models available on e-commerce and we have the facility to return and you get refund still why do you want to do all that you want to go to that particular place and uh, you know do that and some businesses never okay we'll say then i say okay never come to e-commerce who some businesses they never come to e-commerce because they don't like it no sir traditionally we are good we will continue uh, you know like this only like say uh, diamonds not that there are no websites who not selling it but very rare site 
I mean, like, how do you really think that somebody can uh, comfortably sell diamonds or jewelry and all online? Many people are not comfortable with all that stuff. So that's again a, a pretty important point that one has to note. I think as far as I remember, these are the disadvantages and yeah, of course, oh, sorry, I forgot the biggest disadvantage, you can write it anywhere, but security. Now we have the facility to save cards or, you know, put things on e-commerce and that can always create a tension. What will happen to my money? And uh, what if somebody else uses off my card? Uh, saved cards option is there, that's a danger. So all that, you know, is critically... Uh, putting some pressure on some people not to use ecom. Many people are afraid about security only, not anything else. Okay, so these are all the points that we have to take into consideration and also see, uh, you know, how you can work around these. Yeah, so that is something that you should be bothered about. All right, then. So that brings us to the end of this topic called as the disadvantages, yeah, jewelry, antiques or some special items. Many people don't want to sell all that online, right? So that's a pretty critical point. Now let's get to something very interesting, which deals with the e-commerce models, what we normally have in our e-commerce businesses. This is a very interesting question. Anything can pop up in the exam. So stay put. These are called as e-commerce models. What are they called? E-commerce models. If you go by that, I have totally nine categorizations. But I would want you to go. Actually, you can write nine one below the other. But I would want you to look at it in uh, three into three story. First three are very easy to remember. First one is called an e-shop. What was the physical shop? If it goes online, that is straight away called a e-shop. So nothing much to worry about that. Like say you have individual brands, which are like say Samsung has a physical Samsung store, but you can as well purchase it from samsung.com. Okay. Same is the case with like say uh, clothing brands, like say something like W for women. They have an online website, W for women, official website, buy from there. Okay. So like that, lot of people are there who have physical shops and then like Lenskart. But Lenskart is a reverse story. Lenskart first started as a online and then they open stores. But still, it can work. Lenskart, it just sells one product of, I mean, in the sense, predominantly. So there is a shop. There is an e-version of the shop. So like that, e-shops. But when you come down to discussing about uh, uh, Amazon, Flipkart, do you have electronics? Yes. Do you have clothing? Yes. Do you have footwear? Yes. So what does it mean? It's like going into a mall. So such wide businesses, they are called as e-malls. I hope you understood the difference between e-shop and e-mall. I wanted to club, uh, you know, websites like that. And then third one is something like our, uh, you know, Craigslist, eBay. If you have known all those sites, they're called e-auctions. Okay. We can put things on auction there. E-auction is one of the model in e-commerce business. So predominantly what we encounter, okay, to buy goods, generally we prefer e-malls so that we have a wide range of, uh, you know what, collection there about anything. So you can choose electronics, you can choose clothing, you can choose accessories, you name it and they are there. Okay, e-auctions are for, you know, mostly customer to customer type of a business or maybe you know you can even think of one uh, where you know even kind of uh, used products and all will go for it i'm not saying only those but that also is a possibility then let's talk about four five and six which are the recent additions to this they're called buyer aggregators swiggy zomato ola uber all those are coming in the nature of buyer aggregators they don't own anything but they facilitate everything swiggy doesn't own restaurants Right? Uber doesn't own cars. Okay, somebody like Airbnb, they don't own any hotels. So these are all called buyer aggregators. They facilitate. So they help you do more of these things rather than, you know, stopping you from doing anything. Got it? Then we have Netflix, Amazon Prime, Disney Hotstar, all those, they are all called portals where there are subscription models. Okay, you just sign up to them. 
and then you know you end up paying for the content of course i told the most prominent ones you have so many nowadays uh so i i mean i don't even know the full list of that maybe you can add a few more something like z5 woot and all that but portals are so many today wherein the content is put up and they made available for sale on a pay per view basis or maybe you can even go for a subscription model so that's totally up to uh, you know the person who is dealing with it whatever they want they can actually deal with that story okay so yeah that's up to this one called as uh, portals now then we have some business to business deals right wherein uh, we have e procurements okay wait i think we have to finish the sixth one right here e shop e mall e auction buyer aggregators portal and uh, social media they are called as virtual communities that's what i'm thinking what did i miss virtual communities facebook instagram linkedin virtual community uh, you know like how we stay in a physical place to physical community now all this have gone online where you create a virtual community then we have e procurement e procurement is a story where many companies nowadays will automate the procurement process when uh, i think you studied in costing about these terms like reorder level okay when the goods reach a reorder level again you have to go raise a purchase order send all the drama is not there approved vendors are there uh, a reorder level is set up a quantity is decided then automatically uh, you know a procurement a purchase order is sent to them when it reaches that particular reorder level so automating the entire process of procurement because that is one very time taking job and you don't want to waste your time in all these time taking jobs right so which is one of the reasons why we need e procurements and when you have e procurement we also have another thing called as e distribution model okay so e distribution is about again whatever products can be delivered online or you know we have a complete well knit and well connected uh what do you say <clears throat> the entire logistic process i think in strategic management we discussed a point about the supply chain management right from procurement till distribution so like that we have e distribution model which will help all the distributors to distribute in the quickest possible time and then one of the best ways to right now do very costly aspect earlier is which is now very cheap is called e marketing you can use this electronic platform or the e commerce platform to absolutely do a rampage of marketing there is no there are no two thoughts that you should have in doing this okay so this is the story of all the models that go on and if these models are to be attributed to what happens in e-commerce and how it happens then uh, you know you have three broad aspects on how e-commerce models work one is called business to business e-commerce works on what business to business then business to customer business to business is like you know uh, microsoft buying from dell or uh, dell procuring from microsoft hp procuring from microsoft wipro procuring from somebody so wherein they use all these e procurement e distribution e marketing and all that we as general public we consume buyer aggregator services we subscribe on to portals for entertainment or for other reasons like maybe even classes and all that now a lot of content is made and put up on uh, sites like coursera udemy and all that so you can go there and subscribe to those courses then join virtual communities you want to buy goods you can go to e shop e malls and e auction sites so this is more like business to customer and then stuff is there where customer can deal with customer customer to customer does it end there no we have better ones called business to government for paying taxes and all that ha huh? b to g there are some portals right wherein you can uh, make sure that you make all these payments then we have the reverse wherein freelancers who render services they will showcase their services on a site that is called c to g sorry sorry c to b okay customer will showcase his work and let businesses procure their services 
if it's really you know useful to somebody then they can procure that service and then when we told business to government there is also customer to government here we are more like uh, you know every citizen should be able to access the government portals and all which we are now comfortably able to and we can make the payments right so these are all the aspects that one needs to know in terms of uh, the e-commerce models right so i hope uh, everything is going good till now and meanwhile before i proceed further can i get a confirmation from you guys as to how these few topics that we discussed what is e-commerce a connect between traditional commerce and e-commerce benefits to all the three parties who are involved in e-commerce and also the disadvantages okay we also talk about the disadvantages of e-commerce then also talking about various models the nine models that are involved in e-commerce along with all those aspects of b2b b2c c2c and then business to government customer to business and customer to government and all these services meanwhile if you guys can throw a confirmation we will safely proceed further okay into dealing with one prominent topic called the components of e-commerce we'll dwell down that deeply okay i got to proceed with what is called as components of e-commerce there is a story here and i want you guys to be very very alert with this story yeah clear ama very good very good thanks for confirming that let's now straight away move on without wasting time to the components of e-commerce i want everybody to listen to this like it's a story in fact it is a story so let's take a minute to kind of understand how things work around in the story of the components let's basically start with an understanding of the two most important parties who deal in the story who are the two important parties who deal in the story one is the e-commerce user this is people like you and me we are the users now this is where the story begins and we have somebody who we have to connect to and what is that person's name e-commerce vendor for example we'll call flipkart or amazon as an e-commerce vendor so this is user you are me can turn out to be a user then we have to connect to a e-commerce vendor now no doubt there are two aspects that immediately will strike in one sir without internet the story will not work obviously so i'm writing that and leaving it there only because i don't think i have to explain you further the entire aspect of e-commerce works on internet so we don't really have to worry now we are familiar with these three points because we have been the user we have used the internet we know e-commerce vendors okay so we are clear with these three points not only that a good e-commerce vendor will also have a good web portal where they can display everything correct now without a proper web portal what are you discussing huh? the very fact that many people buy on flipkart amazon uh, very easily even those people who are not well versed with you know using computers and all that is because of the ease and comfort so that means they have designed their apps and websites so beautifully and they have been hosted like that so web portal becomes a very important aspect of this entire e-commerce where website is completely hosted which also is a small point that we don't have to really worry about then the point actually i mean actually none of these points you have to worry about because i believe all of you sitting here and watching this have done an e-commerce transaction which is why some things which are only academic aspects might we have to be given uh, a little important but otherwise we don't really have to worry about these things like internet web portal and a payment gateway i hope all of you have come across a payment gateway in the likes of visa and mastercard payment gateways rupay payment gateways paypal payment gateways bill desk pay you i think i've given you enough examples which will tell you what exactly are Uh, you know constituting right now to the payment gateway now comes a very very 
important technical component that we require is to have this bridge set properly okay between the user and e-commerce vendor we need what is called as technology infrastructure yeah that's where the story gets interesting technology infrastructure so if you don't have a proper technology infrastructure then things will not work well not only that e-commerce vendor should fulfill certain things if e-commerce vendor is not fulfilling certain things then again we will not have any scope to discuss any of these points in detail now so we taken care of the user this is component number one e-commerce vendor is component number two we have to have a full length technology infrastructure which is to be supported by internet a web portal and a payment gateway so if anybody asks you anything in detail this is exactly what you got to go and tell them that there are six components user an individual or an entity anybody e-commerce vendor is the one who is on the other side who is doing all of this and bringing all of this to us now what should the e-commerce vendor make sure i think a uh, simple point that e-commerce vendor has to mention and have is that e-commerce vendor should have a proper supply chain management if he himself is not getting the goods in time then how will he serve you so the first and foremost thing that e-commerce vendor has to take care is what one supply chain management so the e-commerce vendor has to ensure that there is a proper supply chain management e-commerce vendor should also ensure that there are proper logistics uh, logistics will help you move the goods but e-commerce vendor should have proper warehouse so e-commerce vendor should have a warehouse okay e-commerce should ensure about logistics warehouse to store goods logistics to move the goods e-commerce vendor should have shipping and return policies in how many days you will ship and if the customer doesn't like the goods in how many days you will return shipping and return policies let me just go away for a second so that you know you have a full length coverage of this okay so shipping and return policies then we also have to have uh, a product catalog why do you have to have a product catalog then only you can display things to people right so we have to have a product catalog then we have to have marketing otherwise how will people know about you and your product so e-commerce vendor and then sometime back we told no coupons and deals we have to deals have to be offered by e-commerce vendors okay deals and i will say deals and loyalty programs let me say that deals or loyalty programs so that you know people come back to you only they don't leave you and go that's a very important point and then a uh, couple of more points i can add up one is called very important one privacy policy what will the e-commerce vendor do with your data now if you are going and seeing some content on flipkart or amazon immediately you are getting ads of the same thing in instagram youtube and all that have you ever wondered how is all that happening huh? instagram is uh, showcasing only those ads that are being told so huh? how are all that coming up so there is a very important point and then <clears throat> that is because uh, you know it's all artificial intelligence powered your data is given by these people to those respective websites sir who gave them the power whatever i am shopping how can they give it to you only gave sir i never gave all that while you signed up i agree you typed no for everything uh, that is what is creating the danger so read the privacy policy and then type then the e-commerce vendor should also be bothered about product and product guarantees and warranties okay and then the last point after you bother about product warranties or guarantees is also about the various ordering methods okay there are no standard ways of ordering you can do everything right now including uh, cash on delivery cash on delivery being a very popular ordering method okay so this is what we have in terms of what is called as a uh, what do you say activities to be undertaken by our e-commerce vendor 
okay e commerce vendor he has to do all of that and if he is unable to do any of that then uh, he will have his own difficulty in you know taking this story further so that is why he has to deal with that okay then okay so when we move on we will now talk about technology infrastructure so that i am also back on screen in the small place that we are uh, now we talk about four parts of technology infrastructure first and foremost thing so you have to have computer servers you don't have to think twice relentlessly an organization has to maintain all this that uh, computer servers database they should have all of that let me just put that up for you here technology infrastructure consists of one computers then uh, servers databases all of that and then what should they have right now what is the need of the r they should have something called as mobile apps mobile apps and if mobile apps have five modules i would want you to go through these five modules okay a mobile ticketing module mobile front module okay and uh, because these are important this has been asked in the exam they can always come again a front module ticketing module advertising module customer support module and a mobile banking module those are the five modules that without fail i want you to give a reading to then we have something called as digital libraries which will have the photos videos and the image audio video of everything digital libraries now because digital libraries are important on you know how to maintain and what should you do if you don't maintain the digital library then where will you store all this now not only maintaining the library but the content in that library should be capable of being exchanged which is called as data oh sorry not digital which is called as edi electronic data interchange so yeah that point is something that you have to mention here you also have to have a data interchange facility to exchange the data if these are not there if you don't build this technology infrastructure then there is no way how you can take your e commerce aspects further so this is one very very important completely uh, a very critical topic in e-commerce okay so i want you to take a quick note on all these points if you want you can yeah now go ahead and take a screenshot of that because that you know sums up our purpose of doing this topic components of the e-commerce taking you back a step we already have seen all the concepts involved in e-commerce models and then we have discussed already some of the aspects that one has to consider here okay so this is the broad story traditional commerce benefits we've uh, spoke about disadvantages and then we also have discussed about the models and then we speak about components of e-commerce so this is predominantly the first base of this particular topic wherein we have all these things to be discussed right then taking us to the next level will be the concepts of risk because any good concept that we normally discuss will automatically have the risk in story to spoil the whole party right so this is not the first time that we are seeing it we discussed it in bpa okay we also discussed it in um, erp wherever we talk about any good things risk will come off into the story ha to but before going with the risk i want you to quickly discuss another concept where we generally talk about the architectures you remember two tier and three tier architecture yeah 
so we will have a quick discussion about that as well architecture break it down we have two tire and three tire architecture in the two tire architecture can you guys let me know what are the two tires in the two tire architecture are you guys there along yeah very good so two tire architecture has about two layers and what are those the two tire architecture has two layers so what are those come on come on yeah very good ramya what we can see there yes yes very good no 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 not application we have a presentation tire we have a presentation tire and we have a database tire presentation tire and a database tire when you look at the same story on the other side of the three tire architectures we have what is called as a presentation tire we also have what is called as a data or database layer or data tire whatever you call it but what comes newly to add up in this story is the center one that is called as application layer okay so this presentation layer generally is in the user end okay and this data is on the other side and data layer no it only stores data so the data layer is not going to get uh, anything to work so where the major part of the action happens the major part of the action happens in the either presentation layer or in the three tier architecture where we follow the story in three tier architectures application layer will do most of the processing and here there is a clear separation of logic which one in three tier architectures there is a clear separation of logic that is in this one we have what is called as a clear separation of logic and what is that clear separation of logic that presentation layer will be on the user where he will only present the data while data tier will only store the data while application layer will do the whole of the processing that is what the story we are looking at so if you have a question on which architecture will be used in e-commerce okay architecture that is used in e-commerce would i get the answers from you can you now compare and tell me from this now nothing like two tier architecture can't be used but just see one of these tires are overburdened and just imagine when more number of people come into the story right speed will automatically deteriorate and if you don't want such things to happen then what tire will be used yeah of course very good that's a very prompt answer down there so the one that is used in e-commerce yes ramya durga prasad you got guys got it right we say what the three tire architecture will be used in the e-commerce so that you know it enables you to work much better the little insight about how the three tires are applied and which layer will help you so even if more number of users are coming in it may turn out to be a little more accommodative that is what the story is in the architectures okay so in this particular story yeah i think that's the end of the architectures and then we have some basic topics on risk and controls that are involved so the set of risks involved in e-commerce i don't think that is a very difficult topic because rest of the topics here are risk and controls of course i will discuss a little bit on that and then laws and regulation that are applicable for e-commerce you have to get through all the basic laws companies act is applicable uh, rbi's guidelines are applicable information technology act is applicable contract act is applicable like that there are two three concepts about that which you can read and then risks are the same risks that we saw even in the first chapter a list of that you know people can 
uh, be worried about their privacy and security quality issues of the goods that you buy what you see on screen and what you actually get may be different then uh, sometimes when you buy from international websites sometimes when you buy them from international websites there could always be a delay in the uh, you know cost of doing it hidden costs will be there and uh, one of the biggest risks in e-commerce is if they don't have internet which we already seen and there is lack of personal touch so you just have to believe what you see on screen and then buy it and it may not give you 100% satisfaction always people are worried about security about secure transaction basically i'm using my credit card then i want it to be 200% safe sometimes you don't get to know who is the a party on the other side it's called problem of anonymity you don't know who the other party is and then uh, in some countries still i mean in india though it's okay because we have an established law in some countries some of the e-commerce transactions may not be considered legal not all some of them at least may not be considered legal the biggest threat that we generally carry here is the attack from hackers okay so like that a list of points are there that risk uh, there is a risk that goods which are prohibited drugs narcotics wildlife they may all be sold on e-commerce platforms so this sort of uh, risk will you know always be uh, quite dangerous and which is why we don't generally intend to uh, what do you say take e-commerce so granted many people still they don't save cards or you know uh they don't believe it so still they pay cash on delivery only they don't want to do it it's up to them there is no force that you have to follow it but what you can do is each party is vulnerable here okay and then talk about logistics if logistics don't deliver the goods on time then this entire e-commerce process goes for a toss okay so what should we do the same we have to establish controls but by having the best mechanisms to you know ensure that there is security secured payment gateways should be uh, you know constructed make people aware that transaction made through their website is safe encryption is possible you just tell people all this but it's again up to people to believe but one person is not fulfilling the whole story in e-commerce so this entire flow has to be taken care okay educating every participant in e-commerce becomes very important right Uh, right from the user e-commerce vendor whoever they are so simply becoming aware of something is not enough okay so all the parties users sellers logistic service providers network service providers if those guys uh, you know are uh, little lazy and say our ah, network will not work sir what should you do so network service providers should make sure that you know 24 by 7 network is up and available suddenly you got got up at midnight and then you wanted to buy something you went on amazon in the midnight amazon doesn't work if they say nothing like it. so network providers should always make sure that e-commerce is up and available and uh, maintenance team who will maintain our technology infrastructure they are called technology service providers or technology outsourcers or technology vendors different names but you can simply stick to technology service provider network service provider technology service provider logistic service provider if i am an e-commerce vendor i am dependent on all these people so we have to bring in all these people educate each and every participant tell them where it can go wrong and of course the payment gateway because that is the most ultimate thing if you are able to deal and tackle with all this you know you can comfortably uh, give that confidence to our user because if one good website is available 10 fake sites are available so please give attention to this topic called risks in e-commerce and then follow it up by reading the controls they are not at all difficult a casual read will be sufficient i am telling this because we did risks in erp and risks in bpa you will not at all find anything difficult controls will again definitely be same but as i just told you educating every participant become important one miscellaneous topic in the e-commerce is laws applicable to e-commerce companies act gst contract act negotiable instruments act companies act i am telling twice okay come then uh, 
बैंकिंग रेगुलेशन एक्ट आरबीआई गाइडलाइंस इंफॉर्मेशन टेक्नोलॉजी एक्ट फॉरिन करेंसी रेगुलेशन एक्ट सो देर इज ऑल्सो एफ सी आर ए गाइडलाइंस ओके दो फॉलोड फेमा हेज टू बी फॉलोड सो लाइक दैट लिस्ट ऑफ लॉज विच आर अपलेबल एंड वन लाइन आर अबाउट देम आर गिवेन सो यू डोंट हैव टू गो एंड यू नो कैंड ऑफ बाई हार्ट एनी थिंग जस्ट टेक अ क्यू ऑफ दिस ओके सो i think all the major aspects have been summarized the important concept of components have been uh, you know taken care in detail uh, models i have discussed with you in detail benefits we've discussed all the points so i don't see any uh, you know more broader points to be discussed in e-commerce so if there are any points here or there if you didn't understand something we do have a session coming up on chapter 5 that time you can ask me so please make sure that you run through all of this now i want to take back you to the initial slide again wherein we have been discussing about the second branch which is called as digital payments okay so here we again have some interesting aspects to talk about what are the traditional digital payments what are the new age digital payments so we do have discussions around that and we will obviously go ahead and talk about that okay yeah but one uh, point that i want to mention here one new topic has been added in the story called trends in e-commerce okay trends in e-commerce we will talk about how content has to be the best social commerce which is nothing but social media which is very very important then use of mobile commerce wherein mobile apps play a key role use of biometrics to ensure more of security and all these e-commerce are powered by artificial intelligence and predictive analysis so make sure that you don't forget this extra new topic which are which is again a star topic i will call it as trends in e-commerce with five points please go through that it's not at all a difficult topic how things have changed what is the trends in e-commerce then coming down to digital payments the very first digital payments are the new age digital payments new age digital payments okay what are those which are in the likes of let me list them down starting with the first one called as unified payment interface or upi phone pay google pay hey, please don't expect me to explain all this okay i'll just give you overview of digital payments sit and read um, i want to you know go to the next part of the session in emerging technologies i would like to you know tell you some points or maybe if you have any issues you can ask me so upi then we have immediate payment services imps bharat heavy interface for money we have a bhim app then we have something called e wallets paytm okay amazon pay mobi quick free charge you have enough number of e wallets to talk about then we have the new age which is yet to take the market they called as aadhar enabled payment systems just go and quote your aadhar number whatever connected bank accounts are there the list will come there you just have to authenticate the transaction by using some biometrics that's a job done but still not very prevalent everywhere but that will be the future and then if all these five are new age digital payments there is one thing common in them that they require internet if internet is not there then it will be very very difficult for you to operate the other five internet plus a smartphone if you have an old and day nokia phone and you still want to do a money transaction like this kind of not possible with these five but with one facility called the ussd unsupplementary structured data okay so when you run this uh, you know, star triple one generally okay when you do it for checking balances and all what do you do okay so unstructured supplementary service data ussd code running you can see that even now take up the uh, you know take up your phone and see do something like star 123 hash or star 111 hash and then just dial the call button 
you will say ussd code running uh, which is nothing but unstructured supplementary service data wherein you will be enabling transfer of uh, money from one mobile to other just by using this kind of a uh, hash 99 or star 99 banking it's called so type star 99 star then type the phone number of the other person and then star again the amount and say hash and call it automatically that money will be deducted from your balance and it will go to them so this has been there from quite some time it's been there from very long actually back then nowadays nobody is having uh, mobile balance like in money very few nowadays we all run packages right quarterly packages monthly packages you put a package it runs for 28 days and all that back then uh, you know i remember days where we used to do recharge for 10 rupees and we get a talk time of 7 rupees and then they will have attractive offers in that like uh, from 11 o'clock in the night to 6 o'clock in the morning you have calls free over the same network so many people they only talk in the night but how much will you talk on a nokia phone okay so back then when only calling and text messaging were there i am talking about a wifi free life okay i'm very fortunate to say that you know we have lived that and uh, of course technology and development have taken over it but not to say maybe because certain things were not there we had a great opportunity to go out and you know play in the street in the grounds explore many things today's kids also explore if they if you ask them you know uh, did do you explore something they'll show you instagram explore okay and if you ask them to play come let's play cricket they'll be like yeah pick up the joystick it's there so you want to play cricket tennis anything uh, people only want to play on their play stations i mean like there is a technological shift not just a small shift a huge one but you know the advent of multiplayer games and uh, the kind of apps that we have like many people tell no i i just was sitting on instagram i didn't even know how i wasted one hour you didn't waste that's instagram's uh, fundamental to hold you that long they they just use eye catchy multiple colors you are there that's all you won't leave and go just you keep scrolling because of that reason only your feed also is filled with that only understood now which is what i also learned a few days back in terms of some techniques which is why you see all these last 15 live sessions that we did i've been using multiple colors and not this you know like something to make it very attractive but the fact that you know you give attention to different colors in different manner it's a simple thought and one of the very exciting new age digital payment which has been added recently is a small paragraph on cryptocurrency i hope you guys have heard about all the noise that's being made right now about cryptocurrencies okay bitcoins ethereum uh the doge coin and a hell a lot of other coins that are being you know light coin name it in cryptocurrency the crypto world is right now being expected to be considered the future of digital payments but anyway i somehow believe there is uh, a long way to go there okay back in time like somebody told me about bitcoin 10 years before i heard it and this like okay cool and i left it now uh, when i heard it they were talking about bitcoin each bitcoin being about 1 dollar which was 45 rupees back then today today it's around 25 to 26 lakhs a single bitcoin but in the meanwhile it reached close to 45 lakhs very recently not long there's a a real surge there in the crypto world right now going on but cryptocurrencies are the future is what many people believe in it recently there was a huge uh, announcement by tesla which says that you know we start accepting cryptocurrencies if somebody starts accepting cryptocurrencies what will be the value for the normal money who will respect federal banks and rbi huh? so like that where everything can start uh, with crypto in fact recently there's a country by name el salvador who started accepting bitcoin as a legal tender in that country so whoever goes to that country if you have bitcoins you can pay in bitcoin okay so that's a first step 
well all con- that country's population is you know like uh, uh, 65 lakhs or something that will be there in our area okay so don't even think of such things to happen in india because that's a small place okay and there are a lot of visitors like it's more of a tourist place so there it can work not in uh, i mean i'm not saying in india it will not but look at the way how digital payments transformed india right for 10 rupees 5 10 rupees 5 rupees people are doing upi huh? so there is a change there are cryptocurrencies which can take over but the only point in cryptocurrency is you will not know who is the issuing authority they are encrypted and the only way you get access to your cryptocurrency is where you have a user id and password like you have some encryption methodology with which it is safeguarded and you are given an access mechanism okay so that is the big story about all of this anyway yeah so yeah that's the story about cryptocurrencies a lot more that we can discuss but anyway it's a small paragraph whatever is there in your syllabus i've covered it now apart from that in digital payments we do have our our own traditional methods traditional methods of what credit card debit card and net banking which we have always been doing okay traditional methods credit card debit card i hope you guys used all this so i am not dealing that part okay credit card debit card and net banking are the age old ways of doing this so few new age digital payments and then you have cryptocurrencies to take over and then the traditional payments of you know having a credit card debit card and net banking if you look at the advantages of using digital transactions of course very easy and convenient you can send money anytime anywhere and it's all legal that's the best part and you have a proof of doing the transaction so there is always a written record neither you will forget nor somebody can blame you for not doing something and uh, with these kind of transactions the risk is very very less nowadays thanks to the use of uh, m pins or thanks to biometric authentications you can you know even uh, be happy about the way how uh, you know the security aspect is taken care of but nevertheless security still becomes the biggest threat in this many people don't understand how digital payments work yeah so if non technical people are there they are still there okay so it's difficult for them security or loss of uh, data can be a big problem and one problem with digital payments is you know you have access to all your money all the time so it may end up in over spending and uh, sometimes what happens is partially when you are through a transaction suddenly internet connection will go and then what will happen a dispute will arise your money will be deducted from bank account and then you have to wait whether 24 to 72 hours will my money come back and all. so that's one disadvantage in digital payment completion of the transaction is not guaranteed owing to internet issues not about the setup sometimes many times it happens with the best of the internet speeds also sometimes you know uh, people may by mistake press the back button don't press refresh button or back button by mistake somebody touched it what will you do oh. and everywhere to do digital payment except for ussd you need internet tell me in places where we don't have internet how will you go about dealing this automatically that creates like a problem or not and one of the biggest disasters is called credit card many people don't know how to use it right they because they have credit limit they'll swipe left right without no it's not like you don't have to pay it you have to pay after a particular time that's all i when the bill comes we'll see sir uh, results in over spending so digital payment though are good they have their own uh, headaches as well okay so yeah that brings us to the end of the second part of this chapter which has discussed all the modes of digital payments now i'll just vanish for a minute wherein i will use the space to fill in what the emerging technologies are which have been discussed in this chapter and that will be a great insight starting with the concept of virtualization virtualization then we have four computing aspects 2 3 4 5 we have four of those computing aspects what are those 
ग्रेट कंप्यूटिंग क्लाउड कंप्यूटिंग मोबाइल कंप्यूटिंग एंड ग्रीन कंप्यूटिंग विच इज अबाउट बीइंग एनवायरमेंटली रिस्पॉन्सिबल अबाउट एनी ऑफ दीज एस्पेक्ट्स ग्रेट कंप्यूटिंग क्लाउड कंप्यूटिंग मोबाइल कंप्यूटिंग एंड ग्रीन कंप्यूटिंग द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ वर्चुअलाइजेशन वेर इन यू हैव फीचर्स लाइक सर्वर कंसोलिडेशन एंड ऑल दैट देन वी हैव सम इंडिविजुअल कॉन्सेप्ट लाइक बी वाई ओ डी ब्रिंग यूर ओन डिवाइस टू वर्क टूडे कॉर्पोरेट्स आर अलाउिंग पीपल टू ब्रिंग देर ओन डिवाइस टू वर्क बिकॉज आई एम मोर कंफर्टेबल इट माई लैपटॉप दैन वर्किंग ऑन समबडी एल्सर्स डिवाइस एंड दैट इंक्रीज माई प्रोडक्टिव एफिशियंसी then we have a topic on web predominantly they talking about web version 3 but right now even version 4.0 and 5.0 are in discussion 5.0 will take some time uh, for it to be a reality but what they discuss more is internet of things they called as iot very very uh, you know wide and outside the box concept makes you think you know like will this really or is it really possible as of today and very much iot internet of things and topic 9 and 10 go hand in hand because 10 is a subset of 9 ninth one is called as artificial intelligence and a subset of artificial intelligence is a concept of machine learning what is it machine learning so you have 10 of these topics in your syllabus and they do create what do you say a space for asking a lot of questions okay so virtualization is the fundamental concept based on which clouds grids all those work on the concept of virtualization so there is a lot to catch up with that story okay this is the bottom line now if you want now itself you can take a screenshot if you want about the broad outlook of what is there in chapter 4 little later i will also post this whole story i mean all the points what we discuss here on instagram so that you can take a queue about that i think i've done it already for chapters 1 and 2 you can also get to this even for chapter 3 i have done that all of those okay this also will come if you want to take screenshots now itself you can take but otherwise if you want to come back later and make summaries so this is the broad outlook of chapter 4 then we discussed many things about e-commerce here itself then i will say disadvantages i will give a heading so that you don't have to be confused later disadvantages of e-commerce e-commerce models in a broad way and then uh, these six wherein let me just make a small correction this is customer to business okay and then we have the broad concept of the components of e-commerce this is architecture and the other story that is the residual category and then let's just move on to talk about some concepts which are very pertinent for our discussion and i'll start with the first one called as virtualization let's try to understand some of the concepts here first of which is called virtualization i mean we say virtual which means something that is not real virtual the word virtual means something that is not real so it is something which is imaginary i think we already discussed about virtual memory in computers right so like that only it is imaginary it's not real the concept of virtualization lies in uh, you know things like disk partitioning now nobody takes a scale and goes and draws lines inside the disks right they are all done accordingly in terms of what you know or learn from there so that is exactly what is called as a disk partitioning 
how is it done by using the concept of virtualization so virtually wherein the software will split the aspects of a storage location that is how you in your hard disk you know c drive d drive e drive are there what do you think somebody took a scale and drew lines inside that definitely not okay so where there is a lack of hardware where there is a lack of hardware there also with now like say i don't have a keyboard i can use an on screen keyboard on screen keyboard is a virtual version of a hardware or not same way you look at uh, things on the internet now in google offices how many servers are there in google offices there may be many servers but for us from this side we call it as only one google server correct so multiple servers may to look like one huh? multiple servers may to look like one or single server may to look like many both these are concepts of virtualization physically many servers may be there but they may look like one and that concept is called as so virtualization is used in the concept of server consolidation server consolidation this is the biggest use of virtualization where multiple servers are combined and made to look like one and since these are virtual aspects you don't have to you know like worry about doing a testing or training program because we do understand that many people may go wrong in testing and training no people may go wrong and immediately you should not decide that when people go wrong a uh, entire system has to be disrupted and all that so a few areas of application of virtualization are there wherein you know you can do it in server consolidation these are the areas where virtualization are used server consolidation for all backup and rec disaster recovery when you have any disaster if you want to recover from the disaster immediately you can hop on to virtual environment like how right now in the pandemic we have virtual offices everybody is working from home but still office work is going on from an organization's point of view so where is the office no real office but there is an imaginary office going on right that is what is called as disaster recovery then as i told you testing and training if you don't want the main system to be hit you can get testing and training done testing and training all this can be done over the uh you know virtual place so even if something goes wrong it won't affect the main system then we have portable applications portable two things 4 and 5 portable applications which means you can take them anywhere and work and then portable workspaces like usb and all that those also can be used for workspace on a virtual basis three types of virtualization are there three types of virtualization are there first one is called as hardware virtualization wherein if any hardware is not there like this server consolidation how many servers are there physically let them be any number but for you it's from the point of view of the user it's only one or only one server is there physically but it's split and made to behave like there are three servers that also works single server being split into many or many consolidated into one both are possible in hardware virtualization network virtualization where our network service providers will provide us a service of a network now let's say i have a act fiber net or a geo fiber net connection in my house and we get this wire from a box that is there in the apartment not only me so many of my neighbors also use act connection but tell me something everybody in my apartment is there any guarantee that we have subscribed to the same package somebody might have opted for 100 mbps somebody might have opted for 50 mbps but then all of them are uh getting their wires connected from the same box so then how so one for a long time when i didn't know about any of these things i used to believe that you know in those boxes there will be different ports for different speeds that's what i used to believe for a long time till i didn't know but then one day when somebody was working at that box when the box was open i got a chance to see that and i asked them hey what is going on all the slots look same now 
So he showed me, this is yours, this is your neighbor's. Then I asked him, what about the connection? Let's say I am paying for 100 Mbps. My neighbor is paying for 50 Mbps connection. He says, sir, what are you talking? Do you think wires and I mean these slots, do you think they will decide the speed? No, sir, speed is split in our office in the software. I was wondering, what is it? So, that is called bandwidth on demand. Splitting bandwidth is called network virtualization. So, same wire, same setup, same box, everything is same. But how do we get different bandwidths? Is because the bandwidth is allocated on a virtual basis, not a physical basis. So, if tomorrow I want to downgrade my package, let's say now I am using a 200 Mbps connection, I want to downgrade it to 100 Mbps. I hope you guys are able to relate to all this. You can go on to the app of the service provider and say change connection preferences, downgrade it. Now, let's say I am paying 2000 rupees a month. Next time, there is a package for 1200 or 1300. We can, you know, opt for that. So, will they come again? Our network service providers, their people, will they come again? Remove my entire setup and connect it from another slot and give? Is that what you are thinking? No. The moment you opt for it in your app, they will give you a service ticket number and say within 24 hours your connection will be changed. That's all. And then suddenly you will get one text message saying you are now subscribed to so and so package. Upgrade, downgrade both. Sir, what are you talking? Exactly. That's what is called as network virtualization. It's called BOD, bandwidth on demand. And the third one is called storage virtualization. Sir, I don't have a 16 GB pen drive with me. Very good. Open your G Google Drive. You have 15 GB space there. So, if you don't have 16 GB pen drive, you have 15 GB virtual pen drive. Ah, but only thing is, if you have, if you want to con uh, copy content onto a pen drive, you can plug it to the port and copy. But if you want to save content on the web, then you need internet connection, which is obviously the thing that we already discussed. So, hardware, network and storage virtualization. Guys, I would like you to give me a confirmation from so long. I didn't disturb you. So, I think, yeah, I, are you guys still there? I didn't see that screen. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 45, 46. How? Number has gone up. In between, it became 30, 35. Good. Some people have joined. Very nice. So, yeah, just throw me a confirmation if you guys have had a clear idea about what virtualization is. Now, go back and give a reading to what is there in your book. You will... Better understand these contents in an even more friendly manner. I'd give you one more clear ama. Very good, very good. Moving on, we have the next topic that talks about a grid computing. There are lots of subtopics in grid computing. Obviously, I won't be able to cover all of that. So, I'll give you the fundamental principle of grid computing then all of those topics become very very easy what is it so just listen to this example very carefully talk about grid computing before we talk about a grid computing i want to take an example with five computers only five in my example i'm going with only five physically you may have even 50 or 500 i take five in the example now computer number one is having a 4 gb ram Okay, and uh, 500 GB hard disk, that's all, it's configuration and processor and all, okay, fine. But this one, second computer has an 8 GB RAM, okay, and it has a 1 TB hard disk with an inbuilt graphic card also is there in that, okay. Third computer is a heavy duty computer. It has a 16 GB RAM. Wow. And a 2 TB hard disk. Amazing. And it has one internal graphic card plus an additional graphic card. Maybe system number 3 they are using for uh, VFX animations. That sort of it. In fact, still a lower configuration. But okay, you are using for all this. And similarly, uh, some configuration for system 4 and 5 also. But system 4, it has a special software. 
special software it's a basic configuration plus special like this now as of now in the example as in when you look at the story right now what are they all called stand alone computers on their own but let's just bring in the concept of grid computing bring in the concept of grid computing now a grid software is installed grid software is installed on each of these system grid software is installed on each one and then they will all now be connected into a single grid okay once they are all connecting into a single grid what happens sharing of resources is possible sharing of resources is very much possible and what do you talk when you say resources what are you meaning by resources in all these aspects of resources you can share the computational power you can share storage space so let's say computer one it's 500 gb is almost getting full and now that they are all on the same grid you can always have some uh, you know storage space taken from other people now since computer 4 has a special software that others don't have if the grid members are permitted ha huh, one more important point who can access which computer on the grid and what resources the grid admin will decide that so out of these five people one will be now decided as a grid admin others will be called grid members okay how you can access your local resources like i am sitting on system 3 and how i am comfortable in accessing my system resources the same way i will now be able to access everybody connected to the grid and whatever they share so accessing the computers on the grid or accessing the members on the grid is no different from accessing local resources no different from accessing local resources now with the power of grid computing and all the brought together it makes it look like one powerful super computer what is it it makes it look like it's not many but one powerful super computer understood and then all this is split what are the resources that are being shared then we talk about a few advantages of using or benefits of using a grid and wherever we talk about this some limitations of grid are also there so keeping this concept in the background what all can you share as resources you can share computing ability or computational power you can uh, share storage right you can share special equipment or softwares that are there with one person not available with the others like this there are so many things that can be shared and uh, bandwidth can also be shared like if all five of them are using independent ethernet connections when all of them are using independent ethernet connections and then you want to do something like data mining then all five computers can be employed to do that one particular job okay so like this all resources can be shared where are grids used grids are generally used in uh, you know uh, insurance companies and hospitals they partner up no their grid computing is used civil engineering projects where one one person alone will not be able to design that entire thing when multiple people together have to design there you can use grid computing in research and development they can use grid computing so nothing much here you can just go and see where are the areas of application of grid areas so that's all that's the insight about grid computing now i will give you another very important insight which i believe is little critical rest topics you know you can go ahead and read or we'll do a doubt session now so we will talk about cloud computing now when you talk about cloud computing you need to obviously understand that clouds are being referred to the internet the internet is only visualized as clouds okay something that's an imaginary space which is available but not seen okay so that's why the name cloud computing if you want you want to give a, a greater definition for it server plus storage 
सर्वर प्लस स्टोरेज प्लस सॉफ्टवेयर सर्वर प्लस स्टोरेज प्लस सॉफ्टवेयर प्लस सॉफ्टवेयर डेवलपमेंट प्लेटफॉर्म ऑल दिस इफ एनी सॉफ्टवेयर इज अवेलेबल ऑन द वेब सर आई वॉन्ट टू लिसन टू सॉन्ग्स बट आई डोंट हैव अ मीडिया प्लेयर अवेलेबल ऑन द वेब सर आई वॉन्ट टू कन्वर्ट अ वर्ड डॉक्यूमेंट इन टू अ पी डी एफ डॉक्यूमेंट सर आई डोंट हैव द सॉफ्टवेयर टू डू इट गो ऑनलाइन टाइप इन गूगल पी डी एफ टू वर्ड कन्वर्टर और वर्ड टू पी डी एफ कन्वर्टर लॉट ऑफ वेबसाइट विल कम दे थ्रो अप दिस टू यू यू कैन डू इट सर आई वॉन्ट टू स्टोर सम कंटेंट आई डोंट हैव प्लेस इन माई कंप्यूटर सर वेरी गुड गो ऑन टू सर्वर यू हैव गूगल ड्राइव ड्रॉप बॉक्स ऑल दिस ऑफरिंग फ्री सैमसंग क्लाउड एंड अदर आई क्लाउड सो मेनी प्लस देर आर पेड वर्शन लाइक एमेजॉन वेब सर्विस बाई स्पेस एंड स्टोर फॉर वट एवर यू वॉन्ट सो बेसिकली इफ सर्वर प्लस स्टोरेज प्लस सॉफ्टवेयर डेवलपमेंट और द सॉफ्टवेयर इट सेल्फ इफ इट्स ऑल अवेलेबल ओवर द इंटरनेट दैट इज ओनली कॉल्ड एज क्लाउड कंप्यूटिंग ओके सो वॉट इज द क्लाउड एन इमेजनरी स्पेस इंटरनेट इज ओनली व्यूड एज क्लाउड एंड इफ ऑल दीज आर मेड अवेलेबल ओवर द इंटरनेट दट्स ओनली कॉल्ड क्लाउड कंप्यूटिंग वट इज द एडवांटेज ऑफ क्लाउड कंप्यूटिंग वन it's elastic and scalable that means you can increase as much as you want elasticity and scalability are two prominent features if 10000 users are there then cloud will be i mean allocating them if the 10th one becomes 15000 that also will be allocated and the best thing about cloud no you pay only how much you use so this is called pay per use if you want to use the cloud pay for it if you don't want to use it don't like a meter taxi you travel to how much you travel you pay that much then whenever you want clouds are available so it's called on demand understood elasticity and scalability clouds are available on demand whenever you want and the best thing about cloud is it has a feature called as multi tenancy that means multiple people can work on the cloud at the same time now i'm going to teach you two very important words i want you to concentrate on this one one is called oh, five which is called as resilience and six is called as workload movement now have you ever encountered a situation where you open gmail and you got a message saying that that particular server in which your gmail content is stored is not available will you get a message like that any time on screen and next to you your friend opened gmail for them it is working sir what is this nonsense why only my gmail account and that server in which it is stored is not working so will you be disappointed as a user or not so cloud service providers will not let that happen let's say there is a physical damage really there is a physical damage to the server in which your data is stored but they can't let it be like that so immediately that content will be automatically moved to another server which you can access in fact what is happening on the other side you won't know if anything is getting upgraded your data now if you ask me where is your gmail data sir is it in uh, the google offices in hyderabad is it in the google offices in their uh, head office in the us or is it in any other google's data center one i don't know two i don't care as long as i am able to access it how does it matter whether it is in hyderabad or in some ocean how does it matter so the physical location of that is immaterial which is why when one part is not working they will immediately move to something else called workload movement and that's the headache of cloud service provider not me okay what about resiliency resiliency is about the strength and ability of these kind of servers to recover from any crashes so the server is under attack or if there is too much workload then they'll crash no so immediately they have an ability to push all these work elsewhere and be up and available for the customers always that's what is called as resiliency but these two are you know also resiliency and cost considerations are to be seen if you want a very resilient cloud you got to spend on it more okay so all these are some of the characteristics of cloud elasticity scalability pay per use on demand if i miss something and all please go read it 
and the same points extend down there to advantages and of course security will be the biggest disadvantage because you're going out on a cloud and then every terms and conditions are determined by the cloud service providers if he says i won't uh, you know let you use the cloud then that could turn out to be a problem so every good concept will have advantages and disadvantages and uh, these characteristics are there so please go make sure that you know you give a drill down to these now let me take you through uh, okay i think i can do it here only cloud computing environment the most easiest topic in this is this only cloud computing environment i want you to give a detailed reading but if a cloud is open to the whole world it's called as a public cloud it's called a public cloud wherein if it is restricted very much within an organization it is called as a private cloud so public cloud and private cloud are pretty important in terms of what the understanding is public clouds are like internet is a public cloud so open to the whole world internet is a public cloud open to the whole world while intranet which is very much restricted within an organization that is called a private cloud part of that is open to public and part of it is restricted to an organization or the combination of both these called as a hybrid cloud okay so there is basically one private cloud and one public cloud or even you can have one private cloud and more public clouds whatever but some portion is restricted to the organization while some of it is made public that is what is called a hybrid cloud now i just want to have a private cloud but one of the big drawbacks in private cloud is that it is very costly and because private cloud turns out to be costly i will find like minded people like me who also find it costly so a few of us five six of us or even like seven to 10 of us who all can't afford to have an individual cloud but at the same time we can't store our data on public clouds we all join hands together and form what is called as a community cloud now this community cloud is a group of people who on their own can't afford a private cloud and they will all come together and have all 10 people will have access to that cloud so can you call a community cloud as a private cloud for the members of course only those people will be able to other but biggest danger in community cloud is the others are your own competitors and if any of them turn out to be hackers or any of them employ hackers then the story will not have a favorable ending that could prove to be slightly dangerous then let's look at the cloud computing services what are the various services provided by the cloud so if you look at the break up here on the cloud services it provides you infrastructure as a service provides you software as a service and then it also provides you what is called as a platform as a service infrastructure as a service software as a service platform as a service and then there are few residual category other services okay so platform is generally used by programmers or coders they are the ones who use it software as a service as i just told you we also can use it sir i don't have the uh, mp3 cutter joiner software i want to cut some songs and make a medley out of that go online cut those songs then go again online join those songs and you can do all of that so that part will be helped out then there are lot of applications like skype zoom and all they are all called communication as a service identity as a service nowadays lot of people are providing vpn services virtual private network services so that and then whenever you lack physical capabilities you might go for infrastructure as a service now in clouds no which talk about infrastructure as a service you have a further break up of that uh, like i don't have storage infrastructure in my computer then i can go for storage as a service like amazon web services and google drive network as a service wherein sometimes for specific tasks my bandwidth is not enough so can i procure extra bandwidth yeah you can do that then we have uh, people providing you database as a service 
so you pay for it and get a database when you want authentic data when you want random data you can go to google and pick it up but when you want an authentic data you got to pick it up from that storage network database then you have back end as a service for many new startups which are mobile apps they want somebody to provide them back end services right so wherein uh, all their content can be maintained over there now like say if you are playing games how about your data being maintained there uh, all that will be maintained in the back end only they are called as back end as services and then virtual desktop services you don't have to take a physical desktop and roam around which is practically not possible so that is why you have a virtual desktop on the cloud so wherever you go no you can use that uh what just user id and password log in on any computer anywhere in the world and it starts just looking like your desktop and you can work on all this okay and then here on the other models communication as service skype zoom and all that identity and security as a service so these are some vpn service providers or any security service providers who will route you through an otp or all that now i want only authentic people to connect to my web so maybe connection through otp will be uh, you know provided by somebody so like this lot of cloud services are there so a very wide topic guys definite possibility of questions from cloud computing also grid computing virtualization very much possible mobile computing wherein if these stories whatever i told you till now if they are being handled or mobile computing mobile computing is the same thing when all of this is done using wireless handheld devices when you are having wireless when you have actions to do it with wireless handheld devices same thing cloud computing grid computing all of that performed with device like smartphones tablets and all that so this is the key word here wireless handheld devices and you do it and mobile computing runs with three concepts i mean three components sorry mobile communication that is you have to have a service 4g and all will come under mobile communication then of course you need mobile hardware smartphones tablets laptops don't be under the impression that mobile means a phone mobile means talking about mobility movement not the device and then of course mobile software android ios windows so these three components good thing about mobile computing you can use it any time anywhere okay and i mean that's the freedom right and wherever you want you can take those devices in fact you are not any more stuck to a particular location okay you can update data on real time field work can be done more easily and uh, if you want to connect your company servers not just only because mobile computing was enabled uh, many companies were able to run off through the pandemic safely uh, just imagine big big tech companies they were the ones who were most profitable during this period because their work didn't stop those of them who had businesses those of them had physical stores there are lot of people who suffered but id companies bpos where connectivity is great their businesses still continued to run how because people were able to sit at home and work through wireless handheld devices enough benefits but again this whole story requires internet so if you don't have proper internet connection or bandwidth is not enough that's a problem then in some areas like rural areas or interiors or when you are in uh, some tunnel or on top of a mountain terrain roads or uh, weather conditions so all that will disrupt the mobile signal so you may not so it's a drawback we have to accept and then uh, too much use of mobile leading to health hazards so again like every other concept this one also has its share of benefits with some limitations okay there are limitations you can handle them don't use mobile for long time then health hazards will also be lesser but radiation is one of the uh, constantly discussed aspect when it comes to mobile computing so all of these will have a great deal of impact and then the last concept in computing is about the green computing which is more about being environmentally responsible now many people 
without knowing the side effects you know they end up burning all these hard disks or you know whatever laptops computers old ones and all they burn it off the harmful emissions that come out of these will make the story a very very complicated one so be environmentally responsible use devices which are energy efficient recycle use less of paper and have a green computing policy and tell your employees to follow it so a five point answer is there under green computing and i think it's a self explanatory concept you guys can run through that and from topic 6 to 10 i guess you guys can take a read as i told you bringing own devices to work the machine learning there are hardly all small concepts two three paragraph concepts i want you to emphasize on one topic called iot internet of things because it's there's a couple of new additions into that internet not only in uh, you know laptops and computers but internet everywhere internet in cars acs washing machines you have wifi connectivity to all of that right now so that is called internet of things which is the next generation topic so i think those few topics of letting employees bring their own devices to work ya yeah, byod is a critical concept that's come in the exam already five advantages employees are more happy to use their own devices at work uh, organizations don't have to spend on those devices because employees will buy them on their own latest versions of softwares will be updated because employees more enthusiastic to do that and uh, but the dangers are also there if you let the employees use their devices that if they lose the device along with the device organizations data will also be lost right so that byod is a small simple concept with a uh, few advantages and few disadvantages and then uh, you might care to bother about artificial intelligence and machine learning a couple of paragraphs on each of those okay so that last part with all those five i think you should be able to cover and uh, the broader concepts virtualization grid computing cloud computing and mobile computing i want to definitely take care of these which i believe we did so we should definitely be happy about covering the broader concepts in the fourth chapter e-commerce digital payments and all of what you call as the emerging technologies so please do make sure that you run through all of these uh, you know in a very clear manner so that it becomes easy for you to do things later okay so on that note let me just take you back to the initial slide wherein uh and i will vanish away so that you can check this out to the extent but for that last piece i can do but only it's you know like a time killer for us you guys will anyway have to give one reading so you can do that okay so that is what we have in this story and uh, for now that's what i can discuss with you in this chapter and we will catch up again day after with chapter number 5 last one in the core banking systems some select topics are good enough for us to discuss in core banking systems and i will discuss those topics with you and we will have a understanding as to what those are okay so again thanks for being part of the live session i hope uh, this session has been of some insight to you wherein you can review things broadly major topics have been covered so you guys can uh, you know bank on this and then start doing a detail review of things okay and yes we will catch up with core banking systems in the last leg of these live sessions and those of you who have missed watching any of these live sessions all of them have been updated in today's playlist recently i've updated all the playlists and the order is also there new syllabus sm eis with all these four videos uh audit with all relevant videos and one part pending on uh, part 7 part 7 will consist of a few standards we'll catch up with those standards in the tomorrow session five standards are coming up they're all useful for both old and new syllabus and with that i think will be a wrap to our long long two week live session i don't think anybody has done uh, live sessions this long and uh, i think i am very happy with the kind of responses and uh, how people are feeling it that it is very helpful so yeah 
I'll catch up with you guys very soon then with the chapter 5 of EIS and of course we'll catch up with the audit session as well and then apart from this I'll do a couple of live sessions on one-to-one -one doubt sessions paper presentations and all that also so that we can with a blast give a close to this season and I hope all of you to write the exams well okay all right then good night I'll catch up with you in the next live session thank you bye bye Hi guys, very good evening. I hope everybody is doing good. And um, yeah, you have to excuse me for breaking the schedule on uh, the Saturday. I think we should have finished this back then. But yeah, okay. I was quite held up with so many things. So, and I was, at the time I was back, I was like kind of really exhausted. So couldn't probably do it that day. So now we have lined up chapter 5, my last revision session here. So it's been an excellent two weeks. Yeah, we were on a daily basis to meet and, you know, come across with like 14 live sessions and this being the 15th one. I am really, uh, you know, kind of happy the way things have gone on and uh, the number of people who are watching it after uh, it's being uh, uploaded is also you know another encouraging factor so which just goes to say that um, things have been fine I've, you know like my stats show that you know just in the last seven or eight days this entire set of videos have had more than like 40,000 plus views so <laughs> the I'm really happy the way these have come out to help people and in fact, it's been a, a really good, what do you say, 15 days that, you know, like many of you have uh, had an idea of the concept. Some of you learned something new and a lot of other insights. So don't worry about that uh, exam part. We will come across certain important and interesting things from the exams perspective, which is really needed. Okay. So we will go ahead with... Uh, chapter 5 here and um, this one belongs to core banking systems so when we talk about core banking systems or what these systems have to do with banks uh, these are something which are a centralized way of working out because they, they don't have anything to do with uh, the banks individuality core banking as a software is uh, something that the bank uses so that they are on par with the current trends and when you go with the understanding of centralized banking that's where we look up to this particular chapter so yeah so again it's all super uh, amazing efforts i know if like like i just said it's it's the both of us it's not only me auditing revision what did i do all these days Nagasai, what are you asking for? What did I do all these days? A long list of videos have been lined up. Did you miss them or what? Chalo, fair enough. I think it's the two or three minutes that we give normally has been done. So I think yes, we'll have to start off right now and go ahead with chapter 5. I know why many of them haven't joined because <laughs> they really have a own peace of mind on this particular chapter. So let's start with understanding what exactly core banking system means. Now this particular story starts predominantly with the idea of using them in banks. So what do you exactly mean by core banking systems? Now one thing that I would want to tell people is there are so many aspects in this chapter which somehow people are not really comfortable with or you know with somehow our people are not really you know okay to do it with ease so what we will do is i'll give you some topics that you should not miss okay what will you do later 
with the other topics is up to you but when i say i am again saying it's a disclaimer i am not giving you what are important or what are going to come i believe that there are certain topics in this particular chapter that you are not supposed to miss so in this revision session we will cover all of that so that you know you have a uh, real understanding of at least the major topics so even if it comes in the exam you should be in a position to really manage this one and not you know look back and say i would want to leave that so what we will do is start with understanding the core banking systems basics wherein what exactly core stands for or c o r e stands for centralized online and real time environment centralized online real time environment so this is what is called as core banking and when you talk about core banking exclusively so it also talks about many more aspects wherein what are the various servers that are used to maintain the core banking aspects so if this core banking has to be successful then what should we do all these are uh, some aspects so let's beyond the definition we will also go about understanding the architecture of the core banking system because uh, that's also important let's start with the first and foremost thing as to what banking's operations are now since this topic is specifically about banking i don't want to waste your time by discussing each and every point in detail so uh, i just want to remind you about those aspects in bank that even when you have come in uh, audit what are the various aspects that bank do acceptance of deposits lending loans or giving advances they do remittances like nft and rtgs uh, they do collections on behalf of us then electronic clearing services ecs debit ecs credit all those i think you know all these basic uh, and then your yeah, non fund services remember letter of credit bank guarantees they issue all that so all these are something what banks do plus they issue credit cards debit cards and uh, now they even offer some elite banking services like uh, treasury services forex management now all branches of banks don't do this which is why they are not generalized so some branches offer treasury services means money management wealth management services then uh, having high net worth individual customers high net worth individuals are those guys who have you know 100 crore plus or 200 crore individual wealth and they need somebody who are fund managers to manage that so such thing i, I mean there is nothing for me to explain in accepting deposits and lending loans the same 11 12 points of what bank does are there in audit also in the introductory para so so you can start off discussing all those just give it a read because that is a basic understanding should be there as to what they do only when you know what a bank does which i practically believe all of you know then we have to go and dwell deeper into how and that is exactly where the story begins so if all of this is maintained in a centralized server and that is where the story begins no if that is not the case we wouldn't have been discussing all this so the fact that banks operate on a centralized online basis now we talk about server and then we have eight different type of servers which establish this and the key factor this entire chapter where they talking about core banking the key factor is this only centralization which is one of the reasons you are freely able to walk into any atm and withdraw money i'm saying any atm that doesn't mean your bank's atm any atm so if you hold an icic bank account can you go ahead into hdfc bank's atm or axis bank atm and withdraw money of course and back then it was not like that back then it was if you are an axis bank customer you have to go to axis bank only no atms go to the bank only then atms came wherein axis bank customer can withdraw from axis bank then situation started improving wherein we have centralized or centralization wherein then they were routed through gateways so that means it was not looked up like it was a axis bank card or a hdfc card so they came in is it a visa card or a master card so it became like that which enabled common platforms so even an icici customer even a icici customer can walk into axis bank 
and with uh, Axis Bank's ATM and withdraw. So because it doesn't matter as to who you are. But there were some inter-branch adjustments to be made. Inter-bank charges levied. So if you go to Axis Bank ATM with your ICICI card, withdraw money for more than three times. They used to charge from the fourth transaction. Now some people are there who you know keep simply withdrawing cash. They don't want to withdraw everything at once. So they'll go and withdraw 500, 1000, small amounts. And then, you know, they keep doing that. Your bank, you do whatever you want. I think all banks now have relaxed any services. So your own bank, you go. So if you're an Axis Bank customer, Axis Bank ATM, do whatever you want. How many other times you want. But if you're going to other banks, I think three as of now. Because again, they brought it back. In between, they said you go to any bank, any time. Any number of times, all those chargers, uh, charges are, you know, like withdrawn. They were not there for some time. But again, then after a few days, they have been initiated because people started misutilizing these. And of course, right now, nobody even deals with all that so much because of the introduction of digital payments that we discussed in the fourth chapter in the likes of UPI. Huh? So we have credit cards, debit cards, traditional payments are always there. But now we have UPI payment wallets. So I think the game has changed completely into a different zone. But banking continues to go around with the story around these eight servers. See for us what is more important from the academic perspective. What is core banking system? The main feature is centralization. What are these eight servers? What exactly is the architecture in that is involved in discussing this? These are the points that we have to talk about. And then... Uh, uh, you have some names. I can give you some examples of core banking softwares uh, because they are there in your book They're called as Finacle. Now, Finacle is a product of Infosys. Then we have uh, Fin1. I don't know if that's there in your book or not. Fin1 is a product by a company called Nuclear Solutions. Then uh, Finacle, Fin1, we have Oracle's product. Uh, I don't exactly remember the... Uh, name of oracles yeah i think oracle itself is a banking software Finacle, fin one then we have something called a bank mate uh, some names okay all these are some of the core banking software now if you think of somebody like sbi they have their own in-house managed software they don't depend on infosys or somebody else okay there's one more called as banks like that some softwares are there anyway just an example for you to know okay Oh yes, uh, Reshma, very good, got it, thank you. Flexcube is the name of the Oracle software, Oracle's Flexcube, yes. Slip my mind. Finacle, Fin1, Bankmate, Flexcube, and many more are there. Banks use their own uh, software sometimes, in-house managed. What's the speciality of this particular software? Why is it so prominently spoken about? Why is it so prominently spoken about? I will tell you. But what are the supporting aspects to this or something that I want you to understand immediately because these are some important points. One is a back office. Now in banks, no, there are two things. One is a customer facing end. When you say customer facing end, which means where people are interactive with customers, they're called tellers. Where you go and talk to people at the counter, they're called tellers. They, you know, kind of speak to you about what it is, how it is and uh, in fact they even talk about uh, what has been spoken about in the uh, between you and them all that is a part of the regular aspect okay so that one is something that we have to take care of and then we also have another very important part of this core banking story is Hold on.
Yeah, I think it's back right now. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Yes, yes, yes. It will be back now. So, yeah, until I see audio, I should not. Uh, it's back, right? Now it's back, now it's back. Ah, uh, so, anyway. Right. Now, we have few aspects which talk about, like I said, back office. Then we have the next one called the ATM. Okay. We also have a few more aspects like a data warehouse. Now, why are all these becoming important in bank? Data warehouse, we already know from the second chapter, we discussed the repository of all the information. Data warehouse the repository of all the information. Automatic teller machine has replaced the traditional teller. Then, in terms of centralized services, we have a core banking or mobile banking and internet banking. See, how does the bank disperse its operations? If you come to that point, back office, ATM, data warehouse, then we have a small discussion which is added up here called as mobile banking and internet banking. Now, I'm just asking you to focus on these concepts. I don't have to explain you guys what is mobile banking and internet banking because you have been doing it for quite some time now. So, you don't really need a Peace of mind on that. You can go ahead. Now, what becomes a little more critical aspect here is in internet banking, what sort of servers are used? So, three types of banking are the you know, old and day phone banking, call and talk. That's more outdated. Now, it all runs through the app. Maybe somebody who's still interested will go up to the laptop and, uh, you know, do internet banking. Otherwise, it's all about the mobile banking. So, internet banking, mobile banking, phone banking are the ways of doing banking apart from the traditional branch banking. Let me write that also. So, mobile banking and internet banking and then branch banking. What is branch banking? Going to the branch. Now, unless there is any aspect like cash deposit or some written request to be given, nobody visits the branch. Even for cash deposits, we have some ATMs which uh, accept cash in. Uh, but only thing is, you know, there uh, your notes are to be good. Otherwise, the machine will reject. Soil notes or something written on them, bent ones, broken ones, not proper. All those that will reject. Only that is a big problem. Otherwise, you can even deposit cash in the ATM. You need not go to the branch at all. Now, I personally, to be very honest, I don't remember when was the last time I went to the home branch. Uh, somewhere very far from where I stay now. Back then... I opened an account there, so it continues to remain my home branch, which is currently some 20-25 kilometers from where I stay. So I don't even go. And uh, does it mean that I have not done banking? No, almost on a daily basis, at least there are one or two transactions that affect our bank account. I told you, right, when we go out of the house and pay something, we are using the UPA. So there is always some kind of an aspect uh, for which the bank transactions are being done. Now, that is exactly where uh, we have to go to the next level to understand. So basically, branch banking, ATM, mobile and internet banking and all of these have a centralized warehouse. If that warehouse is not there, no, then there is no point in uh, talking or discussing about all this. Now, let me talk to you about a few aspects which are considered as key technology components of the core banking system. Now, I don't know why, but somehow this sounds to be one of the prominent questions for me. And maybe you may end up seeing this in the coming attempt. Okay. Key technology components of the CBS. Key technology components of core banking system. What are the key technology components? See, nobody can simply establish 
a core banking system and expect it to work on its own so there needs to be some kind of a support going on for that so what is the technology component that actually goes on as i just told you now only the first and foremost is a database if you don't establish a database environment there is no way how you will take this any further okay so what we the first and foremost thing that we will look for here is the database environment wherein a centralized data warehouse is established where all the information pertaining to the bank can be stored so that particular place where all this is established it is called as a data center what do you think it's called it's called the data center oh, what exactly is a data center is a place where all the information is stored in fact all these servers are stored physically they are only called as uh, database environment then this database environment is followed up by application environment which is nothing but the core banking software application environment which talks about selecting the core banking software so whatever core banking software you want to use it has i mean it should be part of the application environment so any application now you saw some names right fin1 flex cube all that will form in the application environment so you have to have a database environment where then you can store all the data you have to have application environment wherein you can maintain all these softwares and then very 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 important aspect security architecture i think it reads like enterprise security or something like that but as far as i remember security architecture which means a thoroughly designed robust you know what is robust right strong uh, what am i saying a thoroughly designed robust system needs to be in place otherwise you know uh, see normally itself people are afraid of doing things and now you say uh, Uh, or you talk about banking through mobile or banking through internet and then definitely that can prove to be a serious challenge right so which is exactly one more reason why or in fact there are many more reasons why you should have a security architecture and if you don't have a proper security architecture you are uh, nobody will trust you so if somebody gets to tell you that you know on this bank server there was a problem and all my money was lost will you ever go again on to that bank server forget about that bank server normally also there will be a fear in you as to why should i do an online transaction the moment i spoke about online i remember my next point which talks about connectivity to the internet what is it connectivity to the internet connectivity to internet if that is not there then you know there is no point in discussing whatever we are talking about so these are of course the basic things now to support all of this to support all of this what we need to have is a data center where all the servers are physically located data center is a place data center is a physical place where you have a uh established location wherein we spoke about physical controls logical controls environmental controls to protect what to protect this data center only so whatever we spoke about fire water uh, power spikes all of that uh, so all these are on data center only we got to take very good care of that point the data center and data center is supposed to be supported by what is called as a disaster recovery center So these two points go hand in hand. If your main data center is under any disaster or an attack, so there should be a disaster recovery center where you can immediately shift your operations to. You cannot be normal here and say, "Ah, uh, for next two three days bank won't work." People are not ready to accept that. Two three hours only people are not able to forget about two three hours. Even if a bank server is not working for fifteen minutes, there are crores. of rupees that are stalled in payments so that's a very serious point okay so that that's something that you have to take into consideration that whenever there is whenever there is a change 
uh, so in the situation of the data center immediately you have to hop to a disaster recovery center wherein you can try and get back to normal at the quick point then one last point here is about fraud management banking frauds are pretty common okay banking frauds are pretty common like many people who are unaware about several facts they may be prone to this so what are what is a bank doing to take care of that which is one of the reasons why you keep getting those messages bank will never ask you for a password or a pin don't share your pin or otp with somebody so why i mean like as a normal customer don't you know that uh, you should not share the pin or password but still the bank will never ask and bank will never ask you any details also because it has all the details about you and when the bank has the details about you why should you share again separately right so that's never required and which is what the bank always tries to educate the customers with so that is all part of again fraud management talking about what fraud is and explaining people where there are dangers uh, and uh, and not only that uh, i mean rbi's guidelines are their banking regulation in act is there so you have to make sure that all the banks platforms are updated to suit these requirements and they are in line with the rbi or uh, banking regulation act whatever guidelines they have to follow and not only that focus on being customer centric bank is driven by customers so if you can't mobilize deposits then how will you lend loans so you are in the business of accepting deposits and lending loans so you have to be pleasing on both sides okay that is the story this is just a question that can always be asked so please dwell this topic a little more deeper and there are some paragraphs that have been newly added like the back office data warehouse um, maybe they are there here and there but now they've been neatly organized and these point that you see as key technology components of the core banking system for me this sounds to be a very promising or prominent question which can always be asked in the exam now now that we know the components and technology we will also take a cue about the core banking architecture what is architecture normally the architecture is basically the design with which it is made and what is a core banking architecture made up of here information technology that is the use of computers so now that is exactly where it takes us to an important question called as core banking systems it environment which means what is the it environment in an entity which is using core banking systems what is the it environment what sort of servers will they use now i want all of you to understand the very basic fact here we use basically two servers which are undebatably the most important ones one is the application server the first one is what the application server on which the core banking system is actually hosted application server on which the core banking software is hosted then this is supported by what is called as a data database server now if you have only the application server and you don't have any mechanism to collect the data of the customers then it won't be possible right to so what transactions are going on what customers are doing how many transactions are going on everything will go to a huge central database so which is what is called as a database server don't imagine the story without these two because the application server is going to host the core banking that means that is where the core banking software is put up which is made available to all the branches at the uh, branch level a part of that is also made to uh, made available to us in the likes of internet banking but that happens through a, a different server in fact they are connected to the database server but yes application server is where the core banking system software resides core banking system software resides database server is a centralized 
what is it the centralized location for maintenance of data so centralized location for what maintenance of data so these two are undoubtedly the fundamental and basic servers that a bank requires stay put guys is a very important topic in this particular chapter so if you understand these servers well maybe well you could save a lot of time later then the third one is called an atm server so the atms have to work properly they have to connect to the atm server which in turn is connected to the database server obviously because otherwise where will it draw the data from so then we have an atm here a machine which is connected to the server basically on a client server architecture okay it may be two tier or three tier whatever but it's a client server architecture where you can walk into the atm that is to the machine and that's already connected to the central database so from where the atm will draw all the information you go swipe your card uh, and then it'll ask you for your pin you type the pin in this atm server your card number and pin are mapped so it will go and cross check whether you type the right pin or not and then it'll allow you to do transactions and when you do transactions like withdrawals it will dispense the money it will also update you in the central server so these atm servers are very critical for all your operations at the atm but that is the normal old school or old style of banking through a atm but right now what do we have other servers that have come in here ah so you want your internet banking and mobile banking to work properly then that is exactly where there are certain servers which you should be well aware of they are called as internet banking channel server internet banking application server let me explain this to you carefully internet banking internet banking channel server internet banking channel server and five internet banking internet banking application server so the internet banking also uses a software which you can open through your browser right now how you are downloading an app in your mobile the smartphone same way when you go on internet like you are going on to the uh, browser that is like something like mozilla or chrome and then you are typing no icicibank.com accessbank.com and then it leads you to internet banking activity ah huh, where is all that software stored who is guiding it it's all stored in the internet banking application server this application server is again hosting the internet banking software whatever you are able to enjoy or connect through the platform uh, that is definitely going to be a value addition from the customer's point of view you need not always go to the bank you can now use internet banking but this application server is only hosting this stuff the application server is in turn connected to the channel server internet banking channel server which in turn obviously is connected to the database server so from there only everybody will draw information nobody does anything on their own here it's all interlinked and connected are the application and database server connected yes to an extent what is needed they are also connected so these two servers which one internet banking channel server and internet banking application server without their proper usage the concept of internet banking will not work i'll do one thing i'll explain you in little more detail with that internet banking topic okay for now just understand there are two servers one that gets you access to internet banking activity that is called channel server the other one which is the one which stores the software called the internet banking application server then going up next i have one very very important server without which none of these servers will work called as a web server all these servers whatever i spoke about now they will all be hosted on this web server only where will they be they will all be hosted on this web server if web server is not there don't discuss this topic it's a classic waste of time so web server is that server which will host all the other servers now 
then i will also tell you that there is one server which prevents you from some kind of virus and all that which is called as an anti virus server on which the anti virus program is stored and this will secure all the other servers from being attacked by virus now there is a scope of you listen to this carefully there is a scope of you not being able to connect to the bank server directly okay you not being able to connect to the bank server directly so you need some other mechanism to reach out there and they would like to connect to the bank so i guess you guys know this word from law if you are not going to the agm you can send somebody can i see some answers about that it's been long that i disturbed you first of all are you guys watching let me get back to my screen are you there oh yeah few of you are there okay i already see some answers what is the name that we generally use when you are unable to go and somebody else is being sent in that place fine oh yeah i don't even need the full uh, proxy server thing even if you say proxy good durga prasad bhavana both of you good good job yeah now i see lot of answers okay ramya nandini yeah all of you all of you all of you good proxy means what when you are unable to connect to the main server directly you take a different route and i hope all of you guys will understand this user he has to directly connect to a server now if this is possible directly there is no need for any proxy or anything in between but when there is a user when there is a user and he is unable to connect to server because this server is not allowing him because it knows that this user can't connect so then what will user do you know user will mask his identity mask his identity means user will connect to what is called as a proxy server and proxy server will in turn connect to the main server okay so this is just a extra step that you follow so using proxies or using a proxy server will help you connect to the main server even though you are not the right party to connect to it because from this server's point of view you can't connect but right now this server is looking at somebody this so there is no problem with respect to understood so right now whichever web locations you are not able to connect directly through your internet connection because maybe your internet service provider has blocked it or maybe because the site doesn't permit you because of age and other restrictions so whatsoever we think if you really want to connect it and you want to bypass so you as a user you connect to one proxy server sir are these proxy servers free some of them are available for free most likely many are for the kind of uh, regular activity yes but if you want to secure now the danger is sometimes user when he connects to proxy server what if this particular server itself is fake they themselves can eat up the entire user and user activity so user has to be very careful so now if user wants to connect to a server which in turn is a proxy server there he might use what is called a virtual private network you can use a vpn connection because sometimes public networks are not allowed okay you can't connect uh, to certain bank apps or websites when you are on a public wifi and those things become important with a good control no you are somewhere on a public wifi and uh, you don't want somebody to uh, hack your details or data so some bank apps will not open there it says the connection that you are connected is to unsecured so it won't open it will shut down that's all so that is exactly why sometimes we end up using a proxy server please take a clear look of all these eight servers that are being used in or used for the purpose of doing core banking activity so these eight servers constitute a big deal to the core banking environment and if they are not there then uh, you know that's a serious cause of concern these two component i mean these two topics that i discussed the technology components of core banking system and also 
the core banking's it environment this is all sound pretty interesting important so which is why you need to also have a clear idea of what these are now moving further will be to the next topic wherein we are going to discuss in detail about the internet banking process i just want you to have a extra idea on that because you know that's a very simple topic most of you have done internet banking but how does it really work that also needs to uh, be understood it's the we go to the bank or through relationship manager we'll apply for a internet banking id password once you get the id password you can get on to any website uh, web server like chrome uh, sorry the browser like chrome mozilla F firefox all that and then you can probably use the bank's server to connect and that is where you will have to type in your user id and password now sir when i type my user id and password at the application level what will it connect to now, so first a web page will be displayed on which so much of general content is there login content no only general content also so much is there one small box of login is also there but you choose to do the login now what will you do you will click say login here and then it will lead you to a page where you have to type your user id and password whether you type the correct user id and password it has to check right so which is why sometime back we saw that you have two servers here internet banking channel server and internet banking application server so and as part of the internet banking channel server as part of the internet banking channel server all the database that is about whatever is required for you to do the internet banking that is stored over there so one portion of the channel server is totally the database of all the internet banking users so your user id and password also will be there when you type and what is there over them matches it will lead you to where you can go and start doing the internet banking transactions i i hope you caught this up what we are saying is oh uh, you have couple of layers not just one like you are not directly connecting to any database so you have an internet banking channel server and you have an internet banking application server as part of the channel server okay if if you want me to explain a little more closely i can do that so we have internet banking channel server one part of this is called as ibds internet banking database server which stores all the information about internet banking users so a copy of all your user id passwords all those are there here now when you connect to this particular server wherein by hosting it on any of the uh, browsers you will be immediately rerouted to what rerouted to this particular database server wherein your user id and password will be confirmed and then you will get full access to what you can work on this internet banking sir i type the password wrong what will happen once okay twice okay third time not okay access denied for three times and your account will be temporarily blocked okay what you typed on the web server that is in the browser and what is there on the database they will match both now you may ask me another question sir where did all the data come to the internet banking database server this is of course the internet banking channel server is it connected to the main database server did we write that here so this database server is it connected here or not yes and the database server is part of the channel server only it's not anything new okay so that point you have to remember in the most important uh, context of internet banking that's all guys there is nothing more in the internet banking aspect so if your access denied for 3 times then possibly you know your account be blocked for 24 hours so that you know other people don't keep trying out some or the other combination of user id and password okay now and then what all can you do over internet banking you can go change your password check the balance do internet banking fund transfers you can even request for a check book stop a check lots of services are there you can obviously do that so understood now whatever you do through the internet banking application server it is in turn connected to the internet banking channel server 
wherein this database also sits concentrate this is one dumb part the internet banking database server is not a dynamic server it's only a storage channel server is dynamic internet banking application server is dynamic because there is a lot of connectivity going so if to year to year and this connectivity that goes on we got to figure out and have an understanding about this one okay so that's the story behind this entire concept then of course we also saw in the fourth chapter about e-commerce so e-commerce is a area where again the core banking system is used because to complete an e-commerce transaction we would again need mobile banking or internet banking so there also it works so those are some important aspects that i would want to cover and now another question that can pop up in the exam so now we spoke about all the servers we also spoke about all the uh, newly added topics let's quickly check back for me also to reassure did we miss something i don't think so but just yeah okay we spoke about the intro of core banking i read out all the functions that we do in the bank some of the examples of softwares centralization being the key factor and then all these yeah individual topics what are back office atm warehouse branch banking mobile banking all of that plus then we spoke about the eight servers but before going there yes key technology components of the core banking system that has also been discussed along with eight servers the possible question so either this one which one the key technology components or the one out of the eight servers can always be a question or they can ask you a relation between a uh, couple of servers as to see what it is or they may ask you to explain the internet banking process in full which we just discussed so all of these can be potential questions in the bank now couple of other points that i would want to mention here before we proceed to the uh, next topic is the implementation in cbs so there are some stages in implementation it's a small answer which follows a flow i want you also to remove uh, i mean remember that part easily let's put the heading as steps these are the steps involved in implementation of cbs steps in implementation steps in implementation of core banking systems okay so this is what is the ultimate story about the core banking system starts with planning what should you do before implementing the core banking system what should you do where should you implement these aspects how will you implement all those as to be planned and like every other software development process this needs approval from the top management i think in the beginning of uh, this subject we spoke about bpa wherein calculation of roi was one of the important steps that we discussed to convince the top management that the return on investment about implementing a bpa do you guys remember that can you guys throw up a confirmation a huh? bpa steps involved in implementing a bpa so this this uh, what you are seeing right now on screen as steps involved in cbs is not uh, not very different from steps involved in bpa you know because this is also an automation process only so what you want to do and whether the top management is in agreement of that is always something that we have to ask and figure out now if the top management gives you an approval and says go ahead then the next step that you will go about yeah very good now i see some answers also good 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 so planning has been done approval has been taken an approval has been taken then comes to the next aspect we are called as selection between various packages there are right now you saw no so many are available flex cube fin one this that and maybe you can develop in house and all so out of those which one are you willing to buy or implement first select that because selection becomes an important thing on what basis will you select criteria also become very important Not only two options either you design and develop it on your own either you design and develop on your own which is called as an in house develop so after selecting which one you want 
either you design and develop which is what many people don't want to do they don't want to take all that headache so many people don't want to design and develop on their own rather they go for procure infosys giving pinnacle readily no sir pay the money get it uh, oracle is giving flex queue bank mate is available pay money and get instead of tally why should you sit and design a new accounting package why do you want to waste time is what we are questioning okay nothing beyond that so either see this follows a flow again this is one of those answers in your book where you should follow the uh, flow factor planning you can't write approval first so planning approval selection design now whenever anything is designed or developed or procured straight away you will not put it into operations testing testing is no doubt some important aspect why is testing important because tomorrow if in any of these procured or developed software if any bugs are there that is programming error or any issues and straight away if it reflects in the real time environment that's all what will happen to the image of the bank okay uh, very recently i can give you an example here very recently hdfc bank not once but three times in the recent past their mobile banking app was down internet banking uh, users faced it now see generally there are small glitches and outages some 10 minutes it will not work 5 minutes it will not work sometimes might stretch up to half an hour okay we also understand that you know these kind of things can happen but on a busy day at some point of time where you really need something to go on and it's not going that's a serious thing so always test it thoroughly test it and then only go for implementation testing always followed by implementation implementation is followed by what is called as maintenance why maintenance is required no application is perfect right from day one okay so i mean whenever you see some improvements to be made or some changes to be made some bugs to be cleared so maintenance uh, then for years together you can't use this old software correct time to time we would have to update i hope i don't have to explain you what a software update is to sum up all this we also at this level like how we did information system audit here also we end up doing what is called as a audit Now this again is a potential question in the exam sounds very simple when compared to few of the other topics in this chapter guys till now whatever i have been discussing like almost in the last 45 minutes to be very precise whatever we discussed strongly go with that first you finish those now don't curse me if something apart from all this comes sometimes they'll ask you weird questions like i challenges that are encountered or challenges encountered is an important question okay anyway i will list that down so right now we are clear with the banking functions banking small sub topics and then we are also clear with all the eight servers we are also clear based on discussing uh, the latest point the technology environment and now we've also spoken about the steps involved in core banking system i think uh, this gives you a great deal of understanding about how banking activities work now just like any other concept let's take any other day we have to discuss about the risks because our favorite topic is risk and controls only no <laughs> every good topic we will have something called as risk which is obviously followed up by controls now we'll talk about risks involved in core banking and here there is a new addition okay in the last uh even all these guys those of you who have never read all this these circled topics whatever you see you no know, back office atm mobile banking internet banking please refer to these if you don't know where these changes are i think very much in the description of this video itself i gave you the amendments uh video also so please go there to the amendments video and you can in that i think time stamps are there which chapter comes where otherwise also just forward and straight away go to the fifth chapter and listen to those amendments what changes have been taken place all these new new words they have introduced then this topic there has been a considerable introduction of some additional content not that it was not there previously some additional content has been introduced rest of those remain the same as of uh, this topic and when it comes to this one risks 
the new inclusion of what is called as operational risk and why am i slightly concerned about these things and asking you to go to that video and do it is whenever there are new amendments no there are possibilities high possibilities that questions will generally be asked from that that's just a theory uh, will it definitely happen i don't know but all i'm saying is yeah possibility is definitely there okay so operational risk that's your first part of risk which directly arises from the basic day to day operations and if the bank does something okay if the bank has a problem or if the bank does something whatever be the situation so that could prove to be a serious issue first one is called transaction processing risk so all these are under operational risks a transaction processing risk if the transaction processing goes to the wrong person transaction processing goes to wrong person then that could be of a tremendous uh, issue then we have legal risks non compliance to laws and regulations will put you behind the bars and will put you behind the bars in the sense not always going to jail but sometimes end up paying fines and penalties bottom line whatever be the situation you are the victim of that story okay so transaction processing risk legal risk then one of the biggest risks in bank security risk people will just leave you and go if you don't take care of the security of their information because that can prove to be a serious thing okay so operationally what are the challenges you facing transaction risk legal risk now legal risk is all about you uh, you know like the way you treat your customers or the way you approach them all that and then if bank if they don't comply with laws and regulations it's called compliance risk and bank has a hell a lot of rules to comply with rbi's guidelines banking regulation act one of the most toughest uh, or the highly regulated aspect banks public money is involved no so definitely they will be uh, talking about that and here you can't have some funny reasons like okay new employees are not trained and also people risk and i want you to concentrate very much on this answer because a new inclusion and there is all possibility that it can strike in the answer so transaction processing risk legal risk security risk compliance risk and people risk are all operational risk which can disrupt your operations which can disrupt your operations so something that will not let you sleep peacefully because of the nature of the risk it is then sir can we end up giving loan to a wrong person yes so this is one in your operations where you can go wrong second area where the biggest risk in the bank is the mark uh, i mean no, this is called what credit risk you know what is credit risk without doing proper credit evaluation without doing proper credit evaluation you ended up giving loan to a wrong person that's all consider the story is gone so credit risk then we have market risk that means losing our business to other banks okay wherein there is a oh no not this one sorry that's about strategy market risk is about marking to market so inequities okay interest rate interbank transactions banks do so in the interest rate spreads change in equity prices sometimes banks maintain assets which can deteriorate in value so all those are a market risk which is because they are involved in markets and then as a broad objective the bank's objective may fail due to strategic risk and your this is not the first time we are talking about strategic risk remember the whole of strategic management we discussed there is a possibility that your strategy may fail and that possibility is only considered as a strategic risk and no doubt to the end of the story we have the fifth and the most important risk called as it risk only because of using it in an organization only that to exclusively because you are using core banking and you have to always be connected to the network that's a prerequisite if you are not connected to the network then there is no way how you will be able to function on a core banking basis so this is a and in it risk there are so many sub points like what who owns the data 
authorization authentication uh, uh, and then uh, this one response time how long does it take for you to deliver something and uh, should you log in using an otp or a password or what how user ids are managed who gets access suddenly if something goes wrong what will they do will there be a server migration i told you right disaster recovery so from here can you hop on to somewhere else and uh, whenever you are bringing in new softwares is it easy for you to uh, hop across and bring in a uh, you know what do you say updation in place or can you manage that change i think we discussed this point even in erp change management because our employees will not be welcoming all the time ah uh, please bring change we are ready so there is always a resistance to change and how you balance it will all play a critical role in this story so these are the list of risk very much a potential question then uh, there are two aspects that i would want to remind you here which you can read on your own you need not uh, really worry about my presence in that the two concepts here small list only which i believe you know because they are there even in audit but here they are very specific what are some of the internal controls in bank so internal controls in bank like segregation of duties that is one person work being checked by the other ah uh, segregation of duties guys work of one person to be checked by other one person should not be com given complete authority finance powers administrative powers has to be split like loan processing all those should not be done by one person every time uh, end of the day transactions are to be balanced so generally on a day to day basis what are the internal controls in bank now listen carefully i didn't talk about whether you use it or not i said internal controls in bank now this is exactly where a subset of these topic will be there called as it controls in bank okay please give a reading to these two topics now i hope internal controls will not really bother you or they are not tough this 78 point it controls are also not tough all i'm saying is these are exclusively those controls that are employed because of using core banking systems like using i log in log out uh, maintaining a chronological record i hope you know what audit trail is chronological record of all of those and you know are they using role based access controls exclusively because of using it like customers are they allowed to draw beyond their drawing power so if the overdraft is for 5 lakhs are you allowed to draw more than that are there any instances in the past which recorded that huh? and one more important control if the user is typing the password wrong for three times are you temporarily blocking his account and then if the user is inactive after logging in for some time is this con i mean is this uh, connection timed out you will get no session expired or connection timed out why it's a control because money is involved you open your bank account leave and go somewhere that's not what you're supposed to do so are in fact for movie ticket bookings and uh, railway ticket bookings those sites only are getting expired in 30 seconds as if they are ah uh, as if they are no because they are also payment is involved no so wherever money or payment is involved such sites they expire that session after predetermined time of inactivity so if you are inactive for 20 or 30 seconds you can uh, you know consider that you are logged out the next time you refresh the session timed out it's a good control and uh, one more control in banks is dormant accounts you know what is a dormant company right like that your dormant account things that have been not used for years together sudden transactions in dormant account or reactivation of a dormant account all of that has to be done only after proper approvals i think uh, you can read that list it's not at all difficult but i am reminding you that you should read this list before going to the exam because as i told you they are very general i mean in fact the answer itself is a general one but only thing is they can always uh, raise concerns for the bank so you have to be very clear about them then uh, you have a list of topics wherein you have to be very clear about the process and uh, again if i say that we don't need to really read that again, if you take me very seriously then you will never read that but 
just go through the process of current account savings account mortgage now here what they did is they did three steps one what is current account savings account the process in this process what are the risks involved and against these risks what are the controls involved now if you see whether it's current account savings account or a mortgage or even the other four point that i'm going to write treasury or whatever the flow is same first they will discuss the process with you then they will talk about risk and controls now if you spend a little time if you spend a little time analyzing what are the risks i'll give you one secret technique here very simple you try to just remember the risks and controls for one area like pick up current account savings account and try to remember you know those set of risk and controls are almost there in every other one just in case in the exam if they ask you they haven't asked something like that maybe they want more interested in the process so they might want to ask you about how current account savings accounts mortgage credit cards okay current account savings account mortgage then uh, as far as i remember credit card treasury management okay or loans and trade finance such things are there treasury then loans and trade finance so all these five are there which are uh, very important processes in bank now treasury all of them will not do treasury all banks that's dealings in forex and equities and all that there will be a dealing room okay so what's going on in the dealing room and uh, what are the controls in the back office front office all of that and then loans and trade finance this is more like business loans and regular trade financing process is same guys everywhere the customer has to make an application the bank will check his credit worthiness in credit card in mortgage in loans in mortgage only thing is you have to hand over your original property documents to the bank and they will give you once the entire loan is cleared so just run through this they should not ask you a question from this sort of topics you know because it's totally about remembering and going and i am not a fan of encouraging anybody to simply by heart something which is also one of the reasons uh, i never discuss about important questions by heart this and go and you know check this and go here yeah, see end of the day we know the maximum exposure here is you know like four marks so for the sake of getting those four marks right you shouldn't destroy your whole paper we have sm we have you know 40 42 other marks apart from this chapter the weightage is 8 to 10 marks for each of chapters 1 2 and 5 3 and 4 that is the information systems and uh, this one uh, e-commerce they are slightly bigger chapters and that is why they have a bit of weightage i made a video on that also if you want you can see but i won't on my own will not tell you to leave anything that's not appropriate you do what you want but cover what i have covered today and then give all these processes a read compulsorily then two things that i would want to know nostro vostro what are these two okay nostro accounts are indian banks having account in foreign currency foreign banks having indian account in indian currency is vostro so just do a little bit of uh, you know understanding on that because banks have one of the most important controls wherein they have to do nostro vostro reconciliations so that's a bit of a point that one has to talk about and then the last part of this chapter deals with regulatory compliances where i definitely want you to read what i am telling you now out of regulatory compliance a lot of regular stuff is there but prevention of money laundering act there are three stages of money laundering okay this is a basic question that has already been asked in the exam which can again come so this is one question that you are not supposed to miss from this topic okay there uh, three steps are there here getting the money converted from black to white which is the aspect of money laundering 
illegal proceeds i hope all of you are aware of what money laundering is illegal proceeds guys once again before i start this last wing of discussion i want all of you to be alert and first finish off all the topics that i have explained in this session okay whatever i haven't covered doesn't mean you will leave it like that 20 25% you can take a leverage but if you don't want to be happy in reading it and make sure that you read what i am telling you now in money laundering the concept you know right the money is raised elsewhere through illegal activities illegal immoral whatever you call it then and then it's called tainted money huh? okay blood and all will not be there on that money like they show in the movies okay so basically it is earned through illegal activities like you know uh, sale of drugs narcotics all that for whatever any any crime not just only drugs and narcotics i'm saying now you can't obviously show that in your pnl account correct revenue from sale of narcotics uh department is waiting there to catch hold of you and put so it's not a legal way to show it and then what will people do now to mask the identity of that they will start opening other businesses where lot of flow of cash is not there practically not there but on paper they will open such a business where more of cash flow is there you understand what i'm saying really that cash flow is not there because it's a company nobody knows but for all purposes they will open like say if i open a, a huge cloth store okay so you know how many people buy clothing right so so lot and people pay cash so lot of movement of cash provisions lot of movement of cash so all these guys what they do is first of all they'll shift that money from the crime location to a safe location what is that inside the uh, fall ceiling uh, inside the walls under the ground wherever they want they'll shift it and that part is called as placement shifting the money from the crime proceeds from the location of crime to a safer location what you consider safe there is nothing called safe location whatever the person i mean he'll bring it to his house and keep it under the ground or inside the roof or in the water tank god knows there are a lot of people who do lot of things to do this placement and then comes a second step called as the layering now you have to cover this up no you have to cover it up otherwise you get caught with all that money in an it department's raid you know what all of you are students of income tax so you know unexplained cash what will happen to unexplained cash anyway you don't have to uh, tell me what's the provision and all that first unexplained cash it department will catch hold of you and if it's not proved that it's any legal money then criminal case also will be there on you then they'll go dig where did you make this cash and then they got to know about what sort of illegal business you will do that's all by doing that you paved or you cut a ticket for you uh, in a nice safe place in jail for rest of your life and these are uh, not small crimes the punishments if you look at it they'll span for 10 years lifetime first of all don't indulge that's the story no sir many people are there they will indulge let them do now there is see already the profession that we are in has been tainted because of such people who help these okay lot of chartered accountants are involved in doing all this nonsense why i don't know i mean i can't blame not everybody an individual who says that you know this is part of my business don't talk about ethics with me and all but anyway uh, because they know what sort of businesses are there they know where the rate of returns are higher they know where cash moves in a lot so all these are adjusted so move it to a safe place then layer it under the name of a business or overseas bank account offshore bank accounts ah uh, you have no mauritius cayman islands mauritius ah uh, and 14 of those hong kong british virgin islands what are they called tax havens lands panama ah uh, all those what are those tax havens no questions asked where you got the money what you did why are you opening company nothing countries which have very high secrecy laws and very very easy 
ways to uh, you know start now if you want to hide the money in swiss bank that's a different story okay uh, swiss bank thing is a different story you're not willing to bring back to india you want to keep it there and you do what you want it's a different but here i'm thinking of bringing back that money that too as a normal money so if somebody has a swiss bank account and they've stored some money there now how will they bring it back to india in the regular channel is not you can use it for some purposes so they're doing it but here that's not the criteria you place your money you layer it through various routes like this through some companies in tax havens and there are some transactions are called as hawala transactions wherein you leave the cash here locally to somebody and you will receive equivalent cash in another currency in another country like in any tax haven or any place whereby you use various methods and uh, back then trust societies not societies but charitable trust were a great means to do all this nonsense so in the name of charity somebody will contribute foreign funds and then of course we have a foreign contribution regulation act fcra but back then it was not very strict and stringent so people played left right with it and all these people who do illegal activities terrorism they use a lot of these you know they are the ones who do all the most legitimate transaction because they don't even want to have any room of uh, doubt so which is why layering is the most important step and once it's layered that money is moved into all these then it will brought back which is called as integration so placement layering and integration are the three aspects or stages of money laundering it's an asked question in the exam you can always come back so as i told you moving the money from crime location to a safe location is called as placement using offshore bank accounts or you know through illegal sources or whatever you move it to uh, other countries or whatever from wherever that's called layering and bringing back that money and making it look legitimate here is called as uh, integration which is what integration mean mixing it in the normal okay so that is exactly uh, the three stages of money laundering and this sort of an activity can be financing to terrorism so that's why stringent provisions are there very strict sir why are we talking about all this in this banking chapter because banks now have an obligation what are the obligations for bank they have to report all these kind of crimes okay so any cash deposits heavy cash deposits which are cumulatively more than 10 lakhs I think 10 lakhs only uh so rbi's guidelines are there uh banking regulation act is there negotiable instrument act is there all small small paragraphs about which laws you are supposed to follow is there now in that after following all this ha huh, so once in the exam very recently two attempts back they asked one question called as functions of rbi the monetary authority of the country which is the central bank it's a regulator of the financial system in india and it issues currency you have to write these three points no way connected to eis but you got three marks so read something like those don't miss this uh, you know easy ones three stages in money laundering three activities of rbi what are some of the laws and regulation that bank has to comply and the last leg of these uh, you know uh, the pmla what are they supposed to do there is somebody called as director pmla now banks they have an obligation to report to the director pmla and in fact you have to maintain records some records should be maintained for 10 years and wherever you find suspicious activity you have to report it to the director pmla so and this director has a power of imposing fines okay and uh, if the director is of an opinion that the accounts are to be audited to fig figure out any kind of these kind of financial frauds then the director pmla that is director of the prevention of money laundering act has a power to appoint a chartered accountant okay so either co moto or on an application made by somebody he can direct an inquiry to be made as to what are these transactions why did this happen what are those all those points and accountant for this purpose 
will be chartered accountant so we are also some way uh, you know involved in discussing this so i want you to just go through this last part of uh, you know the laws and regulations that bank has to comply with and beyond that i don't think there is anything that you'd really worry about in this chapter because it's uh, that's all just first cover all the select aspects that i discussed with you in this session maybe you want to come back to this particular session along with your full material sit whatever topics i told maybe go a little more deeper and read it so with the help of this session we're keeping this as a guidance you can probably uh, you know go along and uh, finish this particular chapter if there are any loose ends only in this chapter you might want to take a little leverage you can take it a little easy okay but like i said don't neglect something purposefully in every chapter if you keep neglecting something like that then you are risking out so much okay so make a plan make it up in such a way that you will uh, have thorough control on what you are doing all right then so that brings us to the end of a long 15 days maybe i should have done this on saturday and you know happily wound up that weekend which was the plan actually but uh like i said i had my own challenges that particular day and then i didn't want you to get disturbed on a sunday so which is why uh i hope it's a great ride because this is the first time uh i saw somebody like in through this where we we have gone straight live for two weeks and covered two subjects of 100 marks helping people across both old and new syllabus that was great actually so uh, the kind of uh, people who watched audit humongous both old syllabus new syllabus and then uh, uh, exclusively the new syllabus we had some uh, discomfort i should be open with that from last two attempts people were pestering me for chapter 4 and chapter 5 and in fact a uh, a detailed revision of the other so this time we caught up exactly with all five and uh, so you know it's something really what i didn't really think of that you know it will blow up the i don't want i mean you see i am not a real fan of the statistics or the numbers because uh, if somebody likes the way we deal with things and they want our help they'll always be there and i told you in the past also it's not just i mean if i've been like been there on youtube since 2015 or in fact yeah 2015 that was uh, if some of you know that some of my videos are on tuition dot in which was the other channel that i was associated with for quite some time and then now this own channel you see you know hardly you have 7000 odd subscriber that 2000 adding in the last 10 15 days so i am not a fan of those numbers I don't run me if it helps a few now when i say a few it even helps 5 or 10 i am always happy because the content is free <laughs> so whoever makes the most of it and the idea of giving something free and actually i believe one thing very personally that education should not be you know like given for free like this and in the sense not like it hurts because a lot of people deem in that you know then okay it's a free thing no what will be a big deal so it's not like that but then when we go leaps and bound beyond that we understand people have already been victimized for so many things they have paid so many places and uh, you know in the name of courses crash course you know. so and i i will be honest with you what i did is only guidance yeah i sometimes go one step ahead in uh, explaining some concepts much deeper so that people make the most of it so uh, use the playlist which has been put up uh, and uh, at this point of time if you really want to share it a lot of groups that you guys might be knowing and because like i said i've already been uh, seeing so much of uh, you know what do you say a number of people coming in and watching so it is definitely something that will help people in the uh, last few days many people i have uh, you know like again i don't wish to kind of share uh, individuals 
screenshot or something but sometimes i do just to motivate others saying that you know you might want to prefer doing this a so lot of people were panicked about group 2 and uh, i saw somebody saying that you know sir this kind of revision which i thought i will never do uh, these two subjects properly is helped not one many of them have told that which is why you know which is also one of the reasons how i kept going for a long time of these two weeks so again right now all i wish you guys is have good health have patience and stay peaceful which is very important okay i have told this to so many people in the past so tonight when i wind up i would want to tell you guys also somebody like me can pass ca each one of you should definitely believe that you can okay i have done some funny things as student which today i don't even feel like sharing but for me those are great experiences and i tell that they are great experiences only because i'm sitting in front of you as a chartered accountant had they worked against me okay they are the very same funny things would be bitter experiences okay so i did my part of nonsense but i did work out my part of sense which is why i could strike a balance okay so you are you know like you don't one thing i want to tell you guys okay it might you know look uh, too much i think it's already late in the night but couple of minutes want you to listen to something which is very important in the next few days you will have tremendous amount of pressure not from anywhere else but from your own self and if you keep cursing yourself for uh you know getting into this or doing something and it not working out you are only trying to increase your pain let's say you messed up something own it that's how i used to deal things now i had lot of friends who were uh, you know not doing ca i don't want to uh, you know like say only one course as to what they were doing some of them were into medicine engineering lot i had a bunch of friends and we enjoyed like anything okay so Uh, there was never shortage of enjoyment but when i come back home i used to you know not sit back and cry that today i went to a movie wasted 3 4 hours to 2 and 1/2 of the movie one hour going and coming then a discussion wasted 4 5 hours now back then what i used to do is only one thing okay you know that you wasted you screwed it up you sit one more hour and think on how you will not succeed how you will fail you are a plus one more hour is gone right so instead you have a plan very good now cut down your sleep because you enjoyed so there is a price that you have to pay i used to balance it out like that now that doesn't mean you overwork yourself become tired and again mess up so you should know where to draw line there are some days which are very tiring some days you are very confident and some days you should be forthright you can definitely go ahead and tell people that you won't be coming with them okay so or for whatsoever be the reason and then sometimes you have to challenge your own self that's all if you are strong in your mind i think it can definitely you know help you to do things i have done it that's why i'm saying and uh, for the worser kind of things now i don't want you to waste your time on listening all that but once your exams are over go back to my old podcast and listen to what all nonsense i've been through through the exams you know like sometimes the situations challenge you you have to just accept the challenge and try to do the best that you can and don't be really bothered about the results and all that because uh, they are all part of the story they'll come go and uh, you know like 40 is a benchmark so try to be about be safe and confident i want to end by saying that student will not fail in the exam hall okay that you remember every student who fails you know he won't fail in the exam hall he fails before only he just goes there to the exam hall to prove that i am very very confident of saying that okay because when you are writing no today i have to fail you will not write like that you will write with an intention to pass only back then you already screwed up okay so if somebody points out a reason uh, for your failure it's not the day of the exam how can one exam 3 hours change the shape and character of your strong mindset so it means it's a very valid point no you fail back home only you take your hall ticket and go there 
to exclusively prove it saying that ah, i failed back home i came here to prove that through my marks it will justify so it might sound very harsh but that's the real fact because uh, i don't see anybody screwing it up in the exam hall purposefully today so i'm failing sir you see how i will write nobody does that no whatever you failed you failed back home and that place is just to prove that same applies to pass also if you do whatever you are supposed to do back home strongly go there automatically things will work for you today my luck is not good star is in this corner somebody is sitting in this corner all that will not uh, you know be there you did whatever you are supposed to do you will go there casually feel confident about whatever you are doing in fact you will write twice better than what you normally thought of and things will work much better okay so remember that don't let it dominate your head have fear it is good i always tell that have fear have a little bit of fear and that fear uh, control levels limit should be there don't be afraid so much it will only screw you up again control fear what if i go wrong and that limited level will make you do things right always be afraid you should you know like a healthy fear is a big motivator too much fear will not let you do anything if there is too much fear like how a lot of people uh, you know even now with despite so many things going good be afraid that you know to talk to people wearing mask and still so i am not demeaning anybody but just their fear and that will not let them even come out of their house same zone okay so and your exam timings i may mean, be mindful of that if you have any uh, you know sleeping habits in the afternoon i think by now it should already have been changed but otherwise still one week eight days is a good time for you to get accustomed don't try to sleep in that afternoon slot because you know you you consecutively sleep in the afternoon slot till one week or one uh, few days before the exam suddenly you want your brain to perform the best at that time so going to be a challenge and that is where you start thinking about why did i forget you forgot because you overtaxed your head okay you are sleeping that, that your brain is used to sleep nicely at that time now i'm not saying that you should not sleep sleep some other time keep those 2 to 5 slot a very active one practice it for a few days i think if you haven't done that till now one week is a good time to do that no sir i study all day 2 to 4 is my rest time change it okay i know how people put efforts but it's a real killer because still one day before the exam you will sleep at the time suddenly on the day of the exam only that time your brain has to be very active the best performance has to come out means won't so make these kind of small small changes and i i have planned a couple of more live sessions for you i don't want to tell about that now and you know disturb but we will catch up on a short note like about quick presentation aspects for both audit old syllabus new syllabus open to everybody so it's basically about uh, going with the exam and it will be announced well before uh, it i mean like it, it will not suddenly pop up so it will be announced in the channel well before guys will get a notification it will be in the night only so relax don't waste your day study everything and just be mindful maybe uh, in a couple of days only i'll do i'm scheduling it somewhere on thursday i mean that is why i'm not sure of my schedule so i don't want to guarantee but before the exam that one hour on how to behave in the 3 hours of the exam we will actually uh, see if we can fit in and those of you writing only group 2 you have a little extra time use it in this 4 5 days also don't pray god suddenly one notification should come exam uh, please you put lot of efforts make sure that you go and write okay drink a little bit of sanitizer if you want okay chalo don't do all that just saying that make sure that you study well guys all the very best and if you can like i said share the playlist with uh your friends so that they also benefit not that you only silently get benefited okay thank you so much i will see you very soon uh, in another live session which will be a comprehensive one and now only i'm telling you that we will have uh, live sessions one day before the exam so if anybody misses the next live session also one day before exam which means on the day where you write advanced accounting and come we'll do it for audit and on the day you write audit and come we'll do for ssm and itsm one or days the last moment uh, wherein i have been doing that for like four attempts now so it it's a great helpful thing sometimes you know what we discuss one day before the exam it will pop out 
and it has happened so many times so uh, we'll continue the tradition as well okay thank you so much lot of you have been a regular part of this so i hope it benefited all of you and yes i can see comments with lot of smiles handshakes and uh, heart symbols thank you so much i will see you guys very soon thank you good night